So I grew up in a house that had a few spirits in it. My family are all skeptics and would find some way to explain things away. A few experiences and then I'll get to the main story. First, our house was three stories with technically three master bedrooms, one on each floor. The one on the main floor we used as an office. I would constantly hear somebody walking around in the office at night, sinks turning on, toilets flushing, and occasionally I'd hear talking. My parents would always say that someone was awake and making those noises, and that the toilet and water running was just faulty pipes. Maybe on the pipes, but no one was ever awake during the other things. Second, there would be a shadow figure that would pace on the top floor. There was like a balcony that overlooked the foyer, and I would usually see who I presumed was a lady in a dress pacing. My parents just said it was the shadow of somebody outside. We were on a hill overlooking all of our neighbors. I don't know how they thought this was possible. Third, I hated using the upstairs bathroom, which was my bathroom. I would hear talking and singing from the bathroom. When no one was home and I was in there, someone would bang on the door. One time I was showering and listening to music. I heard the banging really loudly, so loudly that it shook the room. Then the locked door swung open and I heard a scream. My parents said it was just my brother pranking me, which is something that he never did. Anyway, on to the main event. My brother's about 10 years older than me. He was the only sibling living at home with my parents and I. He had the master bedroom in the basement. I was never really in the basement except for going to the garage because it was in the basement next to the bedroom. I always remember feeling uneasy down there, but I wanted a big room. So when my brother moved out, I begged my parents to let me have his room and eventually they caved and let me have it. I moved all of my stuff downstairs, painted it and everything. I loved my new room. I was talking to my brother about it one day and he casually says, watch out for the little girl who lives down there. She likes to laugh. I was shocked as obviously he was kidding, right? My whole family besides me never talked about stuff like that. I just laughed and shrugged it off. I figured he was probably trying to scare me. About a week after I moved into my new room, I had a friend come over and we were just laying on the floor next to the bathroom, laughing and stuff like that. She had to go to the bathroom, so she closes the door and I was just kind of zoning out. All of a sudden she goes, that's not funny. I asked her what she meant as I hadn't done anything. She said that she heard somebody laughing right outside the door, but I didn't do anything or hear anything. She left freaked out, and I assumed that my brother put her up to it, since she liked my brother. A few days later, I hear someone in my bedroom while I'm in the shower. I call out thinking it's my mom, but I don't hear anything. I get out, and as I'm putting my robe on, I hear a little girl giggle, and then, are you looking for me? I freak out. I throw open the door to my room, but nobody's there. I checked the garage and ended up setting off the house alarm. So nobody could have come or gone through there without everyone knowing. I run upstairs and my mom is pissed that I set off the alarm and I told her what just happened. She then told me that my brother had a similar story when we first moved in, but that it was nothing. I called my brother and asked him why he told me to watch out for the little girl. He said that I was the little girl. He said he was kidding because, quote, you would always come downstairs and giggle really creepy. I never did anything like that. I told him that, and that's when he got legitimately creeped out. I still would occasionally hear the little girl. I never saw her, but she did like to laugh and open the bathroom and closet doors. I named her Sarah. My brother called me up today to ask me about this. 
He asked me if I was sure that I never tried to scare him by laughing, and I told him no. He got uncomfortable. I don't think he knows how to handle the fact that our house was mildly haunted. Several years ago, I had an opportunity to help restore a church that was over a hundred years old. It had been vacant for roughly 45 years. The church is attached to what once was a primary school, which had already been restored into office spaces. This was a no-brainer, since it was literally a couple of blocks away from my house, under the table, and the responsibilities were incredibly easy. Since the church had been empty for years, we only worked during the day, since the electrical system had yet to be installed. But during the days I would work, I would always see movement out of my peripheral vision, but nothing was there when I would look in that direction. This happened a lot, to the point where I had become accustomed to it. This all changed a few months later, when the building became operational, as we converted the church to an event hall designed for any event you'd pay for. Well, after business hours one evening, I get a call from a tenant saying that something was making noise in the basement of the church. Since the power hadn't been installed to the basement at this point, I made sure to grab my brand new charged flashlight and keys to see what was happening. As soon as I got to the basement door, I could hear what sounded like power tools running. I go in and start making my way through a pitch black labyrinth of a basement toward the noise. I find the cause of the noise, which was an air compressor. I know they bleed air at times, but I made sure that I bled all the air before I left earlier that day, and I unplugged it. I looked to see if somebody had plugged it in after me, but it was still unplugged. At this moment, my brand new flashlight starts to flicker, and another unplugged power tool turns on behind me. When I turned around to shine my fading light at it, the light went out completely. I got out of that basement so fast through complete darkness toward the door. I get out and I see the tenant is standing at the door with a puzzled look on her face. She asks what was wrong as I'm out of breath and clearly freaked out. I tell her what happened and she smirks and says that that doesn't surprise her at all. She's lived in the neighborhood her entire life and tells me that as a child she attended the school and church. She then tells me a story of a woman who held the last wedding in the church before it shut down. It was a sad story because the woman was stood up on her wedding day and ultimately took her own life because of it. After that night in the basement, the paranormal activity happened more and more often. It got to the point where a coworker fell off a ladder. This ladder was always secured and he'd been up and down it a hundred times. When I asked him what happened, he said that he felt like he was pushed. There were even times when the movement that I had always seen started to take shape. Instead of a blur, I started to see a person standing there, but still nothing there when I looked in that direction. What finally pushed me over the edge was the night I guess you can say I met her. Since events were always held there, I would always lock up afterwards. After an overnight booking, I ran into the guests as they were leaving. A gentleman asks me if there were any other people in the building that night. I said no, as we make sure the office part of the building is vacant during overnight bookings. He proceeded to tell me that he heard yelling from the basement and footsteps on the balcony. I assured him that they were the only ones there and I began to lock up the building. As I'm locking the doors, I hear faintly what the gentleman was referencing. I could hear footsteps in the balcony, and I yelled out, Is anyone still here? I didn't get an answer, but at this point I was ready to go. What I hated most about locking up is the light switch is nowhere near the door, so you'd have to shut off the lights and then walk about 30 feet to the door in total darkness. I shut off the light and immediately sprinted toward the door. As I reach for the door, I hear footsteps behind me, and a muffled voice say, leave. I didn't stop to see what it was. 
I made my way to the glass entry doors and to the other side as fast as I could. As I'm locking the door, I see movement inside the church. I look up and I see a ghostly or shadow-like figure standing where the altar once was. I quickly looked down to ensure that I had locked the door, and by the time I looked back up, the shadowy figure was now making its way to the glass doors. I honestly don't remember if I locked the door or not, because I immediately got out of there. After that night, I made sure that I never entered that building after dark again. Needless to say, I quit shortly thereafter. It all happened during November of 2017. I had just graduated and decided to sign up for the school's annual graduation trip to Johor and Singapore. At the time, my friends and I subscribed to very dumb content on YouTube, such as the 3am challenges. I can't believe I used to think that that was legit. When we arrived at the hotel at 10pm, my friends and I that were assigned to the same room decided to push through the fatigue and stay up until midnight to go explore the floor, or in other words, go ghost hunting. The hotel had already sketched me out when I saw the ancient looking lobby and had witnessed the hotel workers warning us not to use the lifts. We had to climb to the 15th floor. Before the trip, we already knew that this establishment had a dark history of side cover-ups. For example, we heard rumors of an unaliving on the 13th floor that caused a whole entire room to be sealed up. It's midnight, and my other friend and I decided to split up to explore both pathways of the current floor. We wanted to go hang out in the lobby, but unfortunately it was pitch black down there. Unsurprisingly, we saw nothing and proceeded back to our room for bedtime. At 4 a.m., I had a strong urge to pee and I was shivering so badly from the cold. So I got up to relieve myself and right when I finished up, I began to go back to sleep when I hear three clear knocks on the front door. I know this was dumb, but I opened the door without looking through the peephole. I swear that if it was somebody with malicious intent and not some kind of paranormal thing, that would have turned out pretty badly. As expected, I didn't see anybody though, so I just coerced myself back to sleep. I told myself that I was tired and I was probably still half dreaming. Turns out I was wrong. As I turned back, it started again, but this time I did look through the peephole because my common sense started to return. Again, nothing. I retraced my steps back to the bed and I tucked myself in while preparing mentally to just ignore the knocks. Another three knocks happened when I rested my head on the pillow. This time, I chose to not even give it a thought. The opposite happened. The knocks became louder and faster. Then they started to become bangs. It was at that moment that I knew that whatever I'd been hunting had started to play with its food. I tried waking up my friends, but to no avail. They managed to continue sleeping while I was slapping and shaking them while something was trying to get into the room. I finally gained the courage and grabbed a chair nearby. I proceeded to stand guard in front of the door. I would go on to pray while getting tormented by whatever was outside until I finally passed out at around 6 a.m. The next morning, the whole squad was asking if I had sleepwalked I tried explaining to them what had happened, but nobody believed me. This really irritated me for like half the day until my friends from another room called us over that night to game. That night scarred me for life. This was the night that we potentially saw a real life possessed person. The teachers didn't allow us to travel between rooms to meet our friends, so we had to sneak over there. While sneaking, we saw a woman wearing a pink color baju karom without the tudung on, on the 13th floor. 
We saw her when we looked down into the lobby. Her face was obscured by the floor's ceiling. She was ramming her whole body onto a random door, and she was levitating. And before we went sneaking, the class group chat had messages regarding students seeing feet floating past the bottom of their room's front doors. Before we realized that she was levitating, we thought it was just some drunk person, but soon started questioning why she would even be drinking alcohol in the first place given the culture. We started recording the situation after about three minutes of whatever that thing was banging the door, that she would burst into a sprint and dashed her way toward the lift lobby on the floor, which is a blind spot. We patiently waited until it decided to reappear. But before that, two Malay women walked past the lift lobby and headed straight to the room that the thing had been banging on. Halfway to the room, the thing in pink starts walking again instead of levitating behind them and follows them right into the room. After that, we tried running back to our room, but we realized it was locked from the inside. So we spent the night over in the room we'd snuck over to. I still remember the panic that my parents had when I texted them about it. They told me to delete the footage and kept asking me if I did the room entering ritual correctly. To this day, I'm still tempted to return to that hotel, but my gut is telling me not to. Was it ghosts? Mold? Our imaginations? I guess I'll never know. This happened outside of Hillsboro, Illinois. The story takes place in 2010. When I was in high school, I worked at the movie theater in town. It was an awesome first job. Free popcorn, soda, candy, and I got to watch movies whenever I wanted. The owners would even let me bring friends in after hours to watch movies or play games on the big screen. It was pretty normal for my friends to drive around town, randomly stop by the theater when they knew I was working and just chat. Not much else to do in a small town. Two of my friends, Taylor, nicknamed Tiege, and Justin, stopped by and hung out in the lobby with me while we waited for the movie to end. Tiege told me that he heard a rumor of some weird lights out at an old cemetery just outside of town. Tiej was a pathological liar, so I doubted almost everything that came out of his mouth. Justin started backing up what Tiege was saying, so I told them that as soon as I finished cleaning up the theater, I would close up and drive out to the cemetery with them. The late show finished, I cleaned the theater, and I locked up at about one in the morning. I honestly had no idea what to expect, so I told them that I would drive. At the time, I drove my dad's F-150 Ford pickup truck. So the three of us squeezed into the front seat and they directed me out to the cemetery. I thought for sure they were messing with me, but after about 20 minutes of driving on old country roads, we came up to a bridge, which was at the bottom of a hill. The bridge was surrounded by woods and the cemetery was at the top of the hill. The bridge looked super old and I wasn't sure if it would hold the weight of the truck. So I parked the truck right in front of the bridge. Tiej told me to turn the truck off and said he was getting out. At this point, I didn't really trust Tiej and I was also freaked out because we were at a cemetery at two in the morning. So I told them that I was staying in the truck. They caved and stayed in the truck with me. About five or so minutes passed and we started to see fireflies. It was so dark and clear out that we could see them even in the woods around us. I asked Tiege if those were the lights he saw, but before he could answer, he pointed up at the top of the hill and I saw a giant blue light. Once I looked at this blue light at the top of the hill, several others popped up in the woods around us and then more up in the actual cemetery. The lights looked like they were blinking, but this could have also been for moving around in the woods where trees were blocking their light. I started freaking out and I was screaming at both of them 
and said that if they were playing some kind of prank, it wasn't funny and I was leaving. I tried to turn the truck back on, but it turned once and then died. Tiege had a shocked look on his face, which only made me more anxious. At this point, I was crying, borderline hysterical, and I kept pumping the gas when turning the key. I didn't look up. I didn't want to. Finally, after what felt like forever, the truck started. I looked up then and saw that blue light at the top of the hill was now in the middle of the bridge and it had taken the shape of a torso. At this point, I had no clue what was happening, but I just had a really bad feeling and I knew that I needed to get out of there. Tej was yelling at me to stay there, that he wanted to see this thing, that he wanted to see this thing to get closer, but I wasn't listening. I was shaking as I threw the truck into reverse and sped back the way we'd come. We were quiet the whole way back to the theater. I dropped Tej and Justin off at their car and drove home. I sat up in bed on the computer, searching to see if I could find any explanation as to what I saw. Angels? Demons? Spirit orbs? Aliens? I had no idea. It all seemed like BS to me, honestly, but I still couldn't logically explain what I saw. The following morning, I went to Brittany's house. Brittany was my best friend at the time, and I knew she would believe me. As soon as I told her about the story, she asked me to drive her to the cemetery, so I did. We parked in front of the bridge and walked up the hill, and then around the cemetery. We looked for LED lights on the tombstones, flashlights, even footprints around the muddy woods, but we didn't see anything that could explain what I had seen the night before. The cemetery was also too far away from any major road for it to have been car headlights. I still don't know what we saw that night, but I get goosebumps every single time I think about it. If anything, it's helped me to keep an open mind about the weird stuff that happens in the world. And maybe that lesson was worth it. I'm a female, and I was hanging out in the car last night at about 5 in the morning with my best friend who's also female. I will refer to her as Heidi. We wanted to watch the sunrise, but we live in a pretty big city, so we were trying to find a flat, high place where we could see the sky. Basically, I was just driving east until I found an empty parking lot or something that would be suitable. I guess we got distracted with the conversation, because I drove probably a lot farther than I should have. Suddenly, there weren't any buildings or lights around at all, just darkness and a few trees. Up ahead, by a stop sign, there was this squarish gray shape that was lighter than the surrounding area. We both leaned forward and squinted to see what it was. Heidi asked what it was, and I said, it's where the road goes up or something like that. It was really dark, so I wasn't positive, but I was pretty sure. I think she said something else after that, but I don't really remember what it was because it was just a normal conversation. The road suddenly dipped and I drove up the slightest incline. I'm almost to the stop sign at the end, and then it hits us at the same time. Something is wrong. This feeling slams into me. The air goes still, the car goes quiet, and without even looking, I know my friend feels it too. I've never felt anything like it. Fear, I guess, but different somehow. My ears and the back of my neck were really hot, like that feeling just before you pass out, almost like when you've stood too long with your knees locked, but I was wide awake and sitting. My heart was tight in my chest, like someone had their hand wrapped around it, and I felt sick to my stomach. Not like I was going to throw up, just really uneasy. It was like primal fear. I'm not really describing this well enough, 
It's kind of indescribable, but that's the gist of it. It was like my body knew something that my mind didn't, which is why the only word I really have for it is primal. This all hits me in the few seconds it takes me to get to the stop sign. When I pull up to it, I see that right in front of us is a roadblock with a big yellow sign on it. Dead end. My heart was beating so fast I couldn't even feel it. Neither of us were breathing. I'm not sure if I imagined it or not, but somehow the woods around us got even darker. Like, unnaturally dark. I got this feeling that just kept telling me I have to get us out of here right now. Turn around, my best friend says quietly. I don't look at her, but her voice is deadly serious. My head runs through the scenario impossibly fast. The road was too tight, so if I tried to turn around the way we'd come, I'd either hit a tree or I'd have to stop, reverse, stop, put it in drive over and over again. No thanks. I turned left instead, speeding out of there, and as I drove farther away, the horrible feeling gradually lessened, until it was less cold-blooded fear and more deep-seated discomfort. Did you feel that? Heidi said when we finally got to a stoplight and saw a building. We started talking to each other, just basically saying, what was that? And Heidi actually said it first, but apparently in the moment we had thought the exact same thing. I'm about to see something. I remember looking around in the dark when it happened, and I was just sure that I was going to see something. I don't even know what I was expecting, but I was just positive about it. Heidi said she looked away from the windows, but I was driving, and I didn't really get up the urge to look away for some reason. I don't know. I know nothing really happened, but this really spooked me. Heidi said something like maybe it was an animal hiding in the woods, or maybe there was a dead body, or maybe it was just a person who had really bad intentions. I don't know, but... No logical human explanation feels sinister enough. I pulled up a satellite view on my phone of where we were, and there's not really much going on in that immediate area. Past the dead end signed, the woods get thicker, and the road turns into gravel and eventually leads to this nonprofit organization, some kind of little church organization. There's a few little buildings built in a circle and what seems to be some mobile homes or RVs or something and two to three houses, all in this little clearing in the middle of the woods. There's also a little river past that. Other than that, there's just not really anything around there. Still, I haven't stopped thinking about this since it happened. This was back in 2006. A group of friends and I decided to spend the weekend in Germany to watch some of the World Cup games in the local town squares of Frankfurt. We flew in from the UK. Things go as expected, lots of beer and lots of fun. The evening is getting really late and we find ourselves struggling to find any more bars open at the time. We end up walking a bit and we find ourselves at the river. We decide to walk along it to see if we come across any place that's open. It's mostly just trees, grass, and small parks. It was clear that we weren't going to find anywhere here to get a drink. We rounded a corner, and all of a sudden there are these huge tents with music playing, a good amount of people, and beer being served. Great, we hit the jackpot. So we all find a table. It wasn't a waitress-style venue. More like a mini festival vibe, so I offer to go buy drinks at the bar and bring them back. The girl at the bar asks me what I'd like, in German. She realizes that I am English from my terrible German and we start chatting in English. 
After a few exchanges, she says that she wants to introduce me to someone and to follow her behind the bar. So I follow her, and we walk behind the bar and out behind the tent. It's quite a large open space, with no one else there except a group of guys in the back corner of this grassy area. She walks straight toward these guys and introduces me to them, with something along the lines of, Hey, this guy is English too. I think you'll get along. She then turns around and walks back to where we'd come from, leaving me with these guys. I say hello and we start small talking. I can't really remember what about, where I'm from in England and why I'm in Germany, things like that. Turns out these guys are from the same town as where one of the friends that I'm with is from. I end up chatting with them for what seems like an hour or so to the point where I completely lost track of time. That's when my friend finds me. I see him walking across the grass from the tent. He says they're about ready to leave and to come on with them. I say sure, but just before we leave, let me introduce you to my new friends as they're from your town. He says hello and asks where about in the town they live. It turns out they live on the same street as one of my friend's uncles. My friend asks per chance if he knows his uncle, and the guy says, yeah, actually, it's his dad. Now both of these guys realize that they're first cousins. My original friend's dad isn't in his life anymore, and he doesn't ever have any contact with that side of the family, but obviously knows who they are. So it kind of makes sense that these guys have never met each other before, but they know who each other are once they connected the dots. Anyway, they chit chat a bit, exchange numbers, and they still keep in touch to this day. As we're walking away from the group, my friend asks me why I decided to go up to these guys in particular and strike up a conversation. So I tell him about the girl behind the bar who wanted to introduce us. That's when he looks at me really weirdly and explains that he watched me go to the bar to get drinks. According to him, it looked like I was speaking to nobody. And then I just wandered through to the back area behind the bar. It was fully open so he could see through. And I walked directly over to this group of guys and then stood there talking for that hour. My friends ended up deciding to leave me to it and just got drinks themselves until they were ready to leave. To this day, my friends do not believe me that there was any girl or third party there. To them, I just walked up to a bar, spoke to no one, and then walked up to a random group of guys in a reasonably busy beer tent away from the main area. And then one of them ended up being my friend's first cousin. Since I was making a big deal about how there was definitely somebody that introduced us, otherwise why would I hone in on a bunch of strangers and start chatting, my friend ended up calling his cousin to ask him exactly what happened. Apparently, I did just walk up to them with no one else there and start chatting. They found it a bit weird, but they just went with it. Now, I don't know if it's a glitch or what, but it's really odd especially because we're in a different country. If we were in the same town or even anywhere in the UK, it might not have been that weird and I could have explained it away, but we hadn't bumped into any other British people the entire weekend. Anyway, I've always dwelled on this and I just refuse to accept that there wasn't somebody who introduced us. I remember it vividly. And I know that being drunk doesn't help me and it makes me question my version of events too, but I remember this person. I mean, I've gone drinking a lot and I've never hallucinated before, so I honestly don't know how to explain it. A former coworker is back from the dead. This is one of the biggest personal glitches I have ever had. I work in the admitting department of my local hospital. One of the things I do is keep track of obituaries. When someone's obituary appears in the newspaper, I check to see if they still owe the hospital money. 
If they do, I clip the obit, fill out a form, and then keep track of how their insurance pays and things like that. A few years ago, and I've worked there for over 20 years, one of my coworkers in the dietary department retired and passed away soon after. I know because I processed her obituary. This coworker's daughter was really good friends with my cousin, so the daughter was even over at my cousin's house the day after my coworker's funeral. They had a big wake for her mother and everything. Today, as I'm working ER registration, the daughter comes in and says that her mom is in the ER. I was brought up a little short. I thought, uh, what? I didn't say anything for a moment. So my office mate had to step in for me and look up this lady's mother. Sure as heck, it's the woman who died years ago. My office mate lets the daughter back into the ER to see her mom, and I am unable to find the obit form that I filled out. Edit number one. I heard back from my cousin and he's as weirded out as I am. Coworker's daughter has no memory of the wake or anything, but she said she's been getting this stuff from the people around her for the past few days. People remember her mom dying, even funeral details and the like, but the coworker's daughter doesn't remember any of it. Plus, her mom is right there, really freaky. Edit number two. Spoke with cousin instead of texting him. Coworker's daughter said that it was her dad that died and not her mom, but she also said that's not the way that any of the people who run into her remember it. They're asking where her dad is, how he is today. He's not answering his phone or texts. To her, the man had been dead for over 10 years. Edit number three. I've been asked if I had any close calls or moments where I could have slipped from one universe to another. And yes, there was one. It was a little over two years ago. I was getting my evening medications together, but I was tired and I screwed them up. I ended up taking an entire full bottle of glipizide, which is a medication that lowers your blood sugar. I accidentally took enough to kill a horse. I realized it right as I laid down for a nap due to extreme exhaustion. And I felt really, really weird going to sleep. Looking back on it, Maybe I fell asleep forever there and woke up here. Final edit. I've been getting a lot of angry replies about what happened with the glipizide. So this is the full story. I take a lot of medications for a lot of stuff. So I have a lot of empty pill bottles lying around. That day I had an empty pill bottle with the label still on it. So I figured I would just grab all of my evening med doses out of my bedroom take them to the dining room, and just swallow them with dinner. I've done it loads of times before. Like I said, I was tired that night. So when I pulled out my bottle of glipizide, I got my dose and then accidentally closed the bottle with my evening meds in it, put it back where the bottle of glipizide went, and then took the full bottle of glipizide with me to the dining room. I wasn't paying attention. I didn't look at the bottle when I took my meds that evening. I just threw the pills back and swallowed them with dinner. The pills were tiny and all I noticed was that they didn't feel quite right in my mouth. I didn't think anything else about it though because the idea of taking a whole bottle of pills seemed ludicrous to me. I mean, what kind of idiot would do something like that? Me, apparently. When I stumbled back to my bedroom, I checked the bottles because something was very, very wrong. I discovered the rest of what should have been my evening meds in the bottle. I had mistakenly put the glipizide in its place, and that's when I saw that I had downed the full bottle. I wanted to grab my husband and holler and shout, but my body was made of lead. I could only crawl over to my bed and flop on it. And when I woke up, everything was fine. That's what I mean by going to sleep there and waking up here. I don't think that I woke up back in that place, that other dimension. I think I died there and I woke up in this one. I tell that story because that's why I think that perhaps, just maybe, that person did die in the other universe, but not in this one. In any case, it's freaked me out ever since.
In this story, Reddit user Pineapple Juice tells us some strange tales about the house she grew up in. Here's the story. So back when I was about to start second grade, me, my mom, and my sister had to move to the next town over because my sister had gotten into a fight. This was the town my mom grew up in and where my grandparents lived. I don't know why, but my mom kept on choosing the much older houses in the town, like before 1900s old. I personally didn't care, until we got to the house. I remember the absolute nervousness I felt when I walked into the house. I felt like I was being watched, and I absolutely hated it. When we got to what was going to be my room, I felt decent, I guess. I stayed in there for most of the tour, I believe. Maybe I was taking in my surroundings, but I remember that I liked the walls, and before I left, I waved and said goodbye. I felt as though I had to say it. When we were leaving, we had to drive across the front, and in the second attic, there was a window on every side of the house. There was this girl who was translucent and very old-timey looking. She was gray, but where her eyes were supposed to be were a dark gray, and what I could only assume was blood dripping down her face. Well, once we moved in, I remember that this is where my talking habit I have yet to break comes in. I would just talk and talk for hours. I would explain what I was watching for absolutely no reason, even when nobody was there. Well, one night after we got completely moved in, I decided to knock on the floor. I got a knock back, and I remember that it made me feel not so lonely. This happened until I was a solid 10 years old, and I think that's where everything began to go downhill. That's where everything started. The feeling of being watched intensified. I never felt alone. When I was about nine and in the third grade, I went to sleep at a decent time. I never really had before. I woke up facing away from the door. It was odd, and I felt eyes practically burning into my back. I turned and guess who I saw? The little girl. She couldn't have been much older than me at the time. I remember my fear, how I felt, how her not eyes followed me. Eventually, I got the courage to walk past her and into my sister's room. She told me that I was dreaming and that I should go back to bed. And when I got back to my room, she was gone. But this is when the activity really began. I would see a female and a male shadow person. I brushed it off at first. I thought I was just crazy. So I would just move past it and stop worrying about it. I swear that little girl played with me. Dolls, superheroes, outside, all of it. No matter where I was, no matter how I was playing or what I was playing with, there she was, messing with things, playing alongside. I swear looking back that I could hear a woman's hum sometimes whenever I would try to sleep. We'll get this. My sister's now husband, at the time boyfriend, slept in my room while I was at my grandparents, and he supposedly saw the little girl. And once my sister heard the story, she was like, oh my gosh, my sister wasn't lying. And her boyfriend was like, that is weird. My sister always hated going past my room to the bathroom, but like everything else, we just moved past it. My godbrother, who's about two years older than me, saw a little boy with me that I couldn't see. Well, one time we were joking around with some fake Ouija board on my phone, and it led us to what we called the front room. I kid you not, there was a little boy who was exactly the same as the little girl in our window, who just smiled at us and waved. We got out of there. I remember that any time I felt sad, I knew I wasn't alone. Any time something was wrong, I always felt safe. I felt loved. But I know that right before I left the house, right up until I was gone at 11, maybe 12 years old, I would always stop if I saw a shadow 
or a figure, I'd go back to where they were and wave a hello before I continued. Before my mom and I moved out, because my sister's a grown woman now, I knocked on the floor one last time, and I got a slight tap. And just then I said goodbye one last time before we moved out. That house had a lot more things happen to it as well. For instance, the old owner once came by to check it out and ask questions, but nobody remembers the guy before us coming to the house. I remember him vividly. All in all, the house I grew up in was very haunted. I saw a fairy portal once, and I almost went through it. I was nine years old, and it was the week before school. I was depressed about classes starting because kids had started to bully me. My mom took me on a day trip to the local preserve. When we arrived there, there was a bus load of elementary school kids, and my heart sank. I was noticeably chubby, and kids were always cruel about it. This was the 1980s, and fat phobia was intense. So we walk along the main path, full of kids. My mom could instantly charm children, so they loved her. But when she wasn't looking, the kids would say mean things to me. So I wandered off the main trail, and I found this Indian trail. It was very distinct in spite of a lot of undergrowth. It passed between two trees that arched toward one another almost like a doorway. And then I came to this huge hedge. It was too high for me to see over, and it stretched all the way from the Indian Trail to the main path, seeming to cut across the forest. The Indian Trail led right up to it, and there was a fissure, just wide enough for a child to fit through. I peeked inside, and it was so lusciously green and cool, and this was a stifling hot day, Nebraska heat, humid and oppressive. It was unusual to find some place that cool in the forest, given all the heat and humidity. I squeezed into the fissure, set my foot on the earth on the other side, and it was soft and moist and springy, unlike the hard, baked, sandy earth of the main forest. What I saw remains the most beautiful place I have ever seen. The sky was pearl blue, there was a vivid green bank sloping down to a dry creek overgrown with ferns. A huge fallen tree trunk spanned the ancient creek like a bridge. On the other side was a forest of silvery trees, the most inviting thing I've ever seen. Peaceful, wondrous. All the sounds from outside were hushed. No gabbling children, no nothing, just peace. It filled me with joy, and at that time of my life, I had precious little that made me happy. Now, I had braced my hand on the outer wall of the hedge, and my other foot firmly planted in the hard, sandy, real part of the path, because somehow I knew that if I put both feet on the ferry side, I could never go back. It was so hard not to walk into it and start exploring. I truly felt the place call to me, and I have never wanted anything so badly than to cross that tree bridge and explore the silvery forest. Even the air felt different, moist and sweet. I felt a light gentle mist touch my face as I closed my eyes and breathed in deeply. But then I thought of my mom. Could I really just leave her behind? She had had a sad life too, and I thought it would be a gift to show her this place and we could go in together. Well, as I had that thought, the fissure in the hedge began to close, pressing against my stomach and back. I was forced to choose, go forward or go back. I pulled myself back out of it with an effort. The hedge branches caught my t-shirt and tore a hole. Branches scraped my arm, drawing blood. I went back down the Indian trail, past the two trees entwined like a doorway, and found my mother on the main path, still talking with those brats who'd had the nerve to bully me when she wasn't looking. 
I insisted that she come with me to see this most glorious thing. She didn't doubt me and was willing to follow me. Only now it was really difficult to find the Indian trail in the undergrowth. It was all overgrown and covered in leaves. But I spotted it and I made it as far as the two trees that were like a door. Only now they were strung with nasty cobwebs. Like the trees were suddenly so old and ugly I couldn't imagine going near them. And the trail had disappeared entirely. I looked up and pointed in the direction of the hedge, sure that she could spot it from there. It was nine feet high and stretched for several yards in both directions. But no, there was nothing. Only the usual trees and undergrowth. I was so shocked when it wasn't there. I saw then that it was impossible that it had ever been there. It would have been bisected by the main path, which was packed with children and teachers. I was speechless, trying to get my mother to understand what I had seen. She didn't doubt me, and she said, maybe it was just for you to see. I felt such a profound feeling of loss, like really inconsolable loss. Probably at the end of all my days, I will still think of that place. That was my chance to enter the fairy realm, but I turned back. I've never shared that story. I thought that if I ever had children, I would tell them about it, but that hasn't happened, so I thought I'd share it here. A couple of years ago, my pops and I decided to go on a road trip. It was very out of the blue. I wasn't even expecting it, but I decided to go anyway. It would be some solid father-son bonding time. After driving for what seemed like a couple of hours, it was maybe around 8 to 9 p.m., we pulled up into this gas station for snacks and water and to use the bathroom. And we went back inside our car. Keep in mind, this gas station was basically in the middle of nowhere. Anyway, we got back into our car and decided to look for a motel, but there were none. And I mean, there wasn't a single one anywhere near us. My dad was really tired, so we decided to sleep in the car. We pulled up into this sort of resting area slash parking lot and decided to go to sleep. My dad fell fast asleep, but I was on my phone for a couple of hours, and around 11 p.m., I just felt suffocated by the tense air, and I decided to step out for a bit. I felt safe because the gas station was still in sight, and there would be a couple of trucks that would occasionally drive by, so I felt at ease. At this time, I was also texting my friend who lives in Seattle, Washington, and we were on the phone for a bit. Then I saw what looked like a large cornfield. I was a city guy, so I'd never seen a cornfield in real life. So I decided to cross the road and just get a closer look. So that's what I did. I walked extremely close and started feeling like I was being watched. But again, I thought, well, you're literally outside in the dark standing next to a tall cornfield. Of course you're gonna feel weird. So I brushed it off. I even considered going in but then I thought, why would I even do that? So anyway, I decided to just take a step back when I noticed a barn, a large white barn with red, maybe black strips. It was hard to tell in the dark, but it surely was a barn. And I was stupid and young when this happened, maybe 14 or 15. So out of curiosity, I decided to just check it out. The barn was next to the cornfield, kind of tucked in a little. I literally thought to myself, I wish I could see something that would freak me out as a joke because I never really thought that anything would happen and I love being scared. Anyway, I started making my way toward the barn. Getting closer and closer, I remember very vividly that I was wearing no socks and just slip on slides. I remember the dirt rubbing against my toes while I walked. I remember sending pictures to my friend in Washington jokingly saying that I saw something and I was gonna go check it out. As I got closer, I did see something. Behind the barn, but sort of to the side, like how when someone peers from a corner. 
At first, I thought it was a bell. Literally, I assumed that it was just a bell attached to the corner of the barn. So I just walked closer. I kept moving toward it. And then I saw the head of something or someone just peering around the corner at me. At that moment, I straight up froze. My flight or fight was out of function, apparently, because there I was literally seeing someone or something peering at the corner and I didn't do either of those things. After about five to 10 seconds, the noise that Snapchat makes when you get a notification snapped me out of it. And I just ran as fast as I could across the road to my dad's car and got in. I felt a sense of relief wash over my body. And somehow my dad was not awake. Me gasping for air wasn't enough to stir him from his sleep, I guess. I really considered waking him up and telling him that we have to leave and telling him what I saw, but he would assume that I was joking or having some kind of episode since he's never believed in anything paranormal or out of the ordinary at all. I took deep breaths and just texted my friend telling her what I saw, but she didn't believe me. I don't blame her and I won't blame any of you either if you don't believe me. I have a hard time actually believing what I saw sometimes but I know it was real. I was sober and fully aware, but from the bottom of my heart, the part that disturbs me the most is that whatever was peering at me from around that corner was very tall, at least seven, maybe eight feet tall. And every time I think about that, I get a sense of dread and paranoia. I haven't told any of my family, not even my dad, but if any of you have a clue of what I might've seen, let me know. I wasn't hallucinating. And this was way before I figured out anything to do with psychedelics or drugs in general. I've been trying to piece it together ever since it happened. I was sort of 50-50 on paranormal encounters before, but after that experience, I believe. I believe in walkers and windigos and ghosts and everything pretty much. It's completely changed me. I want to know what's out there. I want to know what I encountered. At the time of this event, I was living in downtown Toronto and I had just moved in with my new roommates. One guy was my buddy. The place I moved into used to be a shoe factory years ago. So the new place was great. I was chilling with my buddy and our other roommates. Joe and I made a joke about how this place must be haunted because of how old it is. Joe kind of brushed off what I was saying though and joked that if he told me stories, I would move out. Joe's been living there for like 20 years, so I don't doubt that he's seen some things. Before I get into the stories, I wanted to clarify that I'm not sure if I believe in ghosts. My attitude has always been that I can't really prove or disprove their existence, or of anything paranormal really. I've experienced quite a few strange encounters in my lifetime, but nothing to really sway my opinion that ghosts exist 100%. So it was a weekend night. I stayed up really late. It was like three or four in the morning, and I went out to the living area to get some water. As I was filling my water bottle, the whole time I was out there, I felt like something was drawing my attention toward the TV or couch area. The TV was always on. I don't know why. I feel like my roommates were just too lazy to turn it off. So I'm stumbling toward the couches and I could make out the shape of somebody's head from behind it. It was kind of this white transparent color. All I can remember is that as I got closer, there was this static from the TV that kept getting louder until the TV finally made a big pop noise. I ran back to my room. I just stood there in complete shock. I didn't move for like five minutes, just trying to comprehend what had happened. As I said before, I don't really believe in ghosts, but this scared me really badly. 
I've never felt an energy or something like that before. It's really hard to explain how I felt during that experience, but it gives me goosebumps just remembering it. The second story took place in the daytime. I was alone in the apartment, cooking some brunch. In the apartment, there was a section of walls that were covered in mirrors. Joe made kind of a makeshift gym in front of them. So I was doing my normal thing, just cooking. But the whole time, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching me with a sharp glare. Like I said, the TV is always on. So when you're cooking in the kitchen, you can see in the mirrors the TV area reflected. As I'm cooking, this like glitter or flash of light would pierce the corner of my eye, like somebody was trying to get my attention. This happened about three times. I'm starting to get more freaked out because the whole vibe of the apartment just felt really negative, which was odd. As I'm finishing up, the door to my room just shuts. It had been like halfway open. When that happened, I just left the apartment to get some fresh air. I didn't even touch the food I had just got done cooking. What really doesn't make sense about this is that the doors we had in that place were really heavy. They had soundproofing on them. So when you went to close them, you really had to pull on them. Those were the two really big things I had happen while I was living there. When I was living there, I had a girlfriend that would stay over all the time. I never mentioned anything about ghosts to her. We never talked about ghosts either when I was living there. It wasn't until I had moved out and we were on a date that I brought it up to her. All I asked her is if she ever saw or felt anything strange while I was living there. What she told me was pretty shocking. She told me about how she would have nightmares every once in a while, where something would climb up to where we would sleep and attack her. The apartment had like eight meter ceilings, so the sleeping area was at the top. This freaked me out because one time I had had a dream that somebody climbed up there and grabbed my feet. I actually woke up from that dream screaming. She also explained that she felt like there were multiple spirits there some good, some bad. She's way more spiritual than I am. So I had a hard time wrapping my head around what she had said. She said she felt that there was a mix, like I said, good ones and also dark ones. Anyway, that was my experience living in this apartment that used to be a shoe factory. There were other instances of things happening, weird noises, doors closing, the normal, but these two events really stood out. I've always been a believer in the paranormal, but I've also been a skeptic. I'm not one to jump to paranormal conclusions right away. With that said, this event messed me up, and it still keeps me up at night to this day. This happened almost a year ago. My girlfriend and I visited her parents' house, which was her old home in Alabama, specifically in Crenshaw County. For those that don't know, that's basically right in the middle of nowhere. The boonies, the sticks. Being from a large city myself in Southern California, I am completely out of my element. I've already visited her parents once before with her. She has always told me that her house was haunted and that the woods were sketchy at night. But when I visited the first time with her, nothing happened whatsoever. So I chalked it up as some tall tale to creep me out. You know, freak out the city boy. That is, until we visited her parents the second time. Her father works in Montgomery for the weekdays, so he's gone a lot, and her mother had to be in Atlanta for three days due to a job. We were home alone for those three days, unless you want to count her cats as well. The one-story house is in the middle of absolutely nowhere, with the nearest house well down the road from us. 
One of those nights, around midnight, I'm sitting in bed with her completely asleep. I'm scrolling through Facebook and my Twitter and YouTube notifications when I began hearing what sounded like my girlfriend's voice. I turned to look at her to see if she was sleep talking. Nothing. She's quiet. I continue going through my notifications for a bit and I hear her again. But this time it doesn't sound like it's coming from her. It sounds like it's coming from outside, behind the bedroom wall, toward the same direction as my girlfriend, but much louder and echoey. I get up and I look around to see if there's a TV on or if the cats are making noises, even though the TVs aren't in the direction that I heard the voice coming from. But nothing. The TVs are off and the cats are asleep or just lazing around. I even checked her phone, which was on the nightstand to my right, in case it was playing audio or something, but it was just charging. I go back to bed with her and I continue going about my business, but this time I'm kind of looking out for the voice. This time I hear it again, but much clearer and louder, and it sounds exactly like my girlfriend's voice. It was for sure coming from outside this time, I know this because she was sleeping on my left, and toward my left is also the wall. On the other side of that is a clearing, and it's all dense woods. After this, I focused all of my attention to the loud voice to see if I would hear it again, and I'm looking at her to make sure that it's not her. This is the part where I internally started saying, I am not finding out what you are. I have seen way too many movies and YouTube videos and I'm not about to go out there and find out. I heard the voice one more time, yet this time it didn't sound closer, but just a little farther, which leads me to believe that it's something physically moving around the clearing bordering the woods. The scariest thing about the voice that really had me freaking out is that it was still clear enough that I started making out human speech, but it was messed up. Like it was speaking in phrases using my girlfriend's voice, but none of the words were making sense. It's almost like it was trying to speak English, but it was reversed. At that point, I did one final check around the interior of the house to see if all the doors were locked. My rational mind was thinking it was probably just some lost person in the woods. Definitely not a skinwalker or whatever else. I made sure the curtains were closed and I just went to bed. I told my girlfriend the very next morning and she seemed rightfully freaked out, but we ended up just cracking jokes about it to cope. I posted this experience to Facebook about a week after and a lot of my friends threw around the thought that it could very well have been something paranormal. A friend of my girlfriend's who studies cryptozoology as a hobby asked me a ton of questions relating to the incident and basically flat out said, yeah, that's a Wendigo. I don't know how credible of an opinion that would be. I'm inching into believing it though, because what I heard that night was exactly my girlfriend's voice. I swear I could make out my name in that garbled speech. I'm not too sure on that much, but it was like it was luring me into the woods. Whatever it was, it got my girlfriend's voice, pitch, tone, patterns, everything, just right enough for me to listen, but not enough to get me to go out there with it. Of course, I was looking at her, so I knew it wasn't her. Who knows what I might have done, I guess, if she hadn't been in the room with me. I haven't been back since, but we are planning to go back in October and go to Disney World with her family. I'm hoping that whatever it was, isn't there anymore. It was 1983 to 85 when we had moved from Japan to the Florida Panhandle. Fort Walton Beach, to be exact the most beautiful community you could imagine. Even though the ocean was only one side of the panhandle, it felt like we were surrounded by water. 
There were myriad of ocean-fed lakes and tributaries fed by the Gulf of Mexico, weaving their way around the area. Anywhere in the town was about five minutes from the warm sands of a beach. Okaloosa Island was a quick drive, and the entire length of it was like Peter Pan's Pleasure Island, dotted with huge water slides and pina colada scented surf shops. The beaches there were lined with snow white sand that melted into the bluest waters you usually only saw in movies. I loved it there. The ocean air, the many low bridges linking different parts of the town over parts of the ocean, the perfect warm weather. I absolutely loved it. The house was almost enough to make me forget that, though. Almost. It wasn't a big house at all, not like the typical haunted houses they make movies about. It wasn't huge and full of dark rooms and basements. It was just the opposite. It was a small, one-floor house with two bedrooms, one of which I shared with my younger brother, one bathroom, a living room, and a kitchen. What we didn't have with money living a military lifestyle was made up for by traveling all over the place and experiencing life in a way most people never get to. So the house was small, but we were happy. It was also on a pretty major street that was fairly busy all day, a stoplight only a block away from us, a very unassuming living situation. There was, however, one small detail my parents had kept from us until we were fully moved in. Across the street, there was an enormous brick wall that spanned at least 20 feet high, dressed in dripping green ivy, and topped with ornate black iron spikes every 10 feet, the entire length of it, that being at least five or six blocks. I had thought it was the private property of the wealthy. There were so many of them there. Old mansions owned by older money. They were everywhere, but that was not the case here. No, not at all. That monolithic wall housed not an antiquated home, but an antiquated cemetery complete with archaic statuary wrought with vines and cracks and small mausoleums for the old money of the city. My brother and I were, of course, completely horrified. But the wall did its job and helped us to forget soon enough, and life continued. One night, we were all watching Night Flight together. I loved music and my parents, being very young for parents of two boys, were a huge influence on my love of rock and pop. Our couch sat in front of the huge living room window that looked out onto the busy street, only facing away from it. At this time of night, traffic was minimal, and any noise was being drowned out by the yes singing, owner of a lonely heart anyway. Still, I heard something over the music, something coming from the street. I instinctively looked over at my mom, and she just kind of shook her head no to me, like she knew what I was thinking. I turned around on the couch anyway, and pushed the curtain aside to see what it was. My mom did the same. I could see the stoplight clearly. The light was red, and there was a woman standing on the corner, looking panicked. A car had pulled up to her, and she started screaming bloody murder, struggling and yelling, while she was being pulled into the car. My mom just squeezed my shoulder. I pulled my head back in to see why my dad wasn't running out there to save her, but he was watching TV with my little brother, both completely unbothered. My brother was playing with some toy, clearly not hearing the screaming, and my dad was just sitting back tapping his foot to the song. I started to say something, but my mother's hand squeezed harder, and I whispered, But... And she said quietly, There's nothing to see. I looked back out the window. There was nothing. No car, no woman, nothing. It happened so fast. I was confused. Where did the car go? I didn't hear it peel out, and there wasn't enough time either. I didn't know when the screaming stopped either. It just stopped. I realized that when I was watching the car and the girl, there were no other cars driving by. 
In those few minutes, no one passed them. And now the street was suddenly very busy. I looked up at my mom, and she said under her breath, I told you not to look. And gave me this look that said, Don't tell your father you saw anything. So I didn't. That would be just the beginning of my experiences at that house. Through my younger years, from about 7 to 12, my mother dated a guy very on and off, which I think mostly had to do with him being in the army and staying with his family in Laredo, Texas whenever he was home. Either way, he invited us to visit his cousin's summer cabin in Monterey, Mexico for a weekend, so we did. The cabin was very ranch style, longer in one dimension and shorter in the other so it was built like an architectural rectangle. On one far side of the building, think of this in an aerial view, was the kitchen, and next to it was the living room. Attached to the living room was a long, slender hallway connected to bedrooms on each side and a bathroom on one of the sides. The backyard was only accessible through the living room via a sliding door and what started as a bit of the desert floor, met by a forest's tree line, although there weren't a lot of trees. Mostly it was dead and dying Monterey cypress trees. Meeting the so-called tree line was an elevated hunting tower. Its platform met the top of the vertical tree line. On our way to the cabin, my mom's boyfriend was telling us about a cursed legend of the witches of Monterey. Apparently, they had been haunting the mountainous area for generations and were his childhood version of La Girona. Clearly, he was trying to scare us from the get-go. And me being so young, I was eating it up like candy. We got to the cabin in the late evening, so we decided to stay in for the night and watch M. Night Shyamalan's The Lady in the Water. After the movie, my mom's boyfriend asked me to go get something from the bedroom for him, and as I was halfway down the hallway, he turned the lights off on me. Let me remind you that this was a very rural part of Mexico, so the dark was dark. So with all the scary stories and the, at the time for me, scary movie, I was spooked, and I froze. My mom's boyfriend began to make your stereotypical ghost noises and taunted me to go deeper into the dark hallway. But I was so petrified, I remember just standing there, frozen in fear. Long story short, my mother got onto him and he turned the lights back on. They comforted me, and after a few apologies, we all went to bed. I can't remember how I slept that night, but I honestly wish I did. The next day, we did basic tourist things. Went to a bazaar, embraced the city's beautiful mountain range, which seemed to hug the city, ate authentic Mexican food, and visited the main hub of the city. When the day was all done, we decided to call it and went back to the cabin. What's strange is that I remember the night before so vividly, but I can't remember much about this night other than what I'm about to share with you. I was in the living room of the cabin, and I remember my mom's boyfriend was there with me. He asked if I wanted to go up into the hunting tower out back with him, and I said yes. I remember following him through the back door of the living room, and I remember him walking ahead and turning back to wave me toward him. I thought he was just trying to help me keep up with him, so I followed him. I watched him climb up the ladder of the hunting tower, and then I heard a voice behind me. Hey, where are you going? I turned around. It was my mom's boyfriend behind me, asking where I was going. 
I didn't know how to say I was following you. I turned back around to look at the hunting tower along the tree line, and nobody was there. Nothing was. Not an animal, not my mother, not a ghost. Nothing. Fast forward to a few years ago, my now wife and I were still dating at the time and sharing ghost experiences with one another. I told her about this experience and Monterey, and I'll never forget the look on her face when I told her. She is from a Mexican family as well, and this legend of the witches of Monterey is a very real thing for her as well. The scary part? I was telling her this story on a Friday, and according to what her family told her growing up, Friday is a forbidden day to talk about them, because that's one day of the week that they're most powerful. Apparently, they never forget their prey, and they use that day as a lure toward what was lost. Initially, I thought, that's BS. But I can't begin to express how many Fridays my wife had to stop me because I would randomly bring up the story. Maybe it was just self-conscious, I don't know. But it still kind of freaks me out to this day. When I was growing up, there was enough family drama to want to scream. I spent most of my teenage years living with my older sister and her husband. She lives in a really old house in the downtown area in a city in Texas. Now this old house looked like it was about to collapse, even to this day, and I'm in my late 20s. It all started when I first began staying with her. Her son, when he would visit, stayed in the guest room, so I just had a habit of sleeping on the couch, because the room was typically taken. We had a long night of movies, snacks, and staying up, as siblings do, and she eventually went to bed. I remember slowly drifting off, and just as I was about to give in to the comforting lull of sleep, there was an intense feeling that somebody was watching me. Now, downtown isn't known for being safe. I was hoping that I wouldn't look toward her window and see a face looking in to rob the place. I didn't, but instead, I was greeted with a short, pale boy with no eyes. He wore old clothes. They looked to be 20th century. The overalls and everything, like a little house on the prairie vibe. He had dark hair and literally black holes where his eyes should have been. I'll never forget the wave of sadness that hit me. I began to cry. I can't even say that I felt fear. It was like I was thrown into a deep, instant depression. Finally, I was able to call for my sister. The boy continued to stare until she turned on the light. She refused to believe me that night. I was so insistent. Later, other things began to happen, and she started to see what I meant. Little things such as cabinets opening and closing in the middle of the day, doors opening and closing, running through the halls, the back gate being left open. Thankfully, the dog stayed home. One night, we heard knocking on the door to the backyard. We always used that door because the front door and side door weren't over by the garage, so it was just easier. Expecting her husband, who worked the night shift, to be coming for his lunch, she opened the door and screamed. He was there, standing in the doorway and just staring as he did before. She also began to cry. That's when it got worse. The doors and cabinets opened and closed all day and night. You'd feel somebody sit on the bed or the couch with you. Eventually, I took over the guest room until her son came to visit. I couldn't even face outward toward the mirror. Everything told me not to. So I would face the wall until I would almost fall asleep and then feel somebody sit on the bed 
with my sister, dead asleep. I knew it wasn't her. She also started seeing him, standing in her driveway, staring out into traffic all day or night until somebody would drive up. The boy started showing up everywhere. The last two times we came into contact with him were the worst. One happened when we got back pretty late from Walmart. We had a spur of the moment, midnight Walmart trip. We bought some groceries and food for all the pets and came home. She stepped out into the garage and all we heard were deafening screams. I looked over to see my sister also screaming as a handprint formed on her wrist and she dropped the groceries. We left them until morning we were so scared. The last and final time was, unfortunately, all for me. My sister worked at a World War II museum that was just a couple of blocks away, and I volunteered there. That was also haunted beyond belief, but that's a long story for another day. Anyway, she came to pick me up, since I wanted to sleep in on my weekend. I went after lunch to help clean up the place. She said that was fine by her, but just asked me to be quiet because her husband had just come home and she didn't want me to wake him. I knew the drill, drink some coffee, hang out and text some friends. I paused because I heard the shower running in their bedroom. John never showered with me in there. So I peeked down the hallway, which had a direct view of their room. John was passed out, he wasn't even awake. I stood there for a moment, confused. Then I heard the running and screams. Directly in front of me, I hear, Daddy, no, please. I was then pushed right into the door to the outdoor garage and a whisper that said, help me, right in my ear. I bailed. I ran outside just as my sister drove into the driveway under the garage. We never saw or heard him again. She says it's been peaceful ever since I left her house. He's never shown himself again. She has a huge hole under her house where animals go all the time. I'm guessing that's where he is. And he showed me how he died that morning. I can say that I hope that he's at peace and whatever happened to him never gets shown to anyone else again. Years ago, I was working nights as a phlebotomist, the person who draws your blood, in a hospital. There was this doctor who was notorious for ordering recurrent tests incorrectly. He would order a single draw when he really needed a serial draw 90% of the time. But because one in 10 times he really did want a single, you always had to check with him. This night happened to be the start of daylight savings. So at 1.59 a.m., the clocks would turn to 3 a.m. instead of 2. At about 1.30, I get an order on my screen from this doctor. I was the only phleb on nights and I worked with two techs. I sighed and showed them. Oh look, Dr. X ordered this test again. I'll see if he's on the floor and if he really wants this or if he wants the serial draw. I went up to the floor and he was at the nurse's station. I remember it so clearly because he was wearing plaid black and yellow skinny pants under his white coat. I couldn't stand the guy and I thought his loud, ugly pants just drew attention to his loud, ugly personality. I walked up to him and said, hey, I just got this order for XYZ patient. Did you mean to order the three serial draws? He was dismissive and said something like, of course I did. Can you just draw three? I, of course, cannot just come poke a patient three different times without orders. So I asked him if he could reorder it and I would go back to the lab to print the stickers and come right back and do the first draw. I drew a couple of patients quickly knowing that he would take a few minutes to get the order in. I rode the elevator back to the lab and checked my computer. It was 1.58 and the orders were there so I printed them and stuck my specimens in the centrifuge while they printed. 
I pulled the labels off the printer and looked closely and realized that he had ordered the single draw yet again. I pulled up the order code, wrote it down for him, and went back to the floor to just ask him to do this order exactly. When I got to the floor, he was standing exactly where he had been when I came up the first time, wearing plain black pants. I assumed somebody had forced him to change, and I knew he was going to be really annoyed when I asked him to reorder the labs. By now, it was definitely past 1.59, so the clocks were reading three-something. I asked him if he could reorder the test. He was totally pleasant and not at all frustrated that I was asking him again. I asked him if room 2008 had thrown up on him or something, and if that's why he had changed his clothes. He then seemed offended and was like, what are you talking about? I was like, sorry to offend, but when I came up to you earlier, you had on yellow pants, so I just assumed something happened. He scoffed at me and said, I've been wearing these all night. I don't own yellow pants. You must be confused. I'm thinking he's just being weird and should just admit he got puked on, but whatever. I go back to the lab, print the orders, and finally draw the patient. I stop to talk to one of the nurses for a moment, and on my way back down, she says something like, I saw you talking to Dr. X. He's being weird tonight, right? And she seemed kind of shaken. I said, yeah, he was wearing those hideous pants and then tried to pretend he wasn't. She told me that he walked into a room on one side of the wing wearing the yellow pants right before the time change, and then walked out seconds later from the other side of the wing wearing black. I was weirded out and went back down to the lab where the techs asked me where the samples were for the patients that I had drawn after first asking Dr. X to reorder. I opened the centrifuge I had left them in and they weren't there. The orders showed that the labels had never been printed, and when I apologetically went to redraw the patients, they had no idea who I was and didn't have cotton or tape on their arm from where I'd drawn them earlier. I still have absolutely no explanation for this. It appears that everything between first receiving the incorrect order and returning to ask him to reorder for the second time never happened. The text didn't remember me showing them that he had ordered incorrectly the first time or anything. The only reason I didn't check into a psychiatric facility was the nurse who corroborated my story. We hardly knew each other at the time, but we like trauma bonded over the experience and we've talked about it so many times. The weirdest part to me is that it coincided with daylight saving starting. That is completely a societal construct Nothing actually happens when we move the clock, so what the heck? I still get the chills when I think or talk about it. And because people always question why I was so tuned into the clocks and to know exactly when things happened, I was a worker whose shift was an hour shorter that night. We all kind of watch the clock and do a mini celebration when it changes. In order to set a little background, this took place in Western Wyoming. It was a small town, and at the time it had maybe 2,500 people. This was the first home that I lived in during the time that I spent in Wyoming. We moved here because of my dad's job. The family and I weren't very enthusiastic because we loved our home in Oklahoma. My dad and mom went up and looked for houses without us so that we could finish school and wouldn't have to stay in a hotel. The housing market wasn't doing so well and the choices were very limited. In fact, it came down to one choice. The house that we had to move into was built in the 1930s and it was rather different from the house we moved out of. It was single story with a large basement. The staircase to the basement was immediately to the left when you walked into the front door. No door at the bottom and the steps were steep. It was fairly dark without any lights on. 
We move in within three weeks of being told that we're moving. My dad spent the first night there alone and never told us what he experienced until years later. We were about eight to 13 years old between my brother and sister, so he didn't want to scare us. He decided to sleep in the basement because the TV was down there and the basement was fairly large. He said that it was late, around 2 a.m., when the TV turned on to static by itself. He's not bothered too much by it, but then he hears a door creak open and some footsteps. After doing a little investigating, he lays down again, but doesn't sleep much due to weird noises. Jumping forward sometime, this would be my first odd experience that would make me a believer later on in life. Every night, my sister and I would pick a VHS movie from a large bookshelf in the basement. Since I was too afraid to sleep in my room in the basement, we slept in a bunk in my sister's room. My mom tells us that it's time to put in a movie and go to bed, so we agree to head downstairs. My first choice was one of my two favorites, which was The Land Before Time. I asked my sister, without turning around, does Land Before Time sound good to you? After about a minute, I get impatient, and I say, well, how about The Lion King then? Not much more time passes and I get upset, and I tell her, Fine then, if you're not going to say anything, we're going to watch my movie. As I slowly turn around to address my sister, I see that nobody is there. Here's the real kicker. I look back to the large bookcase and see two shadows, plain as day. My shadow, which is to the left, and a smaller shadow that clearly looks like a little girl on the right. This is when I realize something is not right and I freak out. After screaming and starting up the stairs, I take one final look back to see that the little girl is moving down the hallway to my room. Well, at least her shadow is. There was absolutely nobody in the basement to produce that shadow. The shadow disappears into my room and then to top it off, the light comes on. So I'm screaming bloody murder at this point and I run to tell my parents. They tell me that it was just my imagination so then I ask where my sister is, and they tell me that she's been in her room waiting for me to bring up a movie. Again, years later, I get told that they had both seen a little girl in the house too. They knew full well that it was not my imagination. The last thing that happened was to my brother. He had a room in the basement, but he wasn't a chicken like I was. One late night, he was woken up to his door creaking open. He thought it was me because sometimes I would get scared and come sleep with him. After a few moments, he said a small head peeked through the door. He said, what's wrong, buddy? Can't sleep? The door slowly shuts and he hears footsteps down the hall to my room. He decides to get up and come see what who he thought was me was doing. After leaving his room, he sees my light is on and my door is open. He walks into the room and every single toy from my wooden toy box is out. This is very unusual for me because my parents were quite strict and would kick my butt if I left my room like that. He asks me the next day what I was doing down in my room so late and I had no idea what he was talking about. My mom vouched that I was passed out in her room after we all watched movies. To sum up this story, my brother and I both had recurring dreams about a little blonde girl being stuffed into my toy box in the closet. Another dream that we both had was this kind of tall old man beating us in the basement bathroom. We've come to think that maybe a kid was killed in that house and the negative energy manifested because of that. Something I forgot to mention, all the toys were cleaned up the next day and were meticulously placed, all standing up in an odd order. Nobody in my family ever placed them like that, and no one had been in the basement aside from my brother, and he said that he certainly didn't do it. In any case, I'm really glad we don't live there anymore.
When I was little, maybe around seven or so, I had my first paranormal experience. My mom always told me that she felt like I attracted things from the spiritual realm, even as a baby. But this experience is the first one that is my own memory, and I remember it vividly, now at 26 years old. My mom was unlucky enough to have not only my father die, but also my little sister's father. My dad passed away due to a car accident, and my sister's dad had committed side after a battle with severe depression. Needless to say, my mom had it pretty rough, and being a single working mother, she would often take us to a family friend who babysat us while she worked late nights at the hospital. The woman who babysat us was a warm, kind, and gentle woman named Rhonda. She always took the best care of us, and my sister and I really enjoyed staying with her. Rhonda had two birds who we loved to talk to. They would repeat simple things like, hello and what's up. We thought it was the coolest thing. After a long day of playing, my sister and I were off to bed and Rhonda tucked me into bed in her spare room downstairs. My sister was still pretty little and she slept in the same room as Rhonda because she was too scared to sleep alone. And Rhonda was like a grandma to us who was more than happy to share her bed if we got scared. I was a big girl and I loved having my own room to sleep in. I was never scared. On this night though, I was having trouble falling asleep and I just kept tossing and turning, growing frustrated that I wasn't asleep. And for some reason, I began to get anxiety and become fearful. I didn't know why I was scared but I was. After what felt like forever of me just laying there, contemplating getting up and crawling into Rhonda's bed, I heard something in a low, calm male voice say, Marissa, it's okay, just go to sleep. This surprised me, but it didn't scare me. I believe that as a child, you're more open and susceptible to paranormal things due to the fact that you're not conditioned to be fearful yet. With age, you learn what's scary and all the things that go bump in the night that you should run away from. But I was still so innocent that I didn't register this as threatening at all. Actually, it calmed me down and I started to feel very tired and I just accepted what the voice told me and went to sleep. The next morning, Rhonda made us breakfast as she always did. She sat across from me and sipped her coffee. I always asked her for a sip of it because if I wasn't already a strange child, I also had a taste for coffee. She asked me how I slept and I told her that I was scared, but that somebody had told me to go to sleep. She looked at me confused and she asked me if I had had a dream that somebody was talking to me. But I told her, no, I was awake. She said it was probably the birds talking again, and I told her I was sure that it wasn't. She then asked me if it was a man's voice or a woman's voice, and when I instantly said it was a man's voice, her face changed from the usual cheery, warm expression to put off and uncomfortable. I had never seen her face look like that before, and I think that's why I remember this so vividly. She very quickly changed the subject and we went about our day, and I didn't think about that again for years. Fast forward into my teens, my mom and I were having a discussion about the paranormal because I had had a lot of strange activity happening. She asked me what the very first experience I remember was that I thought was paranormal. I shared the story about the man's voice at Rhonda's house and how odd Rhonda's reaction had been. My mom looked at me and her eyes widened a bit. Rhonda had gone MIA a few years later and unfortunately she just slowly lost contact with us. Eventually she was no longer a part of our lives. I hadn't seen her in years. When my mom collected her thoughts, she looked at me and said, Marissa, you know Rhonda's son died in that room, right? I did not. I knew she had had a son who'd passed away of a tragic overdose, but I was so young that I had never met him. So I didn't really think anything about it. 
I looked back at my mom and we just didn't have anything to say. We were both thinking the same thing. If I was hearing a spirit speak to me, there's a good chance it could have been her son. From what my mom said about him, he was very kind and caring, much like his mom. Maybe that's why I wasn't afraid when he, if he, spoke to me. I'm not saying this is factually what happened, but it does make me wonder. The voice I heard was real, that much I do know. Regardless of who it belonged to, it's sure to me that that much is true. Since that experience, I've had many more, and unfortunately, they got much more sinister as I got older. It got very, very dark for a while, and I witnessed things that you usually only see in horror movies. I still think of this experience often, and hopefully you enjoyed it. Regardless, it's not something I'm likely to forget anytime soon. Up until the point of 2008, I wasn't okay with the supernatural, nor did I put much stock into it. I was already socially awkward enough as it was, and I was stuck in that awful teenage phase of not like other girls, but I also didn't think that I was special enough to see ghosts, an idea that I would come to regret. I'd really be okay now if I never saw one again. For more context, after we had moved into this house during the summer of 07, my parents noted that I had undergone a significant personality change. I was suddenly nasty, aggressive, abusive to people who had never harmed me before, even to my friends. Previously, I was just a goofy kid that teachers didn't quite know how to talk to, but I was otherwise considered very bright and pleasant to be around. I was no stranger to moving every other year, and this move had barely bothered me, so they knew I wasn't just upset. It was late one night, my dad was away for work, and it was just me, my mother, my little brother, and my dog that week. For some reason, I couldn't help but feel like something was watching me. I sat up in bed to see a dark figure standing in the corner of my room, almost indiscernible at first glance. I didn't yell, I didn't panic at first, because I thought that I had to be dreaming. I wasn't special, and non-special people don't do cool things like see ghosts. I tried to fall back asleep, but it was pretty tricky, and I felt like I was being watched for the rest of the night. The next day, I asked to sleep in another room, slightly more fearful now, but thinking I just needed a change of pace. It was a fluke, and by sleeping elsewhere, my brain would reset, and I would be fine. I had not just seen a ghost. My mother thought that I was acting up for attention, but figured it wasn't the hill to die on and let me sleep elsewhere. So I did. That thing followed me. It waited at the foot of my bed all night, staring me down as I tried to sleep. I was so exhausted from the lack of sleep the previous night that I did manage to drift off, but it was a restless sleep. I tried to envision myself surrounded by white light, like the Tolkien elves, hoping that it might repel the darkness. The third day, I was sat at the table with a few friends and their mothers and my own family. We had just had dinner and were doling out the cinnamon rolls, when I suddenly felt my whole body get heavy, like somebody had just added a 50-pound weight to my skull. I couldn't stop it. I slumped forward in my chair despite my grabbing at the back of it to stay upright. My eyes just about rolled into the back of my head. Someone asked me if I was okay. I couldn't see. I couldn't see, and yet I could. I suddenly saw a flat plane stretched out before me, and everything was gray. The dark figure stood right in front of me. And then it rushed me. It ran at me so fast I didn't know what to do. I couldn't do anything. I had to fight to pry my jaws apart, and I screamed. It was like the screaming released me, and I about knocked my chair into the wall I shot back so hard. I was sobbing, and I could hardly catch my breath, 
while everyone tried to figure out what was wrong. I told my mother what I saw, that the thing was back and that it tried to hurt me. I think this finally convinced her that I wasn't crazy, that something was wrong and I wasn't just trying to get attention. I wasn't a crier, I hated being caught crying. After I was calmed down, she took her two friends upstairs with her to my room. She didn't tell me until several years later that her friends had seen it, had seen this dark presence in my room, could prove that I wasn't lying, that I wasn't crazy. The dog often followed her around the house while she was doing chores, but he refused to go anywhere near my room. He actually growled at my room, hackles raised kind of a growl. Even after we moved to a new house, my dog never wanted to stay long in my room again. I don't know if it was because he remembered the bad thing from before, or if something had been irreparably broken in me, or was now a part of me. I couldn't walk into churches anymore without having sudden, unexplainable breakdowns. I would feel like hands were choking me. I would struggle to breathe. I would feel a hundred emotions at once and start sobbing. Needless to say, I quit entering churches after more than a few bad experiences. We found a journal in my room a few months before I moved out for uni, full of crazy ramblings, written by something that said it was a monster, that my parents would unalive me if they discovered I was no longer human, that it would have to hurt my family first to stay alive. I burned it immediately, and I tossed the remnants into the trash can. The scariest part of that was, all of it was in my handwriting, and yet I don't remember writing any of it. My family still wonders to this day what it was. Germany is small and so many new things got built on top of old things all the time. We lived close to Celtic tombs, had visited old mounds and tall obelisks mounted on them. We lived next to a walled city. Buildings in the village could be dated back several centuries prior and were still inhabited by people today. Maybe our home was on top of someone's grave. The weirdest coincidence of all was that the people who had lived there before us had developed a reputation of being quite nasty as well. I wonder if they'd always been that way, or if maybe the same thing that happened to me, and changed me, changed them, too. I thought I'd share a few stories that I heard from my ex-boyfriend's mom that I thought were pretty fascinating. We're all from the same reservation, so I can explain the setting pretty well. Basically, there's this one bush road that takes you from the reserve deep into the woods until you get to another town. But that stretch of dirt road goes on for about 45 minutes. I think it was an old logging road once, but now we just call it the limit. And we use that area of the forest for camping, fishing, ski-doo riding, and four-wheeler riding. Stuff like that. It's also just a chill road to drive down with your friends. If you're from a small town, you know how it is. Anyway, she had two paranormal experiences on this particular road, which isn't entirely out of the ordinary. My dad has even had an experience on this road too. It's kind of known for all sorts of strange things happening, but it's fine. Nobody's scared of it. I still go drive down it to watch pretty sunsets. It's just chill like that. The first story is about a weird time loop. She and her cousin were driving down this road to go get some water, since there was also a natural spring around there. On their way back, their car stalls out and just won't start up again. This happened back in the 80s, so there weren't any cell phones you could use to call for help. So they started walking. They weren't too far, and they had plenty of daylight left, so it was fine. But as they're walking, they see another car stopped in the distance. They think, oh cool, we can get a ride from these guys. But as they get closer, they see that it's the same make and model of their car. They get even closer, and they realize that no, it's the same car. They're confused as heck, but 
can completely verify that it is their car by looking in the windows. The sweater she left in the back seat, the empty pop can her cousin was drinking out of. Everything inside was exactly as they had left it. And honestly, they just didn't know what to do. They hadn't turned off that dirt road at all. They hadn't even walked far enough to make it to another trail that they could turn off on. They thought it was weird, but figured they should just keep walking as it's all they could do. They keep going and sure enough, up ahead down the road, there's a parked car, the same as before. This time they are tripping out and they run up to it and yep, it is 100% their car again. Her cousin gets a stick from the woods and leaves it on the hood of the car, saying that if they keep walking and the same things happen, at least they can see if the stick would have been moved. They take off walking and it happens again. This time, the stick is gone. She described the feeling of being afraid that the time loop would just go on forever, but it didn't. The next time they walked down the road, they realized they were able to walk farther and eventually they made it back to the reservation. They got help and towed the car, but never got an explanation or figured out what happened with the car and the time loop. She has no idea why the stick that they left on the hood of the car disappeared. And I don't have any idea either. The second story is about a UFO sighting she had with some friends on that same road. This happened years later, after the first incident, maybe in the early 90s, and it was during the summertime. She and her friends were riding around in a car, having a few beers, not the driver obviously, and listening to music. One of their friends commented that there must be a four-wheeler in the woods, but that it's weird since there were no trails there. They look over to see what he's talking about, and all they can see are these white lights emanating from deep in the woods. They could see that there's a source of light, but they couldn't see the object itself through the trees. The driver slows down and turns down the music. She says that there wasn't anything too alarming about what they were seeing at that point, but that there was just this feeling that something wasn't right. And she said that everyone felt it because all of them got quiet as they looked out the windows, which were wide open. When things got quiet, they were able to hear a low humming. She had a hard time describing the humming, just that it was very low, but that it almost felt like ringing in the ears. They all heard it. They were silent looking at the lights, but then whatever it was shot up directly into the sky and they saw a UFO. This was so long ago that she told me about it and that it happened that I wish I could describe more about how it looked. But she did say that the second it shot into the sky, it changed into all sorts of colors that seemed to rotate around the craft. It paused right above the tree line for a few seconds, and then it just took off right into the horizon, lights changing again when it moved. Those are her experiences. It's weird too, that everyone's experiences on this road are so vastly different. There are some sightings of creatures from our Algonquin folklore. There's Bigfoot sightings, UFO sightings, time loops. And then I have other friends who just heard really creepy singing that got closer and closer with no source. We also just found out that our entire reservation is sitting atop a huge uranium deposit. Apparently it's the largest in our province, but I'm not sure. Nuclear mining companies keep trying to build mines and we keep refusing. I'm wondering if that has something to do with it, because the amount of paranormal things that happened around here is pretty wild. Something happened when I was camping 20 years ago and I can't get it out of my head. If you have any ideas about what this might be, I'm very interested in hearing it. I was visiting my uncle and cousin, Sarah, in rural Pennsylvania. I was about 16 and Sarah was about 12. Sarah asked me if we could go camping 
which meant pitching a tent at the top of this huge foothill that was on the property. The foothill was very steep and had woods at the top. I'd never been camping before then, but I figured if anything happened, we could just walk back down to the house. So I said, cool, no problem. We pitched the tent so the woods were directly behind it, with the tent opening facing out toward the scenery and the view. We roasted marshmallows, told campfire stories, and got in the tent around 11 p.m. or midnight. Sarah fell asleep right away, but I couldn't, so I was just lying there counting sheep. Suddenly, I heard leaves shuffling in the woods behind the tent, and I heard footsteps coming out of the woods behind the tent. There were a few steps, and then it would stop. Then a few more, and as it got closer, I heard it step on some large rocks. It sounded like a really large hoof stepped on the rock, because it made that same clop sound as a horse. As it got closer to the tent, I could feel the impact of each step in the ground under me, so whatever it was sounded very heavy. At first I thought it was a large buck, and I debated waking up my cousin so she wouldn't miss it. But then it kept coming closer to the tent, closer than a deer or buck ever would have, and suddenly I was overcome with this feeling of full body dread, like something was very, very wrong. Then I heard a really bizarre sound. It sounded like it was coming from about eight to 10 feet off the ground. And the best way I can describe it is like someone had a huge roll of masking tape and was pulling off a big section at a time. It was this odd tearing sound for lack of a better word and each tearing sound was loud and lasted two to three seconds. I told myself that it was a deer and that it was tearing bark off trees and that's what was making the noise, but deep down I knew something was wrong. I didn't want to risk waking or scaring Sarah, so I just lay there as quietly as possible, praying that whatever it was would leave. But instead of leaving, the tearing sound got closer still about eight to 10 feet off the ground. Now it was directly behind the tent, within five to 10 feet. Right then I heard Sarah scream whisper my name and I realized she was awake and heard it too. She asked me what it was and I told her that it was fine, that it was just a deer and to go back to sleep. She said, that doesn't sound like a deer but I insisted that it was because I was too scared to make a run for the house with whatever this thing was right outside. So we listened to it slowly move around to the left side of the tent, still close, still making the sound every few seconds. And then things got even weirder. It started moving around to the front of the tent where the ground dropped off steeply. So each few feet forward was also several feet down. As this thing went around to the front, the sound stayed at the eight to 10 foot height and was slowly moving to the right. Now, if the thing making this sound was standing on the ground, then the sound should have dropped several feet, but the sound stayed at the same height all the way around. I even wondered if it was a bird, but it was moving too slowly and that wouldn't account for the hoof steps I'd heard before. After the sound faded into the woods, Sarah and I just lay awake for the rest of the night, too afraid to leave the tent. At first light, we booked it back to the house and told my uncle what had happened. Even though he didn't know what it was, he just shrugged and didn't seem too concerned. But that experience scared me so much I've never been camping since, since I know I didn't hallucinate or imagine it because Sarah heard it too. Has anyone else ever heard of anything like this? I've asked friends who are avid outdoorsmen, hunters, and trackers, and none of them have ever heard of anything like it. This started a few years ago. And so far, there's been no explanation of the things that keep occurring. I live in the southern United States near a national park in a fairly rural area. So our first guess was that this had to be some sort of wildlife. 
something that was scaring us for no reason other than us getting into our own heads. However, after a ton of internal explanations, we finally came to the conclusion that we had none. The first thing that occurred was fairly brief. It was shortly after the death of my uncle, who was fairly close to us before he passed. He was a veteran, and while in the army, he had volunteered to have shock treatments that altered his personality greatly. This had occurred during the Vietnam era while he was stationed in Germany. My grandmother was in the bathroom and I was in my room just playing a game. When out of the blue, the wall sounded as if somebody was beating on it, trying to get our attention. Three loud knocks, then nothing. We were worried that something had happened to our neighbor, an elderly woman, and that she needed our help. But after we went outside to check, there was nobody there. Fast forward a few months, we started hearing footsteps on the roof. They started out light and easily explainable, something along the lines of a cat walking on the roof. We had seen it happening a few times, so we thought nothing of it until they started to get a bit heavier. Eventually, it sounded like something that weighed a lot more than a cat, even more than I did, was sprinting across the roof, every night from one end of the house to the other. Things got worse after that. We started to find dead animals around the property, and while some of it could easily be explained as roadkill, we do have a lot of problems with people speeding due to a lack of police presence in the area, there was also a ton of random things that we would find dead nearby. We would find crows and ravens laying in our backyard, the occasional snake. And one time, we found a deer that apparently walked onto our property and dropped dead. There was not a single sign of a wound or anything when we found it. We started to hear things inside the house soon after, seeing things out of the corner of our eyes that would vanish before we could turn to get a good look at it. Scratching mainly, we've put rat traps and every kind of poison we could think of in our walls, but there's no sign of vermin. We would hear whispers at night, like somebody was trying to talk to us. We're rational people, we checked to see if there were any cracks in the windows or door frames that could make the wind blow in and sound strange. But from everything that we've checked, there doesn't seem to be any opening that could make that noise. One of my old friends, who before this story was as skeptical as I was, was sitting in my living room playing something on our PlayStation when he thought he saw somebody walk past the window. It doesn't sound too scary, right? Well, no, until you consider that my windows are nearly 10 feet off the ground. Our house is raised to allow water to pass underneath it to prevent any water damage. And the place that he claims to have seen the man wasn't near any stairs. He came to visit another time about a month later. We were sitting and talking to one another when he said that he needed to use the bathroom and he left to do his business. He goes and when he comes back, He's pale, white, and terrified. When I asked him what was wrong, he was evasive. So we just got in the car and drove down to Sonic to grab some food and talk. That's when he told me that he saw somebody staring at him from my room as he walked back, smiling at him, and that it had yellow eyes. He doesn't come around anymore. At least he doesn't stay after nightfall. I don't know if what he claims is true or not, but it still scares me to think about just how scared he was. He's just not the type, so I'm inclined to believe. I've tried cleansing the house with sage. We've got a crucifix in every room now. Near the front door, we have three. We've even duct taped the back door shut and we have it locked to be absolutely certain that nothing can get in. We just don't have any explanation.
I live in North Dakota, in cattle country. In 2019, my grandpa passed away in the old farmhouse, which was the homestead for multiple generations. He died of side. It came out of nowhere and took everybody by shock. He was a very stubborn, independent man, so I just assumed that he preferred to die his own way, as opposed to being sent to some kind of old age home. He was also known to drink heavily from time to time. My father and I found him in his rocking chair, with the gun on his lap. Since then, there have been a run of odd events happening in and around the farmhouse and yard. Early on, it was just little things, doors opening that shouldn't be, unexplainable sounds in other parts of the house when nobody was there. One time, I thought I saw my grandpa in the mirror behind me. Overall, creepy vibes, generic haunting stuff. I inherited the yard. It's been vacant since my grandpa's death. I was excited to fix it up and start fresh. One day, I was in the tree line cleaning up dead trees when I heard three distinct gunshots, like shots that seemed 50 yards away. I literally hit the ground. After a while, I got up, but there was no one around. About 10 minutes later, an old friend of my grandpa's drove into the yard. I had known him for years. He pulled up and I asked him if he knew who'd been shooting. He said it wasn't him and that he saw nobody around. He didn't seem himself. He was usually a happy guy, but on this day he seemed distracted, like he was in a fog. He said, are you sure you should live here? I said yes, that I was excited to rebrand the yard. Not long after that, he left. About a month later, he died of a stroke. The day following the gunshots, my daughter, who was five at the time, and I were in the old house. She was playing with a toy train while I was cleaning. She abruptly stood up and said, I want to go home. I followed her out of the house and helped her into my truck. She asked me if I could go get her train. When I went back into the house, it was like walking into a different universe. It was freezing cold. I could see my own breath. The house was the same, but the colors were different, almost muted. I was freaked out and left the house too. When I left, I heard thumping on the walls and siding of the house. Freaky stuff. I got in my truck and sped out. When we were a couple of miles away, I stopped and I asked my daughter what she had seen. She said that she saw a man with a pointy hat in the house. She hasn't been allowed in the yard since. I returned later that night, stupid, I know, and I took pictures of the house. And when I looked at them later, there appeared to be a shadow figure with a pointed hat looking at me. I could only see it in pictures though, not in real time. I met with a pastor and he told me that what I was describing, the change in temperature, the muted colors, all tell of demonic activity. He agreed to pray and anoint and bless the house. When we went to the house, I was expecting fireworks, really, but nothing happened. In fact, it was calm and peaceful. I was optimistic that things were better. And they were, for some time. To clarify, the house is vacant, but my father and I still have cattle on the yard. And here are some of the things that have been happening over the past year. When I'm on the yard, I have unexplainable phantom pains in my left hand. Only when I'm on the yard and nowhere else. A stabbing pain in the palm of just my left hand. There was a large dead coyote in our shop. No evidence of how it got in there. One day, my dad drove into the yard and found our large bull trapped in a bale feeder. No explanation for that either. We found a cow dead with a broken neck in the corral. When I approached the carcass, my left hand began to throb. I could smell a unique scent not associated with livestock. I've been around dead animals, but this was different. All of these things led me to tell my story. We've attempted spiritual intervention and things just seem to be getting worse. 
I don't know what the significance of the pointed hat demon is. I know of the hat man, but this isn't linked to sleep paralysis at all. Can anyone explain the phantom pain in my left hand? What was the significance of the three gunshots? My grandpa was an avid hunter. Was this a warning from him? Honestly, any advice would be appreciated. I was just thinking of an experience I had one weekend this past summer. I've had many extremely dark paranormal experiences, but this wasn't one of them. It was still emotionally intense and profound in its own way, though. I was at an outdoor music festival in Virginia, in the United States. It was on an old farm. The property was huge, with big rolling fields and a few various small buildings littered about. After that evening's show got called off due to threatening electrical storms and crazy strong wind, I started walking across a field toward a little old shack set back among a few trees. The setting was surreal, like out of a movie. The sky was swirling and churning with dark gray-black clouds. The wind was strong, but felt very refreshing after a hot, sunny, sweaty day. The electricity in the air was palpable. Everything felt slightly charged. As I started walking into the middle of the field, suddenly everybody was gone. I couldn't see or hear a single person from the festival. I kept walking across the field to the shack, and I was feeling very heavy emotionally. There was a definite presence, not malevolent, but heavy. When I got to the shack, I collapsed on my knees and I began weeping and apologizing repeatedly. This went on probably for a few minutes, but it felt like it was happening outside of time. It felt to me, at this point, like I was addressing formerly enslaved people who had lived and worked on the property. It was like they were all around me. Eventually, I stood up. I felt pleasantly exhausted after a big emotional release. I still hadn't seen or heard anyone from the festival since I had first walked away from them. I began walking back slowly toward the field where my car was and the rain started pouring down. I soaked it all in as I walked back to my car. That night, after it became clear that the storm was going to prevent any further music from happening, I drove back to my motel room in heavy rain. I was awake in bed at 3 a.m. or so, when I heard a creaking noise that turned out to be the mini fridge door slowly opening. I got up to check it out, I thought maybe the magnet on the mini fridge was weak, but it wasn't. It was very strong. There was no way this thing opened on its own. So I knew that something was there with me. I wasn't quite confident yet in my ability to assess the situation accurately on the spot. So I was feeling a bit leery and self-protective. But as some time went by, I grew more relaxed and I sensed that the spirit was not malevolent. I sensed that she was a female spirit of a formerly enslaved person who had followed me back to my motel room. The energy in the room wasn't dark or ominous. It was like a mixture of sorrow, exhaustion, curiosity, and relief. I looked up the history of the property that the festival was being held at, and I confirmed that the property had been home to many enslaved people in the 18th and 19th centuries. I found myself wishing that I had been more comforting and explicitly accepting of her during those first few hours. I hope she was able to pass on after our encounter. In a way, I feel like she followed me back from the farm before she chose to pass on, because I was a curiosity to her, or maybe because I had shown kindness. Something that makes this experience stand out to me is that I rarely encounter human spirits like this. Mostly, I only encounter human spirits remotely through other people. 
My immediate radius is always so full of other non-human entities that I think most human spirits just steer clear. But there are a few things about the way this encounter unfolded that I think allowed for it to happen as it did. I had driven 12 hours to get there on the previous day, so there wasn't the usual residual dark energy just hanging around from the get-go. I also feel like the intense swirling electrical wind and rainstorms that surrounded the festival for multiple days created a unique situation energetically. Either way, it was an emotional experience, and it felt cleansing. This happened a few years ago, and it's something that I consider to be a paranormal experience. For context, I collect vintage clown dolls, and I'm a clown for hire myself. Clowns have been a big part of my life. I find clowns very comforting, so collecting older ones was always something that I've been excited about. I don't have very many clown dolls. Specifically, I collect sand clowns, usually. I have around eight or ten clown dolls, I think. So a few years back, I got a hold of a new sand clown among two others. I instantly had a very strong connection to the clown, and I would take him with me everywhere. In the car, around the house, that sort of casual thing. I think I even took him to school once in my backpack. I was in high school at the time. A little while after this, I started having dreams. I still remember them vividly in such high detail. I had the same exact dream every time, and I knew it was a dream. I was fully conscious during them. It didn't feel like a dream. It almost felt like it was real life somehow. I had these dreams back to back several times. The dream would be that I was in a house with wooden floors, wooden walls, and a wooden roof. At the end of the room that I was facing, there was one wooden chair, with my clown doll sitting in it staring at me. There were two doors to the side of it, open, with a little toy train track that ran through both of them. There were two doors on either side. The first dream, I just looked through all the doors, the two bedrooms, the standard sort of guest room, I suppose, and on the left, the first door was a little girl's room with a crib and some toys like bears. It was very sweet. The last room was a sort of sitting room, couches and a coffee table. When I came back, the clown was still there in the chair. I walked up to it and started talking to it, but nothing really happened. I did feel sort of unnerved, like there was a presence, and I never went through the two gateways because it was pitch black and it scared me. In most dreams, I feel some sort of progress towards something. These dreams never progressed or changed. It was the same room, the same clown, nothing going on, just a sense of unease, like I was being watched. So I kept getting these dreams every night, over and over, back to back. After a while, I start to get scared, and I yell at the clown doll. I just sort of ask what I'm doing there and if it was haunted or something. I got really upset at this point. The clown's eyes looked side to side, and it really freaked me out. In the last dream I had, I got mad, and I told it to leave me alone, and to never come back to bother me. I was really scared and started talking about some religious things, because I was getting worried that it could have been a demon or a ghost at this point, haunting me. I started getting really into it, and a little train came out of the doorway and just ran around the track once, whistling a few times. The clown doll's eyes looked directly at me, and he said something for the first time, and I woke up. I can't remember what it was. I could never make it out. After this, I never had that dream again. I guess whatever I did made it leave. Or not? I'm not really sure, honestly. 
I'm sure a lot of people would say, hey, this isn't supernatural. What are you, stupid? It's just a dream. But it's something that I felt, deep in my core, that this was supernatural, because I've never experienced anything like it. The clown doll is still one of my favorites. After the dreams, I actually feel more attached to it. These dolls mean a lot to me, and I have them on my desk, and I still take them with me places sometimes. When I hold them now, it almost feels like it fills me with a sense of calm. Sometimes I wonder if it does have some sort of spirit attached to it, but maybe it's just very good and helpful. I got this clown and went through this when I was going through recovery from extensive trauma, and they have helped me a lot in my recovery despite the weird and scary dreams. I almost feel like I know him, like we're friends. I know it sounds kind of weird, and I'm sure this isn't the most exciting story, but that's what happened to me. My parents live in a community in the desert of southwestern United States. After graduating college, I spent some time living at their house, going through the misery of unemployment and applying for jobs. Being away from the city, their neighborhood can get really dark at night, especially when there are clouds or the moon isn't out. This neighborhood has had some issues with the paranormal. People have posted on the Facebook community page, asking if anyone has had strange experiences, with the comments on the posts always blowing up, with people sharing encounters. Dogs barking and growling at entities not visible in the house, silverware and dishes going missing over time, only to later find it mysteriously in the attic. Shadow figures, things like that. One late night, I was alone at their house, watching television. My parents were gone on vacation back east. My parents have this odd cat, who is the living definition of a scaredy cat. Even though it enjoys going outside, the cat won't go unless you're out there with it. If you go back inside, the cat will immediately be cowering in the windows, begging to be let in. As I was watching television, the cat comes darting past my feet to the sliding glass door that opens to the backyard. She was in that low, sneaking position the cats get in when they see something they want to hunt or pounce on. She was frozen, fixated, on something in the back corner of the yard. Out of curiosity of what the cat was seeing, I opened the sliding glass door and let her out. She immediately runs up to the bushes in the corner of the yard and stops, still in the low sneaking position. I walked outside, wondering what in the world was going on. This was one of those dark nights with no moon in the sky, making it difficult to see anything except the outline of the bushes. Suddenly, an orb of bright yellow light flies out of the bushes about the size of a softball. The orb goes up and over the cinder block wall into the neighbor's yard. Both the cat and I jump out of fright. I run back inside, being filled with the familiar dreaded feeling of being around something paranormal. Collecting my courage, I grab a flashlight and I go back out to see if anything's there and to find the cat. I go back to the corner of the backyard, and I see nothing in the bushes where the orb had come out of. I search the whole yard, and I can't find the cat, who was also too little to jump the cinder block walls. The whole time I was outside again just felt wrong, like I shouldn't be there. I went back inside and waited a couple of hours until the cat finally showed up in the windowsill in a state of panic. I knew that I saw something with this experience, because it was this little weird cat who brought it to my attention. 
A few days later, my parents are back from their vacation and I tell them about my weird experience. This kind of freaked my mom out, who has read the community Facebook posts about the neighborhood having paranormal activity. Going to bed, I suddenly see a bunch of police cars show up outside the neighbor's house and our house. Police are getting out with their guns drawn. I alert my parents and we lurk in the windows wondering what in the world is happening. I see the next door neighbor girl outside, talking to the police. Nothing really happened except the police searched her house. The next day, my dad calls our neighbor, asking if everything was okay and if they could help. Apparently, their daughter was home alone while they were away. She was walking in the hallway when she saw a black shadowy figure in the house at the end of the hall. She screamed and ran for her phone and called the police. The police searched the house and the surrounding area, but found nobody and didn't find any evidence of a break-in. It was the neighbor's house, their bushes actually, that the orb had flown out of a few nights prior. from a small town in the middle of Denmark, and my grandfather used to live about 10 kilometers from us. He was what you would roughly translate as a nature caretaker. He lives at the place and gets paid to take care of it. The place that he lived was in a protected area in the forest, just where Denmark's biggest river meets a huge lake. The place had a lot of old buildings, an old paper factory, and a water mill. It used to be run by the monks of the Benedictine order. They built the mill to utilize the water stream to power the machines at the paper factory. The place is basically called the Monastery Mill. Most buildings are from the late 1500s to 1700s, but some of them are from 1100. All the way up until the 1800s, the place was run by the monks. On the other side of the river lived the nuns of the Benedictine order, who were said to have a bad relationship with the monks. No one really knows what started this feud. Firstly, it was small. Food would go missing from the monks' stock. Then the water mill would stop, and they would realize an insane amount of wood was blocking the water. Lastly, they would wake up to find cattle and chickens had been killed. And one night, the paper factory, which was built entirely of wood, was set on fire. Ever since that day, nobody had seen the monks. Everyone thought that they had left the mill to go somewhere else, as the order had many monasteries across the country. Well, four years ago, when I had just turned 18, my granddad was going hunting in Sweden. He asked me if I could take care of his place and his dogs for a couple of days, and since I didn't have a car yet, I would just sleep there and take the bus to school in the morning. The place is beautiful, and I was so excited to spend some time there. When I went to sleep the first night, I was woken up at exactly 12 o'clock by what sounded like a small church bell. It rang for a couple of minutes, and then it stopped. A small bell the monks used to use to call mass was just outside my granddad's house, so I assumed that's what I had heard. But when I woke up the next morning and checked out the bell, it was tied tightly, so no wind or person could have made that bell ring. The next night it happened again. It woke me up at exactly midnight and rang for a couple of minutes. I slowly made my way to the front door, which was made of glass, to look at the bell. And there were my granddad's two dogs, looking out while growling. I swear when I looked out, I saw a bald man wearing a long white dress robe type thing disappearing into the woods, almost like he was floating. I called my dad sobbing and asked him to come and pick me up, and he did. 
We both went back the next day, checked on the bell, and it was still tied up. My dad then confided in me that even though he doesn't believe in that stuff, as he put it, he had had many weird experiences as a kid there, and he still couldn't find any explanation for most of them. Fast forward to last year. My granddad was still living there, and the council decided to split the river and make it wider. Had something to do with the forest environment. I didn't really exactly get why. It took weeks for them to plan it out. And then, the day came when all the machinery to start the expansion got kicked on. They only got to work for a couple of hours, though, until they had to stop. Because as they were digging, they had found bones. Just a couple, no big deal. But what they soon realized was that by the river, on the monk's side, there was a mass grave. After specialists were called and weeks of digging commenced, they approximated that the grave had about 40 bodies in it, all from the 1800s. At that point, everyone realized that the monks had never left. What happened to them at that paper factory, though? No one knows. This story takes place in 2010. When I was in high school, I worked at the movie theater in town. It was an awesome first job. Free popcorn, soda, and candy, and I got to watch movies whenever I wanted. The owners would even let me bring friends in after hours to watch movies or play games on the big screen. It was pretty normal for my friends to drive around town and randomly stop by the theater when they knew I was working. Not much else to do in a small town. Two of my friends, Taylor, nicknamed Tiege, and Justin, stopped by and hung out in the lobby with me while we waited for the movie to end. Tiege told me that he had heard a rumor of some weird lights out in an old cemetery just outside of town. Tiege was a pathological liar, so I doubted almost everything that came out of his mouth. Justin started to back up what Tiege was saying, so I told them that as soon as I had finished up cleaning the theater, I would close up and drive out to the cemetery with them. The late show finished, I cleaned the theater, and I locked up at around 1am. I honestly had no idea what to expect, so I told them that I would drive. At the time, I drove my dad's F-150 Ford pickup truck, so the three of us squeezed into the front seat and they directed me out to the cemetery. I thought for sure they were messing with me, but after about 20 minutes of driving on old country roads, we came up to a bridge, which was at the bottom of a hill. The bridge was surrounded by woods, and the cemetery was at the top of the hill. The bridge looked super old, and I wasn't sure if it would hold the weight of the truck, so I parked the truck right in front of it. Tiege told me to turn the truck off, and said he was getting out. At this point, I didn't really trust Tiege, and I was also freaked out because we were at a cemetery at 2 o'clock in the morning, so I told them that I was staying in the truck. They caved and stayed in the truck with me. About five or so minutes pass, and we're starting to see these fireflies. It was so dark and clear out that we could even see them in the woods around us. I asked Tiege if those were the lights he saw. But before he could answer, he pointed up at the top of the hill, and that's when I saw a giant blue light. Once I looked at this blue light at the top of the hill, several others popped up in the woods around us, and then more up in the actual cemetery. The lights looked like they were blinking, but this could have also been from them moving around in the woods where trees were blocking the light. I started freaking out, and I was screaming at both of them, and I told them that if they were playing some kind of elaborate prank on me, it wasn't funny, and that I was leaving. I tried to start the truck, but it turned once, and then died. 
Tiej had a shocked look on his face, which only made me more anxious. At this point, I was crying, borderline hysterical, and I kept pumping the gas while turning the key. I didn't look up. I didn't want to. Finally, after what felt like forever, the truck started. I looked up and saw that blue light at the top of the hill was now in the middle of the bridge and had taken the shape of a torso. At this point, I had no clue what was happening, but I just had a really bad feeling and I knew I needed to get us out of there. Tiege was yelling at me to stay there, that he wanted this thing to get closer, but I wasn't hearing it. I was shaking and I threw the truck into reverse and sped back the way we came. We were quiet the whole way back to the theater. I dropped Tiege and Justin off at their car and drove home. I sat up in bed on the computer searching to see if I could find any explanation for what I had seen. Angels? Demons? Spirit orbs? Aliens? No idea. It all seemed like BS to me, but I still couldn't logically explain what I saw. The following morning, I went to Brittany's house. Brittany was my best friend at the time, and I knew she would believe me. As soon as I told her about the story, she asked me to drive her out there, so I did. We parked in front of the bridge, walked up the hill, and then around the cemetery. We looked for LED lights on tombstones, flashlights, footprints, anything, but we didn't see a thing that could explain what I saw the night before. The cemetery was way too far away from any major road for it to have been car lights. I still don't know what we saw that night, and I get goosebumps every time I think about it. If anything, it's helped me keep an open mind about the weird stuff that happens. I will never forget these two paranormal experiences that I had at church when I was 14. When I was 14, I went to a church gathering on Halloween night that was called Hallelujah Night. It was a Christian alternative to Halloween. My family and I would get there in the afternoon since we would volunteer to help set up the booths, cakewalk, candy barrels, etc. But I was mostly there to get first dibs on all the candy. After I finished helping with the usual booth setup, I took a seat on the bench near the main sanctuary. It was my favorite place to sit, since I could see the entire lot and, most of all, the beautiful sunset. I pulled out my PSP and was just scrolling through some music that I had on it when some guy approached me and started a conversation. I've never been a people person, so usually when things like this happen, I keep the conversation short. However, this guy had this weird kind of warmth to him, as if he was a friend of mine. As the conversation carried on, I started to ask him if he was new, because I hadn't seen him before. He told me that he'd been going to this church for years, but left after an incident happened. When I asked him about the incident, he paused, looked at me, and said that there were some things people pick up on that they know aren't normal and that you should never get curious about things that you know you should leave alone. I sort of had a confused look on my face since I didn't know what he meant at the time. The guy noticed it and said that I would understand once I got older. I looked down at the PSP that I still had in my hands, and when I looked up right away, the guy was gone. I looked around and I couldn't find him anywhere in the lot. There were just a few people still prepping for Hallelujah Night. It didn't make any sense. Fast forward to a few months later, I was sitting in the main sanctuary before leaving to do my usual volunteer work on the upper floor of the main sanctuary. The upper floor was a daycare area for kids, so at the end of service, volunteers would escort the children downstairs and I would go into each room shutting off the lights and making sure that no children were still up there. I'll never forget getting up to leave to do my usual duties when the pastor started talking about an upcoming funeral. I looked at the big screens on each side of the main sanctuary, 
and the face of the one man that I had been talking to during Hallelujah Night setup was there. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. To this day, it still seems unreal. I was beyond shaken as I made my way out of the main sanctuary and to the flights of big stairs as I went up to the upper floor. Once I made it up to the upper floor, another volunteer had confirmed that all the children were escorted downstairs. She noticed that I had a sort of pale look from seeing what I had seen in the main sanctuary and asked me if I was okay. I told her that it was nothing and I proceeded to cut off all the lights on the upper floor as she left downstairs. The upper floor was like a giant hallway with doors on each side and a door at the end of the hallway with a giant window in it. When I came to the last room at the end of the hall, I would always leave the blinds on that big window open since the light always illuminated the dark hallway and made me feel less scared. But as I left the room, I remember feeling panicked. It started freezing and I felt like if I left that room, something would be waiting for me in the darkened rooms that was going to jump out and attack me. As I'm trying to muster up the courage to just run for it, I see a small head of a child peek out a couple of doors down. It stayed there for a few seconds, then put its head back in the room. I immediately called out to the child, but got no answer. The fear that I had had a minute ago was gone as I left the last room to go through the illuminated hallway. I made it to the other room in a matter of seconds, turning on the lights and searching the entire room for the child I saw, but no one was there. I started getting spooked again as I turned all the lights off in that room. As I was leaving the room, I looked back at the last room's window, which illuminated the hallway, and out of nowhere, a massive black mass moved in front of the window, almost covering the light completely. It was darker than dark, and its outline covered the light and seemed to be moving. It was enough to scare me to run for my life. I ran the rest of the hallway and down the stairs. I was stopped by one of the ushers who told me not to run, but when I told him what I'd seen, he looked at me like I was crazy. Once church was over, I told my parents about what happened on the ride home. They ended up not believing me, but I know what I saw that day. And the man who was apparently dead had warned me of something for a reason. Either way, those two events still scare me to this very day. So my grandpa has this ranch about 25 miles east of Payson, Arizona. For those in Arizona, it's between Heigler Creek and the 260. It's very secluded, but the land is good for grazing. I spend a lot of time running Jersey cattle on the range. Every night, one of us rides out to check on the cattle in the field and to check the fence line for holes in the wire. A few days ago, I was riding out to check on the herd at about 1.30 in the morning, and I kept hearing this rustling in the tree line, running along the fence perimeter. I figured it was just coyotes or squirrels. I see a lot of them up there. It went away every 10 or 15 minutes, and then I heard it again. The second time I heard it, I was off my horse and walking him to a little water trough. The cows were about 150 to 200 yards away, just within my view, given the moonlight. I heard the rustling again, but this time it was heavy. My horse Vegas and I both looked up at the same time, wondering what in the hell we were hearing. At this point, I came to the eerie realization that whatever was out there was tracking Vegas and I, and it didn't seem so interested in the cows. In an attempt to scare it off, I got back on my horse and grabbed my whip and uncoiled it. Don't worry, I don't use it on animals. I only use it to make a loud noise to move the cattle along. I cracked it a few times. I figured that was safer than using my pistol. The rustling stopped and the forest was dead quiet once more. Not thinking much about it, I went back to count the head. 
I marked 38 heads. All the cows were there. So I started my way back to the house. I was about three and a half miles away, and it's a bit of a trail ride to get back. It was about 10 minutes of silence until I heard that rustling again. At this point, I was getting pissed. I figured it was some dumb little coyote thinking that we were going to lead him somewhere. So I called my grandpa on my radio. There's zero service out there, like none whatsoever. So radios are our only communication. I told him I was going to fire my gun so that he didn't get worried when he heard it. I reached down and pulled my revolver from my side and I fired one round into the air. The rustling stopped as the shot rang out through the woods and mountains. My ears rang and the smell of gunpowder filled my nose as the smoke settled. After I calmed Vegas down, I started riding back, only for the rustling to return five minutes later. I started getting really nervous at this point because usually coyotes run away when they get scared by a loud noise and they don't usually return that quickly. I didn't have a flashlight on me because I'm dumb and forgot. So I used the lame iPhone flashlight and dismounted. I slowly walked to the tree line where I had heard the rustling since I had my gun out, ready for an animal to jump at me or something. I flashed my light around through the clearing in the trees to my right, I heard rustling about a hundred feet away. I looked over and to my surprise and confusion, I saw a black silhouette of a horse running across the trail. I immediately thought, oh crap, is that one of our horses? Is that someone else's horse? So I got back on my horse and rode over to where I had seen it, shaking with anxiety. I looked around and was confused. I had no idea how that horse had even run into or out of the forest because it was so thick with shrubbery. And when I looked back behind me to start riding back, I stopped frozen in fear and got the chills. I dropped my gun and heard the sound of it hitting the ground because in front of me, about 50 feet away, was the silhouette of a man wearing a flat brimmed hat who appeared to have chaps on. I picked up my gun and aimed at the figure and it was gone. I got back on Vegas and rode like the wind to get out of there, constantly looking behind me in fear of it following. I made it back and told my grandpa. He tried to calm me down and that's when he told me that he had had some weird experiences too. Here are several odd encounters that I've had. Please tell me what you think they are or were and your thoughts on them. All of these occurrences have happened near the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. Not near Navajo land, of course, but I was hoping that I could be pointed toward the right information as to whether or not I encountered a skinwalker or if there's some kind of Eastern cryptid that is similar. Number one. As a child, I used to be really interested in the supernatural. I constantly read about werewolves and vampires, but not about other cryptids, such as skinwalkers and wendigos, until recently. I grew up on a farm surrounded by woods, and the first encounter I had with something unsettling would have been during a sleepover I had with two friends. After a riveting day running through the woods and having fun, we settled down for bed. It was a full moon and the light pierced through the blinds that I had. My two friends were sleeping on the bottom bunk while I slept on the top. They had fallen asleep, but I seemed not to be able to sleep. So I decided to peek through the blinds. The full moon stared at me and I looked away for a second. But when I looked back, there was a creature. The head was shaped similar to that of a horse with glowing red eyes and shaggy, thick, dark brown hair. It was about two feet lower down than I was, 
Right outside my window, I level with me. The window is about six feet off the ground. The bunk bed was also about six foot. So this creature must have been about nine feet tall. I don't know what it was, but it certainly scared me badly. Number two. My best friend C and my other best friend at the time K and I were all having a sleepover together outside in a tent. In our tent, we had one light, a small battery operated lantern. It was dark and quiet outside when all of a sudden a stick was hurled at our tent. My friend C felt that we were in danger, but didn't know from what. C had just moved from Arizona near the Navajo reservation and had recently experienced a skinwalker herself. We had no way to defend ourselves, so we decided to attempt to grab something that could be used as a defense from our car near the tent. C decided to be the one to go and grab it. As she went toward the car, she screamed. She immediately sprinted back with fear in her eyes. We asked her what happened and she told us about a large figure with glowing red eyes resembling a wolf. We ended up leaving that tent for good later on. Finally, number three. As an avid trail runner, I am used to the woods in which I run. I tend to run near dusk as the sun is setting, but I refuse to run when it's dark. I feel at home in the forest. I've never feared it, not until now. Only recently did I experience three odd phenomena. I began to feel like I was being watched while I ran. Yes, I know, the forest is always watching, with all of its animals watching what I'm doing, but this feeling is different. It's more of a fear-inducing feeling. Then about four days after this began, I saw these glowing orbs. Only a couple, but they led deeper and deeper into the woods. All of this led toward a place my father and I found when I was young, where a deer's rib cage was stuck in the hollow of a tree, almost as if it was put there purposely. There's also a big mound of rocks near it. Those rocks were not just randomly placed, they were formed, like a large rectangular shape similar to a grave. I haven't seen the orbs since, but it was unsettling. By far the most unsettling thing that has ever happened there would be the amount of times that I've felt something was following me or chasing me in the woods. I've even had this gut feeling that something was trying to lure me deeper into the woods. Whenever I feel that something is so off and that there are malicious intentions, I turn around and go back. The feeling of dread has only gotten stronger and I'm at a loss for what might be causing it. So this isn't anything too crazy, but I do have a little story about my childhood home. It was the summer of 2012. Life was good, and I was up at 2 a.m. watching Teen Nick in my house's den. The whole house was always fascinating to me. One of the first houses built in our small town in Kansas during the Prohibition as a moonshiner's illegal party house. The whole house is a colonial style full of Victorian features. From the outside, it looks like a two story, but there are actually three floors and a half a basement. The architecture was always confusing as to how this was accomplished, but wedged between the top and main floor is a log cabin themed room, our family room and den. It was a glorified bar room fitted with a monstrous fireplace an Alaskan moose head from about 1920, and a salvaged chandelier from the former Douglas Opera House. I always hated being in that room at night because I always got a weird sensation, like someone standing over me, when I would try to sleep on the couch after a long night of TV. My best friend and I also felt like this from time to time, sleeping in my own bed, which used to be the master suite. Never could get the cat or the dog to hang out in the den, though. Its door was an inch thick of solid wood, 
and had a very complex lock that remained tucked inside its latch, since no previous owners had the key. We never bothered to close it. It would get stuck in the frame because it was so heavy, designed to keep the police out if someone tipped off a booze party. There was a nursery on the top floor that shared a wall with this room. It was sold to us with no doorknob to the small 4x10 room. It became our home office. There was a brand new computer and an all-in-one printer and fax machine that remained unplugged, rarely used. My bedroom was right next to it and I always slept with my door open. In the middle of the night, I could often see the computer light up and paper would cycle through the printer. The unplugged printer. Could never get myself to check it out until the morning. Whenever I looked on the sheets, there was nothing on them and we would just load them back inside. It was my sister and I's favorite place to pirate scary movies. We would close the door so as not to disturb mom and dad since it didn't latch. But one night, she left me in the room to go get a snack. And when she came back, she couldn't open the door. I was trapped inside. My mom had to use a butter knife to force the handle. I was kind of shook given the timing. But back to the den. I'm minding my teen Nick business when out of the blue I get a call from my friend. She tells me that she's doing a Ouija board session, which I've always done my part to stay far away from. She says that her presence told her to call me. She informed me that I was wearing a black shirt, which I was and I only own one. I hung up the call and immediately went to my bedroom to wait out the next few hours to daylight. That same summer, my mom, grandma, sister, and I went on one of our late night drives where we would blast oldies cruising the back roads. As we were driving, an unidentifiable creature ran in front of our car and across the road. None of us agreed on what we saw. We thought that it was a very large white rabbit or cat or small dog. It was moving unthinkably fast for any of those animals though. It made it across the road in two hops. At the time, we joked about it and kept on our way. When we got home and stepped into the foyer, heavy work boots start down the upstairs hall and down the stairs. They stop at the den level. From the foyer, you can see the part of the staircase that leads to the den, and no one is there. We're all looking at each other, waiting for my father to continue his trip down the stairs. Then he comes up from the basement, followed by our dog. The cat is chilling in a window on the main floor. We sent him upstairs to investigate. He checked everywhere, even the attic, and there was nothing. Could all be a coincidence. When we moved into an apartment that fall, nothing else strange seemed to happen though. I'm tempted to ask the family who lives there now if they've ever experienced anything. The original owners are buried in the morgue just down the street. And sometimes I think they make a trip to their old home. I'm telling this story to maybe get some help in identifying what I saw, because I've been trying to figure it out for three years. I was a U.S. Marine from 2014 to 2019. I deployed to the Philippines to help out some joint operations. It was right after the siege of Marawi. Basically all we did was stare at the top of the jungle canopy looking for heat signals, and then communicating fire missions for artillery. We were about three months into the deployment, and like four hours into this mission, staring at absolutely nothing. We were over the mountains of Basilon, with really thick jungle canopy. Even with infrared, it's really hard to see anything out there. It was like trying to find needles in a haystack with Vaseline in your eyes. But when something's above the canopy, like a helicopter, birds, or monkeys in the trees, it pops up, and you can really get some good definition depending on how good the camera operator is, and atmospherics, of course. 
I was the camera guy and I was just chilling, staring into the void while my pilot burned circles into the sky for hours. I asked my officer in charge of the flight if I could go smoke while the pilot took over the camera after I locked on to a geopoint to keep the camera from going all over the place, and he said yes. So I go smoke, and not a minute later, I hear the guy inside flying go, uh, hey dude, you should get back in here and look at this. So I go back inside all pissed off because I hadn't got to finish my cigarette. But then I see what my pilot had locked the camera onto. I hopped back into my seat and I took back control. I was like, all right, is it cows or ISIS? But it's none of those things. It's just flying above the canopy at a pretty good clip, flapping and gliding on what I can only assume are very large pointed wings. At this point, it's just a very dark shape moving over the canopy until I clean up the infrared image and start to pick out more. At first I'm like, dude, it's just a really big bird. But then I see like a rounded head at the front and a small space in between what I assumed was the tail, making me think it had some kind of legs. The detail wasn't amazing, but you could make out general shapes. If I have a good day for atmospherics and light and altitude, I can tell an RPG from an AK-47 if I'm lucky that kind of detail. Then my smart college educated officer is like, check the measuring tool. It looks kind of big. We have a tool that uses geodata altitude and the aircraft's position, allowing you to use the laser and the program to let you know how far a distance is between two points. We mostly use it to measure buildings and artillery shot distances. But given what we had in the height of the canopy, I didn't see why it wouldn't work for this too. So I take a screen cap of my cam and I send it to my pilot to work on while I'm still on lock. He does the math and he comes up with a roughly six foot length and a 17 foot wingspan. As I watched it fly, I just kept thinking, that looks like a bat. Just the way that it flapped and moved and the general shape. It wasn't a bird, and its wings definitely came out at like an angle and stretched, you know, just like a bat. But there's no bat that big. The crew and I talked about it, passed it up to hire, but eventually we had to actually go do our jobs instead of become amateur zoologists. But after that flight, I just couldn't shake that feeling or place what it was. The other thing was that right next to our smoke pit, when we're not flying the drones, there's this thing that's absolutely filled with fruit bats, and it glows in infrared. This thing didn't. So my pilot and I got curious and we started asking the local people and contractors who worked at the chow hall and at the PX. A bunch of them laughed and told us that it was because we stay up too late and we work too long on night shift. But a couple of the older ones told us about an aswang or a tik tik. Sometimes people call it a mananangal. Apparently it's this big old flying thing that eats babies. But in an effort to disprove giant baby eating women man bats, can somebody please tell me what I saw? Because I would much rather my spicy PTSD just be regular PTSD. It was the year 1995, and I was a 20-year-old woman. I worked as a dining room manager at a popular breakfast restaurant. All of the employees would meet once a week at a local bar to hang out. I had to use my older sister's ID because I had just turned 20. I was excited this particular night because the manager that I had a huge crush on was coming. That night, I had decided not to drink too much and that would probably be the main factor in my survival. The guy that I had a crush on chose not to drink either. When closing time came, we all decided to go over to another co-worker's house because we were still having fun. 
As I was leaving to get in my car, the guy that I had a crush on asked me if I wanted to ride with him. He said that he would bring me back to get my car in the morning. I happily agreed, and I jumped in the car. As we were pulling out, he decided to do a huge burnout to show off. We got about two miles down the road when we saw police lights behind us. He pulls over and the police officer makes him do the whole, are you drunk dance. He wasn't drunk, but the police officer searched him and found a single pill that was not in its prescribed bottle. They decided to arrest him and take his car. I had told them that I was only 20, but they didn't seem to care. They told me to walk to the gas station and call somebody to pick me up. This gas station was the only place open being that it was the middle of the night. I didn't want to wake my family up, so I decided to walk the two miles back to get my car. I was afraid though, because I was aware that there was nothing open in between that gas station and the bar parking lot that my car was in. I started walking, keeping my eyes open for anything creepy. It wasn't too long before the typical abductor's vehicle pulled up. It was a big, black, windowless van. I was walking northbound, which made the passenger side closest to me. A man who was about 30 asked me if I needed a ride. I, of course, said no and continued on. He continued to ask a few more times, but he realized that I was not budging. I had that gut feeling you get when you know that something is just wrong. He just continues driving at my walking pace. He's looking around nervously. I had no doubt that he was trying to figure out how to get me. I was thinking of what I would do if he tried. I decided that if his car stopped, I was going to run to the other side of the road back towards the gas station. At this point, I was about halfway back to my car. After keeping at my pace for a while, he drove off. For a minute, I thought he had given up, but he just went down a little bit and then turned around and drove past me. I watched him turn around again and head back toward me. He pulls up to me again and asks me to get in. I said, no, I don't need a ride. He just drove at my pace again. He would pull off every time another car drove by, but would come back after. Then, as we were getting close to where my car was, I was trying to decide how I could get to my car safely. The bar was in the corner of an L-shaped small shopping strip. There were about five stores on each side of the bar, with the bar being in the corner. My car was right in front of the bar, which was pretty far back from the street that I was walking on. He pulled off again, but this time, he pulled a little past the area that my car was in and parked turning his lights off. If I had to keep walking straight, it would have been hard for me to get by where he was parked. I decided to count to three and run toward my car with everything I had. I had my keys in hand, pushing the unlock button as I ran. I kept my eye on what he was doing as well. He pulled toward me, slowly, but I think he was wondering what in the world I was doing running into a closed, dark parking lot. As I reached my car and jumped in, he pulled right in front of it. As I was locking the door, we made eye contact. He looked shocked that I had a car. I backed out and took off. I watched behind me, making sure that he wasn't following me. After I got home, I debated on calling the cops, but I thought nothing would come of it, so, regrettably, I didn't. It was about a year later, while watching the news, that I saw him and his van again. He had kidnapped and murdered a young woman. They actually believe he killed more than just her, though. I was devastated. I'm not sure if I had called the police if anything would have changed, but at least it would have been on record. I learned that people looking for victims will often drive around to bars at closing time, hoping to find a drunk woman walking home alone. I really do believe that not drinking that night saved my life.
East Tennessee is known for its ghost stories and storytelling in general, as is common in Appalachian culture. The Cherokee felt connected to the region spiritually, and the Europeans that replaced them have too. Just look up the legend of the Wampus Cat sometime. Here's my own set of stories, all in relation to Johnson City, as I am originally from that area. In college, before any of my friend group could drink, we got wild hairs and decided to go ghost bustin', as we called it. This usually involved us loading up into a vehicle and cruising through the hollows and hills of East Tennessee. We had done our research, be it on the internet or in local ghost story books, and found quite a few places to explore. The first of which I'll mention is the Exit 27 ramp off of I-26 near Irwin. Legend has it that a group of high schoolers were killed by a driver while coming off the ramp one night, many decades ago, after prom. Now their spirits watch the ramp, pushing vehicles back up the ramp and away from the bisecting road. I can personally attest to this experience. If you go at night, and there usually isn't any other traffic, you can stop your car on the bottom of the ramp and put it in neutral. Doing so will make your car roll back up the ramp. The second place is also near Irwin. It's called Bumpus Cove. From what I can remember, there were several stories about this place, including a Confederate cemetery with ghosts. We could never find it, and the GPS kept taking us to a house. Those poor people. We did, however, find a family cemetery with a paved road around it. Legend had it that if you drove around this cemetery on a full moon three times, a ghost jeep would chase you down the mountain. This cemetery was very isolated and near the Cherokee National Forest. I don't think we ever managed to do this on a full moon. We still got scared, though. Since the cemetery sat on a hill, we would see illuminated crosses poking up around the graves. Under a night sky, it's pretty horrifying, even if it's not overtly paranormal. The third story I will share is of the Job Cemetery in downtown Irwin. The cemetery is located in town, but sinks down into a creek and heavily forested area. I believe at the back end there's a large, or once was a large, railroad yard. Well, legend has it that the ghost of a murderous homeless person, who apparently was killed in a brawl in Irwin, haunts the cemetery. We explored the cemetery numerous times, but never saw much once again. It was very creepy and unsettling to go back down into the back of the cemetery, so close yet so far away from the living world. Another story we found was about an abandoned old house called Gwendolyn's House, which sits off Bristol Highway between Piney Flats and Elizabethan. This house was allegedly haunted and tales of it can be found, or could be found when we looked years ago, on topics. I don't really know the backstory, but we went to it on several occasions and got scared out of our minds. The house sat on a one-lane road, possibly called Kuntz Road or something, and was literally falling in. Two people in our group were brave enough to check it out, but another guy and I stayed in the car. The one in the car with me was a friend who boasted about believing in ration and logic and obviously didn't believe in ghosts. Well, he ended up having a panic attack in the car and swore he was seeing an old lady in the upper story window, rocking in a chair, looking and pointing right at him. I think the most infamous ghost story of East Tennessee is the Sensabaugh Tunnel, which last I checked was closed off to the public. Much information can be found about this online, and people can tell it better than me, so it's worth reading the backstory. The tunnel is haunted by the ghost of a person who abducted and drowned a child in the creek running through the tunnel about a hundred years ago. You can hear a baby cry in the tunnel, which we believe strongly we did on numerous occasions. An omen for death, at least in those parts, is a black dog. There was also a legend that we came across of a black dog roaming the highways. Well, one night after visiting the tunnel, we were driving out of the old back road that the tunnel was on, and I almost hit a black dog. This was a narrow, one-lane road, and it sat near the Holston River. 
The mist was up, and I couldn't see the dog until the last second. Luckily, it didn't get hit. It must have jumped out of the way at the last moment, or simply disappeared into thin air. But either way, East Tennessee is creepy. My wife and I seemed to have a simultaneous glitch a couple of years ago at a hotel in Canada. It's not the most significant or interesting glitch, I guess, but we've never experienced such a thing before or since. We were spending the night at a random hotel in Toronto on an overnight layover before flying to Mexico the next day. We are not from Canada and I had never been to Toronto before. My wife had, but as a teenager, and only on a brief trip. When we walked into the lobby to check in, there was a small line of people waiting at the desk. We got in line behind a middle-aged couple who looked like maybe they were there for a wedding or a party. They immediately turned around and smiled at us as if we were all old friends. The wife of the partner said, Hey, so are you girls heading back to Winnipeg in the morning? My wife and I faltered for a moment. She was obviously talking to us and not anybody else, but we had no idea why. We had never met this couple before, let alone engaged in any kind of conversation with them. We had just gotten to the hotel. Plus, neither of us have ever been to Winnipeg. Uh, no. I replied uncomfortably. The woman looked confused and just said, Oh. She was called up by one of the attendants and we got the other, so there was no way to talk any further. My wife and I just kind of looked at each other and laughed, like how weird. We got our room keys and went over to the elevator. It was a large chain hotel and our room was on one of the higher up floors. The elevator stopped before our floor, and when the doors slid open, there were about four to five guys there, late 30s, maybe early 40s, holding beers. They saw us and acted pleasantly surprised. They all did the, hey, kind of surprised cheer, as if they hadn't expected to run into us. My wife and I just figured they were having some fun. But then they started talking to us as if they knew us too. Ah, we're having a party in Dan's room, one of the guys said. Again, my wife and I were unsure if they were actually speaking to us, but there was no one else in the elevator that they would be talking to, so they were. I said, oh, okay. Another guy said, you girls headed up to bed? My wife and I gave each other the side eye uh, yep, she said. Yeah, I'm pretty tired too. It's been a long day. The door slid open at what I was guessing was Dan's floor. Well, we'll all be down here in Dan's room if you change your minds. The guys got off the elevator, and when the doors closed, my wife and I started cracking up. What in the world was going on? Why did all these people seem to think they knew us? We made it to our room and got ready for bed. It was chilly, so I slept in my socks, which I almost never do. I fell asleep right away and I slept like a rock as we had already had a long first day of travel to make it to Toronto. When we woke up the next morning, I got out of bed and immediately noticed another weird thing. I was still wearing socks, but they weren't the socks I had worn to bed the night before. In fact, they weren't my socks at all. I was immediately grossed out, but my wife and I had a good laugh about it. I mean, how in the world did that happen? I've never been a sleepwalker, not once in my life. So weird. Since we had a flight to catch, we grabbed our stuff and made our way down to the lobby to check out. It was busy and there was another line at the desk. We stood behind this woman who had two suitcases. She was standing with her body half turned toward us, so she saw us coming. 
She looked up from her phone when we got in line and then went back to minding her own business as we were. Then after a minute, she looked up directly at us and said, did Bob go to get the car or something? What in the world? Again, we had never laid eyes on this woman before this moment. We had no idea who she was and we certainly didn't know Bob. I have no idea, I said finally. Like the others, she seemed confused by my confusion. It's been a couple of years since this incident at the hotel, but my wife and I still laugh about it from time to time. That hotel was just full of people who were so sure that they knew us, but that's impossible. Our theory is that maybe there was an event at the hotel with guests who looked like us, but I mean, what are the odds of that? and that still wouldn't explain what happened to my socks. To this day, it's still the strangest thing that has ever happened to us. I've had a long history of paranormal things happening to me but these take the cake. I lived in the middle of Hicktown swamps in Georgia when these took place. When I was 13, I ran away from home for personal reasons. I booked it to a local nature trail in the middle of a wildlife reserve. I ran down it about 15 minutes and a hand reached out from the bush to my right and hit me in the chest. I got back up and looked for my attacker, but there was nothing there. I proceeded to run home, crying like a real man. When I was 15, I was laying in bed, scrolling through creepypasta articles, when I hear a sort of rhythmic tapping on my window. I freak out and pretend I can't hear it for a while until I can't stand it anymore. I pull the curtain back. It's only a raccoon. I hit the window and scare him off and try to calm myself down. About a half an hour later, the same tapping, the same rhythmic pattern. Kinda like click, click, scratch, click, click, scratch. So I decide I'm gonna get my BB gun and take it out on the raccoon, scare him, you know, so he won't come back. So I grab my BB gun, I open the window, I take aim, and there's this shadowy figure that resembles a man staring right at me, right on the border of my lawn that connects my yard to the huge expanse of woods around my house. And it just stares at me and slowly walks into the woods behind it. After that, I didn't sleep for about a week. In fall of last year, on a walk down the nature trail with two of my friends, Antoine and Justin, we were just cracking jokes and drinking. It was 4 a.m. and we were just having a great time. On the walk back home, I feel this awful presence. I look behind me and I see something at the end of the trail in the distance. My vision isn't the best, but from what I could tell, it looked like a man with a deer head as his own. So I looked away. I told my friends not to say a word until we got home. Justin knew of my past occurrences and he doesn't really mess around with paranormal stuff. So he listened and just kept walking. But Antoine just looked at me for like 15 minutes while walking perfectly straight. I freaked out and started doing the strangest movements of my arms to see if he would mimic them. And every time he would. At one point, I locked both my arms and put them on my head. And he did the exact same thing. I was ready to just leave him in the woods that night, honestly. Eventually, he screamed something completely unintelligible, and it scared the crap out of me, so I threw a punch at him and he dodged it. I apologized, told him to shut up, and then told them all to run home with me. When we got there, we discussed what we had seen and what happened, and Antoine said that he completely blacked out as soon as we started walking the nature trail, only to wake up to me throwing a punch at him. About two months ago, another thing happened, and this was where I drew the line. I've moved since this incident, and I honestly don't plan on ever going back. 
I was walking down the nature trail again. Clearly, I hadn't learned my lesson. I was listening to music, having a good time, and this thick, permeable smell of blood hit my nose. I genuinely thought I had a nosebleed for a second, until, through my headphones, I hear somebody talking. I take off one of my headphones and have a look around. Nothing. Speed walking out of there, it happens again. And this time, it sounds exactly like a man screaming, Warbringer. Instantly, I'm on the verge of tears. I jerk back and look around as fast as possible. And I see it. There's a fully naked man, resembling more of a corpse than a man, with a bleeding, rotting horse's head. His arm was extended out toward me. I ran home and packed my things. Now by this point, I have so many theories as to what happened, but I hate indulging them. They all scare the hell out of me. My current idea is that I'm just nuts. I'm not sure, but whatever the case is, if there's anyone here who can explain what I saw, I'm very open to it. I was hiking a section of the North Umpqua Trail in the northern part of Southern Oregon a few years back with my sister-in-law. It's a 72-mile trail, broken into sections that can be easily hiked in a day. At the time, I lived about midway up the trail, fairly remote, in a small community. It was mid-fall this one day when we set out. The trail was running along the south side of the North Umqua River, and was pretty up and down in the beginning. We made it to a fairly flat section that was running just above the river. There was this beautiful view of the river through the trees, so we stopped to get some pictures and take a water break. I immediately felt extremely uncomfortable, like somebody was watching us. I slowly turned my head to look behind us, across the trail, and up. At the top of this very small incline, I could see a small meadow through the trees. Across the meadow, maybe 15 yards from us, was a tent an old canvas-style tent. As I'm looking, I notice bones strung from the trees all around the meadow, like creepy death wind chimes. My stomach just clenched and dropped. I leaned into my sister-in-law and whispered, do not, not turn around and look behind us. Just continue walking up the trail and run when I tell you. We were close enough to the river that nobody who wasn't immediately next to us could have heard this. She did exactly as I told her to do, setting off at the brisk walk we'd been at before. We got maybe ten yards, and I could hear footsteps through the forest floor, coming from behind and slightly above us. That part of the forest is very dense. There's thick moss cover under the trees, so footsteps on it make a very specific sound. I leaned forward and told her to pick up her speed. She did. I did. And so did whoever was behind us. I leaned forward again and told her to run as fast as she could and not to stop until I told her so. For two middle-aged women, both slightly overweight, we ran like the wind. I just kept telling her, go, go, go. I could see ahead of us that the trail had an incline and then veered to the right along the river and around a cliff. I knew at that point that whoever it was was going to have to come down onto the trail or stop. We kept running. We probably ran at least a mile after that, even though we could no longer hear anybody behind or above us. That section of the trail was about nine miles, and we weren't halfway when this happened. We eventually slowed down, but just hurried as fast as we could the rest of the way. We had arranged for her younger brother to pick us up. We made it to the next trailhead fairly early, so we made our way out to 138 and started walking east toward home, knowing that he would find us. He did, and was shocked at our story. We got home and immediately called our local sheriff, 
who lived just above us at the ranger station. He came to the house and heard our story. He explained that it might be a day or two before they could get on the trail as they had a missing hunter at the time that they were searching for. So a few days go by and he shows up at our house to let me know that we weren't crazy or imagining things and that somebody really did chase us. I asked what they found and who it was. He looked at the floor and then looked up and said, I'm not going to tell you what we found or who it was because if I do, you'll never hike anywhere ever again. What we found was not normal and it won't happen up here again. He then instructed me to never, ever hike unarmed again. I never found out what they found or who it was. I never hiked that section of trail again and it completely burned last year. I also never hike unarmed, ever. That was huge for me because I wasn't really a gun person at the time. But I am a living person and I'd like to stay that way, so I took his advice. I had many incidents living up there in the national forest with wild animals and other strange things, but nothing ever scared me as much as another human did that day. Let me start off by saying that this is a true story that happened to me when I was about 13, and I'm 27 now. Whether you believe it or not is up to you. My dad used to be a part of a small hunting club in Alabama, just a handful of guys he grew up with. Once a year, we would drive to the small town of Elba to camp for a few days and go hunting. There were a few different areas of land around the town that the club owned and club members could go hunting there. One of these pieces of land was nicknamed the cemetery because, well, it had an old cemetery on it. Nothing really creepy about the cemetery. It was in the woods and the graves were of a slave owner and the graves of his slaves. Now, in this area of land nicknamed the cemetery, there are five or six green fields, basically a cleared out area where there are no trees, just grass and a buck hut to hunt in. A buck hut is like a tree house that you sit in to wait for deer to walk out onto the green field. This particular evening, we were going to hunt on Greenfield One, the plot directly behind the old cemetery. The evening started off normal enough. My dad parked the truck and we walked down the trail to the buck hut. We climbed up and started to wait and watch the woods. A little bit of time passes, and my dad tells me that he's going to go for a short walk to see if maybe he can see any deer on the trail. Keep in mind, I'm about 13 years old. Not a big deal. I've hunted by myself before, and I'm not afraid of being alone in the woods. Besides, it was pretty light out. I said, okay, and he climbed down. It was just me, my 32 caliber Marlin rifle, the grass field in front of me, and the dense woods around me. This is where things started to get strange. I sat there for an eternity, or what felt like an eternity, and it was now almost twilight. My concern for my dad was growing because he was still not back yet. I was worried that maybe something had happened to him or he had gotten lost but he's an experienced hunter, and if he was lost, he would yell or fire off a shot, but the woods had been dead silent. I figured maybe he found a good spot that he wanted to hunt the twilight and dusk hour of the day in, because that's prime time for hunting. So I focused my attention on the grass field in front of me, just watching, listening, and waiting for a deer to walk out on the field as the light of day began to fade. Just then, across the field, I saw and heard some brush moving and breaking. The thought did cross my mind that it could be my dad, but I highly doubted it. No way it could be him. That would be incredibly dangerous and stupid. I raised up my rifle, 
pulled back the hammer, aimed it at the moving brush, and patiently waited for what I hoped was a deer to walk out. Then, a girl floated out of the woods and onto the grassy field. She was transparent white with a long flowing dress and long white hair. She floated from one side of the field to the other and then disappeared back into the woods. I watched her for a solid minute or two. I couldn't believe my eyes and I was petrified. Now I wanted my dad back. A short time passed and now it's pitch dark and I'm still alone. My concern for my dad was turning into panic, but I was too afraid to yell or go look for him in the pitch dark woods where I had just seen a ghost. I sat there for hours, terrified and alone in the darkness. Thankfully, he finally returned. He acted like he hadn't been gone at all. I asked him where the heck he'd gone, and he said he just went for a short walk up the trail, turned around and came back. The timeline made no sense. He was gone for hours. It was unlike him to leave me alone for that long. But he was adamant that he had only been gone for 15 to 30 minutes. We walked down the trail back to his truck, I couldn't get out of there fast enough. The whole experience still confuses me to this day. Was the ghost I saw an old slave or slave owner buried in the woods behind me? Something else entirely? Did my dad go through some time warp where time sped up? I don't know. I never went hunting there again though, and I don't plan on ever going back. My mother married an older man about nine years ago, whose previous wife had died from cancer several years beforehand. We moved into his home, and I was about 13 years old at the time. I had always felt an odd feeling in this home, as my room was in the basement. Nothing out of the ordinary happened here, besides the odd being watched feeling that I would always experience in that home. My mom had hired my biological father, who I'm close to, to remodel the downstairs bathroom in my stepdad's home. My dad told me he had several of his tools moved around while he was alone working at the place. My dad finished the job and never returned. Fast forward to when my stepdad, mom, and I moved to Washington State. He and my mother began to have a lot of issues and were arguing frequently. I won't go into it, but I came to learn that my stepfather had a certain type of addiction that led him to having many women in our home that were not his wife, many of whom were professionals in this trade and were younger than his own 30-year-old children. I found this very concerning for a number of reasons, and there are some other details that, like I said, I won't go into, but let's just say it was evident that this guy had some very serious issues. He really gave me the creeps. I told my mother, and she was dismissive of it, but she gave off the vibe that I wasn't telling her anything she didn't already know. I wanted to get away from him and everything he was doing, and he bought a vacation home in western Arizona. I was 18 at the time, and I moved down there and I was living on my own. He had most of his items and furniture from his old home in this house that I was staying at alone in Arizona. A couple of weeks go by and I'm lying in my bed in my room. I heard footsteps that sounded like somebody wearing slippers scuffling along the tile floor in the living room. I was totally scared after that and I couldn't sleep. About a week after this, the hall bathroom shower was having problems so I used the master bathroom shower. I had an awful feeling that I was being watched in the master bath as well as the master bedroom and the closet. It was such a bad feeling that I no longer went into that bedroom and I was frightened to even be on that side of the house. When I was done showering, I was near running through the bathroom and bedroom, shutting the door behind me. 
The same week, I was playing computer games in the office, and the desk was facing the living room. I was sitting in my chair, and I just felt like I was being watched again. I felt something touch my right shoulder. I jumped and looked behind me, but nothing was there. I was pretty spooked, but I sat back down and continued with my game. Then, maybe an hour after feeling something touch my shoulder, while still playing my game, I suddenly heard a very loud slam near the side of the house where the master bedroom is. Maybe 10 to 15 seconds after the slam, I heard several knocks along the wall on the same side of the house. I was frozen in fear. I stood up at my desk and all I could do was let out a scream. I called my mother hysterical and explained to her what had happened. Two days later, she drove over a thousand miles to come get me and take me back home. When I returned home, I found out that she was divorcing my stepdad, sending him to live in the house in Arizona that I had just come from. After he was gone, I didn't experience much in my mom's house, beside that feeling of being watched. I opted to stay upstairs. It was a split-level home with the living room and kitchen upstairs and my bedroom downstairs. I was upstairs in the living room when my mom's dog stood at the top of the stairs, staring downward at the base of the stairs, growling, frozen still. Soon after that, my mother sold the house and I moved out of state, and I've never experienced anything like that since. I'm still wondering if there are any explanations as to what might have occurred. I believe this might have been paranormal, and I haven't experienced anything like this since, nor had I ever experienced anything until living in the same home that my mom's ex-husband lives in. I'm a sheriff's deputy in a fairly busy county. Along with the job comes the unfortunate familiarity with what a decomposing human body smells like. To me, it's very similar to an animal carcass, but with a much sweeter odor. Not sweet in the sense that I enjoy it, hell no. That smell normally means a bad night for me and another gruesome memory to add to my catalog of things I would rather forget. With that out of the way, I'll get to what happened. Last night, I was patrolling a geographically isolated area of the county, which is very large and sparsely populated. Having completed the hour-long trek to the northwestern county line, I began driving through the mountains back toward civilization. About 25 miles from town, or the closest semblance thereof, I hit a straight stretch of highway through a wide valley. Since the weather was nice, I had my windows rolled down. As I passed the entrance of an old logging road, that familiar smell of sweet rot suddenly filled my car. Not just a whiff, a cloud of it filled the cab as if there was a weak old human corpse sitting in the front seat next to me. It was all too familiar, but this time there was something else that I couldn't place. It lingered for a few moments then went away just as quickly as it had entered. Realizing what I had just smelled, my heart sank and I pulled to the side of the road. I told myself it was just a dead animal in the ditch and that my mind was playing tricks on me. I turned my car around and drove slowly back toward the logging road. The closer I got to it, the smell became stronger and I grew more certain that I was about to find a body. Holding on to a shred of hope that I was wrong, I parked my unit on the side of the highway just before the dirt road. I radioed to dispatch, told them my location and that I would be out of my unit for a moment. I didn't say why to avoid an awkward disregard on a possible body on the side of the road. I shined my flashlight into the ditch and into the encroaching briars and weeds as I walked closer to where I believed the source of the smell was. Once I was a few yards away from the dirt road, I saw the opening of a concrete culvert going under the highway. At this point, 
the smell was nearly as strong as it had been when I first passed. The opening of the culvert was about three feet in diameter, just large enough to hide a body inside. I cursed and held my breath as I leaned over and shined my light inside. An empty tunnel stretched the width of the highway. Somewhat relieved, I stood and looked around. It smelled as if I was standing on top of whatever was emitting the odor. I searched around the brush for a moment, but found nothing. Thinking the origin might be on the opposite side of the highway, I crossed to the other ditch to continue searching. As I walked away from the other side of the road, the smell grew faint. I stopped at the opposite end of the culvert and peeked inside, just to double check. The odor was nearly gone at this point. I stood up and checked my surroundings when I heard a crack in the brush behind me and the smell engulfed me even stronger than before. Thinking for a moment that the wind must have shifted, I froze when I realized the air was dead still. Whether it was fear or something else, a shiver went down my spine. In the distance, I saw headlights coming down the highway. As the car came near, the odor seemed to move away, farther into the bushes toward where I had heard the crack. The car stopped, and the passenger rolled down the window and asked if I was all right. I lied and told him that I was. I thanked him for checking, and I walked briskly to my car as they drove away. I got the hell out of there. Once I was able to get cell service, I called my friend who was patrolling the opposite side of the county. I explained what had happened, trying not to let on that I was spooked. Once I was done, he paused for a moment, then asked about the unusual hint of something which accompanied the smell. He asked if it was sulfur, and I put two and two together. It was sulfur that I had smelled. I asked if he thought I had found a demon in the middle of nowhere, to which he responded with a concerned, yes. This guy is the son of a missionary and has been all around the world. He has seen, rather smelled, this before and told me that it was a very concerning experience. This spooked me even more because his responses were very out of character for him. Maybe something else happened. Maybe there's some shred of a possibility that there's a scientific explanation. But honestly, I think I agree with my friend. I think there's a demon in the valley. I always wanted to share this story, but I've never done it before, so here goes. This is a story from long ago, before crawlers were a thing that people talked about that much, before the internet exploded, and that annoying modem sound came on if you were lucky enough to have a computer and an internet connection. It was around 1999, and I was living in very rural upstate New York. If you don't know, or you've never been to the area of the Catskill Mountains, it's small town after small town, surrounded by forest and farmlands, not much to do back then, but hang out with your friends and drive around. At least, that's what I did with my friends, besides the weekly house party. My best friend and I were very into the paranormal back then, and we both experienced many unexplained things our entire lives. Being in our late teens, young adulthood, we just decided we were curious, and at the time, we also both identified as Wiccan. We spent a lot of time in those woods, we would meditate, do earthy spells, have lunch, and camp out. So, needless to say, we were not afraid of the woods, the dark, or being completely isolated in the middle of nowhere. One night, on one of our late winter drives to nowhere, we ended up on a road that we hadn't really been on before. We pulled off on the side to where this old schoolhouse was. We parked the car, got out and looked in the windows to check it out and see what was inside. It appeared to be kept up as a historical site. There were old desks inside and old chalkboards, things like that. 
It was really neat, but we did have that creepy feeling that you get at places where the veil is thin. So, of course, we returned there several times after. We were just drawn to the place. A few times, we went during the day with some other girlfriends to check it out. As we took a walk in the woods behind the schoolhouse, we all felt this odd feeling. The only way we could really describe it was like what I've heard of as walking through a fairy circle. The ambient lighting around us felt different. I can't really describe it other than almost more of a vivid color experience around us as the sun came through the trees. We didn't think we were there all that long, maybe an hour, but when we returned to the car, it had been several hours and it was early evening, maybe around 5 or 6 p.m., and we'd gotten there at noon. One of my best friends and I went at night again. We were sitting in the car, just talking, drinking our gas station bought cappuccino purchased for our night drive, and we kept hearing this tap, tap, tap sound. Out loud, I said, knock it off to the nothing that was there. Right as I say this, we hear what we could only describe as children's feet running away from behind to the side of the car. That little pitter-patter that only kids can make. It freaked us both out and we got the heck out of there. There was no way that anyone was there. Like I said, this was a rural main road to a dirt road pull-off. Completely pitch black. No street lights. No cars going by in the distance or anything. If someone did show up, they would have been walking in the dark for miles to get there. And it certainly wouldn't be a child. It's kind of sad when I think about it now. I certainly hope it wasn't a roaming spirit of a child, gone too soon from this place. Anyway, that's where the freakiest part happens. And we never did return to that old school after this. As we're getting back onto the main road, there in the headlights, we saw something scurry across the road quickly. It looked like a hairless, naked human, crawling low to the ground, its elbows bent so high that its belly was close to the road, like a grasshopper, and its knees looked like they were bent backwards. I remember us both turning to look at each other with that panicked look on our faces. We then said, what the heck was that? Did you just see that? What the heck was that? We drove home kind of trembling and not saying a whole lot. I remember I kept looking in the rear view mirror, half expecting to see this thing chasing us down the road. Luckily, we did not. My friends and I are still best friends to this day, and we sometimes talk about this series of events. Years later, we saw the movie The Descent, and it immediately made us both think of that old schoolhouse and the thing that we saw run across the road that night. It was a freaky place, experience and time. Also exciting and slightly terrifying. I now live across the country, far away from New York, but I often wonder about that old schoolhouse and those woods. Someday, I think I would like to return now that I'm older and in a different place in my life. I would like to see if it's still there, and just see how I feel about all of it now. But I would never, ever want to see that thing that we saw so many years ago. For my lady's birthday, I took her to Gatlinburg, a popular, touristy, one main boardwalk town in the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee. We camped the first night, a few miles out in the woods at a popular location, Elkmet Campground. The campground was beautiful, tall green trees like baby redwoods, a clear water river scattered by checkered rocks, families with little ones running around. It was great. Through borrowing a tent, we found that we had no steaks and headed into town for supplies, whiskey, and hot dogs. It was dusk by the time we made it back to the campground. 
Most campers were surrounding their dissipating fires or cleaning up before the quickly coming night. Our tent was still up, but crunched up a little without the stakes allowing it to spread open as widely as it could. We fixed our tent and started a fire. As our night progressed, we found ourselves surrounding our campfire two to three hours later around midnight. Now, this was the sort of campground where another campsite is just 30 yards from yours. Bears frequent the area, and my girlfriend was already freaking out a little bit, which is why I booked our site in the dead center of the whole campground. All the other campers had gone to bed at this point, and the only sound we could hear was the slowly crackling fire and the light stream of the river flowing into the rocks. The clouds were covering a crescent moon, so there wasn't much light to begin with. We had flashlights, and I would occasionally shine the light around us while avoiding hitting the other campers to confirm that we were fine and that there were no bears. Seemingly out of nowhere, from the campsite behind my girlfriend and to my left, a light shined directly on us and then all around in a frantic yet focused manner, kind of like the Eye of Sauron. I saw what appeared to be a man with the strangest gait I've ever seen. He wore a headlight and was focused on his picnic table. The man's gait seemed to me to be a little bit like Jar Jar Binks, just not normal. I could see through my periphery that the man focused his light on the picnic table, and whenever I turned my head toward him, immediately his light would hit my girlfriend and I. I could only see the outline of the man through the light of his headlight and the occasional flash of my light at his campsite once he continued to flash his light at ours in a very disconcerting way. This was the campsite across from us, where we saw no one at all the night prior. I could only see the outline of his body as all black, as if he was in an all black bodysuit. His movements were eerily repetitious. For what went on to close to an hour, this man would shine his headlight on his picnic table, make limited motions with his hands, if any at all, then walk five steps back to his tent, shine his headlight at his tent, then walk back to the picnic table, shine his light at us, and repeat it all over again. If this was just the man looking for something, he was on a cocktail of drugs. Once his light was on us for too long for comfort, I shined my flashlight on him for an extended period of time. It was at this moment when I went from annoyed to fight or flight. A chill ran down my back as I saw the outline of the man disappear in front of me and the light from his headlight bounce down to the ground, then fly across the ground from his campsite. It seemed to jump along the ground and into the bushes diagonally from both of our campsites. It wasn't like the headlight had been thrown, but as if it ran across the ground like if it was on the head of a dog. I took my flashlight away and watched his light slowly come back out of the bushes and climb back up to the height of a person. The shadow figure returned back, walking out of the bushes and back to the campsite to continue the same odd behavior. There were no sounds at all coming from this figure throughout the entirety of the night. Sometime later, we went into the tent for shut-eye, and the shadow man figure was still at his odd routine. The following day, the tent from the shadow man's campsite was gone, like no one had ever been there. I then found out that just a mile from our campsite was a small town called Elkmont Ghost Town, with abandoned buildings and a cemetery up a trail a bit. I couldn't find any other stories of Elkmont mysteries, but I wouldn't be surprised if there are other stories involving the Headlight Man. While kayaking on Green River, traveling above Mammoth Cave in Kentucky, these friends would encounter a sound they had never heard before, and one they hoped to never hear again. Here's their story. A few years ago, my friends and I went on a 45-mile, three-night kayaking trip down the Green River in Kentucky, which runs above the Mammoth Cave System, the world's longest known cave system, with more than 400 miles of surveyed passageways. 
We brought everything we needed in our kayaks and one canoe. Food, tents, water filtration, etc. And camped each night on the riverbank when it started getting dark. And we found level enough ground most of the time. The first night was uneventful, except to say that there is nothing like a wall of fireflies against a mountainous black tree line at night in the middle of nowhere. Beautiful. The second day around sunset, after a long day of kayaking and baking in the July heat, we came upon a stream on the bank that opened up into a large ravine. The stream, as we found out, was a cave spring, pouring out blue, freezing cold cave water into a lagoon about 30 feet wide and so deep that the blue water turned black after a few feet. The lagoon had a long, sandy beach, secluded by hills on either side, and a tall, overhanging cliff behind and above us. It was a beautiful, otherworldly place. Time moved very slowly there. We decided to camp there for the night. The sand was soft, white, and very fine, ideal for ground sleeping. For some reason, the place deeply frightened me, but I didn't speak up. We were all tired and everyone was having fun. We built a small fire and enjoyed the stars through the leaf canopy for a while before everybody went to bed. I slept hard that night. At around 5 a.m., I woke up with an urge to relieve myself. It was still dark. I had the tent door zipper about halfway opened and had just popped my head out when I heard a loud and terrible roar or scream. I immediately cowered back into the tent and zipped it closed, and I waited. The scream came from about 10 feet to my left, near the dwindling fire. It was high-pitched, not like an owl's screech, although I'm not ruling that out. It was a wretched, pained scream that got lower pitched toward the end. Being that we were in the middle of nowhere, Kentucky, most likely it was a fox or a boar or some kind of bird. Whatever it was, I lay awake for an hour, listening. I heard absolutely nothing. Granted, we were on a soft beach, but I didn't hear a single twig snap or leaf crinkle when whatever it was finally shuffled away. It was bizarre. I should mention at this time that up the beach and off to the side of the lagoon was a small, dry cave opening, maybe three feet wide. I cannot say with any certainty that it was not some ancient cave-dwelling creature that surfaced to investigate our camp. I somehow fell back asleep and awoke the next morning shaken. I asked if any of my friends had heard the terrible scream, but remarkably, nobody had. We pressed on down the Green River. The third night, at dusk, we came upon a large rocky beach. We pulled our boats ashore and decided that this would have to do, as we didn't want to go any farther downriver and risk being stuck on the water at dark. This rocky beach was where the river split in two, and, in the middle, formed a collection of pale rocks, tall grass and dried out wood, a desolate pile of muck the size of a football field. The landmass was covered in jumping sand spiders and tiny frogs. Again, otherworldly. We set up camp, ate, and all went to bed around the same time. It was silent for probably 20 or 30 minutes, I'm not sure. I was asleep, as the others most likely were as well. Suddenly, my dream was interrupted by what sounded like a booming, loud, mechanical, wooden beast. I awoke and shot straight up. It was truly the loudest thing I have ever heard. It sounded like a massive bulldozer tearing down a huge steel and wood building. Then came a boom, followed by its echo throughout the river valley. The animals shifted and the birds flew away. We were all awoken by the crash and yelling in confusion to each other in our tents. Nothing but silence followed outside our tents, 
and nobody was particularly willing to shine a flashlight toward the woods. Eventually, we all decided it had to have been a falling tree, and we went back to sleep. The next morning, I thought about it some more. It didn't sound like just a falling tree. I must stress that it had a metallic quality, and it was projected purposefully. It almost sounded like a roar. In the morning light, we found no evidence of anything out of the ordinary, nor any obvious fallen trees that could have made such a loud sound. So we packed up and headed out onto the river one last time to go home. My friends and I still talk about that trip and all the strange things that happened. We did the same kayak trip a couple of years later and nothing out of the ordinary happened at all. No mysterious forest noises to both my disappointment and relief. Years ago, I was living outside of Buffalo, New York, on an old estate on the Lake Erie shore. I rented the carriage house of an old mansion that a doctor and his wife owned. The doctor was a heart surgeon, and they were a well-to-do couple with multiple properties, so they weren't around that often. I liked the solitude of the place, having just gotten divorced, and although the carriage house was slightly decrepit, I loved living there. The mansion overlooked the lake, and my house was closer to the road, off of a private drive that went from one side of the estate to the other. The carriage house had been a servant's quarters for whoever lived in the mansion at the turn of the 20th century. There was an enclosed courtyard outside my door that was bordered by the back of my house, the carriage barn, which had stored carriages back in the horse and buggy days, a row of empty horse stalls, and a brick wall with an entrance to the courtyard. It was a very cool place to live. The rent was cheap, and there was a private 150-foot-long beach that was hardly ever used by anybody but me. But it was very isolated if there was nobody staying in the mansion, and there weren't any close neighbors because all of the houses along the road were big estates, and a lot of the rich people living in the area weren't full-time residents. But I was young and brave, and it was a big estate full of decaying spookiness, and I'm a weirdo that likes that kind of stuff. So I was overjoyed to find the place. One night, I was coming home late, around 1 a.m., from a friend's house. Driving down a street a mile or two from my house, I saw a dark figure up ahead, standing close to the road. I thought that was kind of odd, because it was late at night on a weekday, not exactly party time in the Buffalo South Towns. I started to get a little nervous, because the person was standing as if they were waiting for someone to pick them up. As I got closer, I could see they were wearing an unusual black shroud-like thing, long and dark and draped, with part of it wrapped over the person's head to look like a hood. It was similar to someone wearing an abaya or a hijab, only much looser, like a bunch of material just wrapped around somebody's body. It seemed totally inappropriate for what I knew of the people that lived around the area. Nobody ever wore anything like that, and certainly not outside at one o'clock in the morning on a weekday. The person was just standing by the side of the road, looking stooped over and old. I slowed down to a crawl as I approached, worried that the person needed help. Maybe it was an older senile person that had walked out of their house in the middle of the night, confused. When I got close enough to really see the person, she lifted her head and looked my way and I saw that it was my ex-mother-in-law. I was absolutely, positively sure that it was her. The same gray-brown hair, the same eyes, the same enigmatic smile that had always made me wonder what she was thinking about but never saying. She raised her hand and waved at me. Not a stop and help me wave, but more of a gosh, it's good to see you wave. That scared the hell out of me 
because my mother-in-law had died three years previous to when I was driving down that road. I sped up and kept driving, my hands shaking on the steering wheel. But a few minutes later, and a few deep breaths later, I told myself I should go back and take another look. My mother-in-law had loved me. I couldn't imagine her ghost would appear seeking revenge on me for divorcing her son, who had not treated me well, to say the least. I drove in a square by making left turns and went down the same road again, but there was no one there. I was too freaked out to go back to my spooky carriage house with the weird sounds and hundred-year-old history, with nobody there but me and the ghosts I was convinced probably inhabited the place. So I drove to the local all-night Greek diner and sat there for an hour, drinking coffee and calming my nerves. When I finally drove home and into the courtyard, I could see that something was wrong. My door was standing open. The glass windows were broken. The door was cracked almost all the way through from one side to the other. Someone had destroyed the door to get into that house. The next day, I found a crowbar in the courtyard, thrown off to the side. The only things I noticed missing from the house were just a few pieces of my clothing, super creepy, a jar of loose change, and a knife from the kitchen. I was just divorced and not exactly rich. I didn't have much worth stealing. It's very scary when someone breaks into the house you live in, all by yourself in an isolated spot. They must have driven right into the courtyard and would have been hidden from view while they broke down the door. I called the cops. They never caught anyone. With all the upset of the break-in, it wasn't until hours later that I remembered having seen my dead mother-in-law waving at me from the side of the road, dressed like the Grim Reaper. I'm convinced that she somehow appeared to delay me from going home, that if I had driven straight to the carriage house, whoever the person or persons were who had broken my solid wood hundred-year-old door practically in half with a crowbar might have been waiting there for me or I could have surprised them, and that things might have turned out very differently for me. I was in Germany participating in a military exercise. Being an American, this was my first time in Europe, and also my first time in Germany. I loved being there, as I have a huge fascination with military history, especially World War II. This is important, because it might have something to do with my unexplainable occurrence. We headed out to do some training. Our location was deep in the German countryside. There were some other military units out there training with us, Aside from them, any real civilization was miles away. At this particular point, we had been out for three days or so. We still had about a week to go, and we weren't expecting anything crazy to happen this early in the week. That's when we got attacked by the people who pretended to be the enemy. While most units received a direct attack, we did not. Tasked with providing communications to our artillery unit, our position was farther away. My best estimate is that we were at least two kilometers away from everybody else. To add to this, we were on top of a huge hill, so our radio signals could reach farther and be more effective. Regardless, we still needed to pull security to be safe. I happened to be the first one on guard shift that morning. So I grabbed our machine gun and headed out from our vehicle. As I mentioned, the hill was huge. As such, there was only one way to approach it, a tank trail. This trail went from the bottom of the hill all the way to the top where we were. The top of the hill was flat for the most part, but there was another smaller hill to the left of the road. To get to the bottom of the small hill, you would follow the road to the top and then go about 30 meters to your left. This small hill was the perfect spot to set up a machine gun nest, so that's where I put it. 
Based on the position, it was impossible to come up behind me. The hill was quite steep and was covered with heavy brush and dense trees. The foliage was so thick, in fact, that the only way to approach my position was from the direction I was looking. Fast forward 30 minutes or so, and the sun is just starting to rise through the trees. It was so quiet and peaceful, and I sat on guard enjoying the beauty of Germany when it happened. I heard a very distinct, hushed voice say, Hey! Almost as if it was right next to me. It seemed like someone was trying to get my attention without making too much noise. The wind wasn't blowing. The birds weren't chirping. All I could hear was this whisper. I looked around to make sure that nobody had somehow been able to sneak up on me, but there wasn't a soul in sight. The rest of my squad was a good 100 meters away, in the vehicle, and I couldn't even hear them. It freaked me out, but I had no choice but to stay at my post. I tried to brush off the incident, but then my sergeant tried to sneak up on me a couple of hours later. I caught him, though. He hadn't realized how steep the hill was, nor how covered in brush. I heard him coming a mile away. He congratulated me for having my head on a swivel and doing the right thing. We started to talk, and that's when he told me a story that made my blood run cold. The area we were training in was a World War II battlefield. A lot of American soldiers from our sister unit had died around those parts. They'd had no artillery support, and the Germans were so well dug in they couldn't do anything about it. That information, combined with the World War II ammo cans and machine gun belts we found there, helped me put two and two together. I'm not sure what to think about this. I have no explanation for why I heard this voice. I believe in the supernatural, but I also believe in trying to find a logical explanation first. The thing is, nothing adds up. I wasn't tired, there was nobody around me, and there were no other sounds in the forest. Part of me believes that it was the spirit of a soldier from our sister troop, still fighting, hoping that I would help. But at the end of the day, the truth is, I don't know. I used to work in a casino. One night, I was approached by an elderly woman, asking about paging someone over the intercom. I tried to explain where to go, but she insisted that I personally walk her to the desk where they can do that. As I walk her through the casino, she started talking to me. She mentioned that she was a medium and how her family has always strictly advised her against sharing that information with people. When you work at a casino, you encounter a lot of scammers and generally odd people. I was polite, but tried not to engage with her much on the topic. As we kept walking, she said something to me about my sister. I stopped and asked her how she knew my sister. She didn't, but started talking to me at great lengths about my family. At this particular time, my sister was going through a very difficult time in her life that was impacting our family as a whole. I was skeptical, but curious. As she went on, I was careful to neither confirm or deny anything, but just listen to what she had to say. She went into great detail about how my father, mother, and even I played into the current situation. She even became visibly emotional, as if she could feel what my mother was feeling. I was utterly astonished as she told me that I, being the oldest and most diplomatic in my family dynamic, needed to be more outspoken with everyone involved. Everything she had told me was undeniably accurate and insightful, but then she shifted her focus. She told me about somebody I worked with and went into great detail about what this person looked like and how they felt about me. She talked about the dynamic between us and advised me to take caution. At this point, she had lost me. I couldn't think of a single person or relationship in my working life that fit that description. I began becoming more skeptical again, 
and I reminded her that I needed to get back to work and to keep walking toward our destination. She kept talking to me as we walked, and I began to once again find myself astonished, not just to what she was telling me, but also how she would go about it. Her body language, expressions, her emotional energy. As we got closer, she abruptly stopped walking. When I noticed, I did as well, and I turned back to her. Before I could say anything, she placed her palm at the base of my sternum, above my belly button, just below where my rib cage started. I immediately noticed a physical sensation. I became paralyzed and almost felt like she was stealing the breath from my body. I started becoming hyper aware of my surroundings, the lights and dings from the electronic games, the mass amounts of people walking by, but everything seemed to be in slow motion, almost like I was leaving my body. It could have only been a few seconds, it could have been 20 minutes, I don't know. But I felt as if I couldn't breathe, and I felt weak in my knees. I started to feel like I was on the verge of passing out. Casino security saw this encounter and approached us. When security interrupted us to ask what was going on, it must have startled her, because I felt this shockwave through my entire body. She jerked her hand back and began apologizing profusely to me. As soon as she pulled her hand back, I was able to breathe again and gain control of my body. I was completely freaked out. It must have been visible because security kept asking me if I was okay. I assured them that everything was fine and they walked off. I turned back to the woman who was still apologizing and she said, if you don't do something about that ulcer, it's going to kill you. I was so freaked out, but I told her thanks that I had to get back to work now and I quickly headed back to my office. Not only was I in a bizarre headspace, but I was noticeably completely void of physical energy. The entire experience was the most profound encounter of my life, and I will never forget those words or the physical sensation. I was having a lot of stomach issues at the time, but I was way too afraid to get medical verification of an ulcer. I had already previously suspected it, and it was a potential side effect of the medication I was on at the time. But if that wasn't bizarre enough on its own, it gets even weirder. The encounter happened nearly 10 years ago, and it has sat with me ever since. But recently, I was reflecting back on it. I realized that the second part about the coworker, the part that initially made no sense at all, all of a sudden did. That entire situation played out in my life a few years ago. The description of the person and the very specific details were 100% spot on from what was described to me 10 years prior. I even realized that the entire situation was initiated nearly seven years to the day from the moment that this woman described it to me. Not only were the two incidents separated by seven years, but the person she had described I hadn't even met yet and was in an entirely different state at a whole other company at the time. I don't really know what to make of this. I'm open to this kind of thing, but I've always approached these situations skeptically. Still, I would love to hear what anyone else has to say about it and see what you might think it was. In my life, I've had three UFO experiences. For context, I am a 40-year-old male living in the southeastern United States. I will focus on the second one, since it's the most unquestionable event of the three. In 2015, I was living in Lexington, South Carolina, which is right outside of Columbia, the state capital. On October 5th of that year, we experienced a thousand-year flood that shut everything down and caused major damage throughout the Lexington, Columbia area. My job requires me to be at work at 3.30 or 4 in the morning, same job I have now as I had then. My job was shut down on account of the flood, but my great and wonderful company decided that I needed to be there the next day to assess the damage, despite the fact that I would have to drive through a flood. Anyway, 
I woke up at two, went downstairs, made some coffee, and per my usual morning routine, I stepped outside onto the back porch to have the coffee and enjoy the stillness of the twilight hours in solitude. It was lightly raining, not enough to mind it, and the sky was totally overcast with low clouds. That's important. We were in the suburbs about two blocks off of one of the main drags through town, Sunset Boulevard, 378. We weren't in the sticks, but we weren't metropolitan either. The sky was a slight orange from the streetlights reflecting off of the cloudy sky. Our house was at the end of a cul-de-sac. There were tall, lined trees lining the back and sides of the property. So I'm drinking my coffee, leaning on the banister of the deck, and in front of me in the sky, I can see something moving in my direction. My first thought was, oh, it's an owl, or some kind of large bird, judging by the shape. But slowly, as the shape got bigger and bigger, I realized that it looked smaller because it was far away, and once it was overhead, it came into clear view. It moved slowly, but it all happened so fast at the same time. It was overhead, over the house, over the pine trees, but under the clouds. It was a black triangle with a textured pattern on the bottom, the only side I could see. The texture is difficult to describe. Adidas makes this soccer shoe called the Nemesis. If you Google it, that's kind of how it looked. Embossed lines, perfectly black. The trees were probably about 40 to 50 feet tall, so I estimate that this thing was probably 60 to 80 feet off the ground, pretty low. It was about the size of your traditional Walmart parking lot. It made absolutely zero noise whatsoever. There were no lights. It moved as with intention, with no deviation in direction, like an air hockey puck perfectly gliding on a fixed trajectory. It was slow, maybe faster than a bicycle, but slower than a car. I don't know, 20 miles per hour if I had to guess. Once it made it over the house, I chased it through the gate on the side of the house, yelling to myself at 2.30 in the morning, what the F was that? What the F was that? In the front yard, I was just looking at it. It just quietly and discreetly skated off into the darkness, perfectly straight on, totally indifferent. I regret not getting any pictures, it just didn't occur to me. It came and went so quickly. In the moment, I just didn't know what to think. It's like my brain had nothing to reference against what I was seeing. It wasn't a bird, it was definitely not a plane. I thought maybe it was a drone, but it was so big and totally silent. It was difficult to process in the moment, but I know what I saw. There's no question about it. Anything outside of your scope of understanding or knowledge is the definition of alien. If I were to make up a story about seeing a UFO, a black silent triangle is probably the last thing I would have come up with. I wonder if the flood had anything to do with its presence. It seemed too wild for it to not be connected somehow. The third encounter I had in my life was when I was stargazing with my son on the same deck at the same house. We have since moved though. I was playing with the Google Sky app because I'm lame and uh, it took a while to get a smartphone. So I was amazed at all the apps even though they'd been out forever. Anyway, we were finding stars on a clear night and then identifying them with the app. One particularly bright star stood out to the east of us and I overlaid the phone with the star. The app showed nothing in the sky in that region. We calibrated it as well. As soon as I said, hey, there's no star there, it zoomed across the horizon, stopped, then zoomed up, then blinked out like an old tube TV turning off. Its movements were very smooth and precise if I were to hold up a yardstick in front of my field of vision with my arms extended, this thing went from one end to the other in a second. I couldn't tell you what that is in actual distance, but it must have been an incredible distance to travel that quickly and to stop on a dime and then redirect and disappear. My son was too young at the time to think much of it. 
I had heard from the wacky world of UFO conspiracies that UFOs can tell if you notice them, and I had always thought that that was baloney. But I have to admit, this thing tore off the second I noticed it and said something out loud. Pretty weird stuff. I have been backpacking and camping, mostly solo as an adult, for the majority of my life. I'm cautious about my surroundings, and I listen carefully when I'm out. I try to remain an observer and move through the land with as little impact as possible. I'm also very interested in the mysterious and the obscure. Cryptids, alternate realities, and the unexplained fascinate me. I've read most of the missing 411 cases, and I'm a serious devotee of true crime. All of the morbid and curious things I can find, I devour. Anything strange that will fire the imagination. There have been occasions where I have felt slightly uncomfortable, or watched even, when I've been out in the woods, but mostly I've just chalked it up to being alone and alert. Maybe my inherent skepticism makes me less susceptible to encounters that other people experience. I always look for logical conclusions first. I even think that David Politis is experiencing some kind of confirmation bias. I don't know that all the missing 411 cases are what he thinks they are. I've never encountered any truly off or deranged people out in the forests, but I do consider that the biggest threat is the human animal. A few years ago, I set out to camp near an old growth forest in North Georgia. Most old growth here is gone, but there are places that haven't been logged. And if you get the chance to visit one, wherever you might live, I would suggest it. It's beautiful, serene and alive in a way that's hard to describe. This particular forest was one of hemlock and poplar and the trees were massive. I had a guidebook that gave directions out into the sticks following little country roads that eventually turned into gravel. After a long drive into a national forest, I parked near the trail, which was unmaintained, meaning it wasn't very popular or highly traveled. I hiked out through the woods to where the trail eventually just kind of stopped. There was very little undergrowth. I spent the afternoon just exploring. I was looking at the trees and enjoying the calm. Eventually, I made my way down to a creek and crossed over it to an old field that formed a sort of bowl in the land with hills and ridges on all sides. The fact that there was a field means that there had, I guessed at one point, been people living in that area, but I saw nothing of the sort when I was there and my map showed that I should have been far from any roads or settlements. I set up my tent and made some food. It was late when I decided to have a little smoke and lay out in the field in front of my tent and just look at the stars before bed. There was little to no light pollution and I always relished the opportunity to enjoy the sky at times like those. As I was laying there, I began hearing a loud knocking sound from up near the ridge where I'd been earlier in the day, maybe a thousand yards away. Three knocks and a long pause, followed by three more, and then it would repeat. When I say knocks, what I mean is a very loud noise, like two logs or trees being hit together, loud enough to reverberate in the little bowl that I was in, loud enough that you could almost feel it. I could pinpoint where the sound was coming from, but it was night in the forest and anyone who's been out there knows that it is dark. I thought it had to be a person making the noise because what else would make such a rhythmic sound? It was extremely loud and would have taken considerable effort to produce. I had seen no one else at all that day and the direction from which the sound was coming was the section of old growth that I had explored earlier. And that's it. That's the story. Eventually the sound stopped and I went to bed feeling like I had heard something that I wasn't meant to hear. 
Or maybe that I'd heard something specifically meant for me and me alone. Both disturbed me. I packed up and hiked out the next day. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't hyper aware and waiting for something else to happen, but nothing ever did. I've told friends about this and they'll either say that it was for sure a Sasquatch or that I was for sure close to someone's house that I didn't know about. But why would a person be out in the woods late at night, banging logs together in the dark? I'm not ready to come to a conclusion. Like I said, I'm a skeptic, but I'll admit that I have no idea how to explain what I heard that night. When my husband and I first married, we lived towns apart due to work. We also had a toddler. We decided to move in together as quickly as possible and went house hunting. I have always enjoyed stories of supernatural or paranormal occurrences, and I joked about how much I would love a haunted house. I was later told by a clairvoyant that the universe delivers. We finally settled on a house that was in our price range. It was built in the 80s, so no concern of lead paint and not a lot of historic value either. Everything went smoothly, for the most part. Our toddler would awaken in the middle of the night and explain that her stuffed animals would move or fly. We figured she just wanted to sleep with us. Moving was a big transition for such a youngster. We got pregnant with another kiddo quickly and he went out of country for about a year for work. Things were normal for the most part. The baby, six to 12 month age range, would sometimes stare at the front door and cry or point behind me when I was doing dishes. I didn't think it was too weird. My husband returned and I eventually decided to remodel the house. It had not been updated since being built. It was a major undertaking. My youngest was probably two years old at this point and the oldest was six. I became convinced that our house was haunted at this point and continued to be convinced for about two years. It's hard to remember the time frames for everything, but I will describe the activities that occurred during this two to three year period. I had a dog who required medication twice daily. It would frequently go missing. I would later find it in the same spot that I always kept the medication. One of my daughters would talk about the little boy that lived in the closet and that she was afraid of him so we moved the two girls into the same room because we felt that they were perhaps lonely. This gave my husband a room to dedicate to his man cave and online PC gaming. My husband would talk about seeing a shadow dart back and forth in the hallway. I had a dream that when we took down the sheetrock, we found a secret room with dead twins who warned us to get out. All of this stuff seemed like normal occurrences that happen in life. But then I finally became convinced that the house was haunted. My children and husband were all in bed. I had clean laundry waiting to be folded on the chase, but decided to sprawl out on the couch and watch the breakfast club instead. Alone time was rare. All of a sudden, a shirt flew from the chase and hit me in the face. I ran to the bedroom and my husband was asleep. I woke him up and he said that he didn't believe me but I know better because he got really anxious and couldn't sleep after that. The next big event occurred when my youngest told me that there was a man in her bathroom. We had a security alarm, so I knew that that couldn't be true. I had her take me to the bathroom and show me. She described him as being all black and pointed and said, he's right there. He's right behind you. I told her we would just leave him alone and go about our day. We had other things happen that we just explained away. I woke up to a shadow figure hovering over my husband. My dogs would wake up in the middle of the night and bark at the foot of the bed. I would hear noises coming from the kids' room and get a terrible feeling whenever I would go and check on them. I sometimes had to walk through a cold mist to get to their room. My dogs would also sometimes bark in the hallway. 
I finally called someone to intervene when my husband met me at our door, freaking out. I worked weekends, and I would always come home and tell him about my day while he played on his computer. The kids would be in bed by this time. I would then go and shower and go to sleep. This night, my husband said that I had already been home and talked to him about my day. I had then told him that I was going to go shower. So when he then heard the garage door open and the car pull in, he immediately panicked. I was frightened to hear this as well. An entity taking my identity made me feel helpless. A coworker got me in contact with her friend who has special abilities. Her friend came over with another medium. They smudged our home and put quartz crystals in the corner. It was all free. They told me that the limestone behind us held energy which attracted transient spirits and entities. Some good, some not. The shadow man stayed because of my husband's PTSD and was attracted to the negativity. They also said domestic abuse had previously occurred in the man cave at some point and that it was a big focus of the negative energy. They taught me to smudge and told me that I have ancestors by my side keeping me safe. Things would still happen on occasion after this. We spoke to our Muslim friends about it and they thought it sounded like a jinn. These creatures are mischievous and can be good or bad. They gave us a religious artifact from their hometown that had a prayer in Arabic carved in it. We kept it on our mantle and never had trouble after that. They would always laugh at us at Christmas time when we had our Christmas mantle decorations and our Muslim artifact. It's still a treasured item that we have to this day. We have since moved, but we did spend a decade in that home. And the more I think about it, the more I'm sure that it was haunted. In a harrowing moment, Reddit user Cherry Cranberries encountered a police officer who saved their life. But was it an officer or an angel? You decide. I was telling this story to someone today. I haven't spoken about this story in many years, but I thought I might share it. This happened about 10 years ago. I was barely 20 years old, living in Massachusetts. I was driving to my college at the time. I commuted to school. And this particular day was very snowy, icy, and sleeting. I don't know why school was in session, but in the Northeast, they don't take bad weather very seriously. I think we've all seen the memes of cars with piles of snow on them saying that they're heading to work. That's just New England for you. So anyway, I'm driving to school and I was late. The road which I was driving on was a two-lane highway that was very steep. Between the two lanes were Jersey barriers, and the opposite flow of traffic was on the other side. Like many roads here, there are no shoulders, and there was no turnaround. Once you were on this highway, you had to drive another five miles before you could pull off to the closest exit. It was the type of highway where if your car stopped, you were pretty much screwed because there was nowhere to pull off. Again, no shoulders or grass, just concrete barriers on both sides and a barrier in the middle. It was a dangerous highway that many people had died on. Even a friend of my mom's coworker had died on it. I was driving pretty fast for the type of weather I was in. I was in the far left lane and could see a tractor trailer in the far right, but behind my car. Suddenly, my car fishtailed, and I spun out completely. I was suddenly in the far right lane, facing oncoming traffic. The tractor trailer was coming at me. Like, coming at me. There was no time or place to go. I remember this feeling came over me, like my brain didn't register what was happening. And suddenly, out of nowhere, my car was in reverse, and I was in a miracle of a small shoulder, but still facing oncoming traffic. I don't know how it happened, and I remember being in shock. Like, how did that just happen? 
The tractor trailer blew past me in seconds. I mean, I would have been literal toast if I hadn't gotten to that shoulder. Breathing really heavily, I said to myself, did I really just do that? Within what must have been 10 to 15 seconds, I hear a few knocks on my driver's side window. I open the window and a young male police officer is now staring right at me. He says, hey, I saw your car spin out. I see the lights behind now and his car parked right behind me in the same small squeeze of a shoulder that we had, which ended quickly up ahead. Clearly seeing me in what probably looked like total shock, he continued and said, uh, you were going too fast. I said, yeah, I know. And then he says in this soft but direct tone, stop rushing. Why are you rushing? You need to relax, okay? Relax. It was something like that. He then says how he's going to stop the traffic so I can turn my car around the proper direction and get back on the road. It's fuzzy how he did it, but I just remember him stopping the flow. I turned my car around out of the shoulder. Remember that my car was facing the wrong direction, so I wouldn't have been able to do that without his intervention. And slowly I pulled it back in the proper direction that I was supposed to be going in. I continued on and I looked behind me. Normally, you can see a cop pull out after you, see their lights on or the car themselves if they turn it off or whatever. But all I saw were the cars that were waiting for me to drive. It's weird to explain, but this cop disappeared in seconds. I mean, disappeared. And like I said, there was nowhere for him to go. The only turnaround, that small cutout median that cops tend to use to go in different directions, wasn't for another mile ahead. And the first exit off wasn't for another five miles. The small little shoulder ended up right where I was, and this cop was nowhere to be seen. It was so weird. I remember looking back several times in my mirror and saying out loud, where did he go? It was so odd that I thought about it all day. I came home and told my parents what had happened. Of course, in shock that my car spun out in the opposite direction and I almost hit a tractor trailer, I told them exactly where this took place, how my car went into reverse, how I have no recollection, and of the magical cop that showed up in 10 seconds and disappeared just as fast. My own parents thought that it was the strangest thing. I've told this story to a few people I know, and they've also thought it was weird. I think, and my parents agreed, that either that cop was sent by God at the exact moment I needed help, or he wasn't really a cop at all. It's been a decade, and I still think about this encounter. Without that man, I wouldn't have been able to get back onto the highway, unless I had taken a great risk or sat there in confusion and shock with the possibility of someone else hitting me, while snow, ice, and sleet fell on my car. It was a very peculiar and life-saving encounter, and whoever it was, I won't soon forget it. I have always believed in the paranormal. As a child, it fascinated me in many different and sometimes terrifying ways. I grew up in a mid-sized to small former coal mining city in Pennsylvania. My house at the time was an older, small, three-bedroom house in a historically lower income area. For as long as I can remember, I have felt the presence of spirits in that home. As a child, I would wake up constantly in the middle of the night, sweating and in fear that something was watching me from the far left corner of my room. That feeling never went away, but got stronger. I never felt alone while living in that home, always on edge. It got to the point where I was late in my teens, still sleeping with the lights on, because I was that terrified of the presence that lingered over me at night. In terms of seeing things, 
The only truly horrifying image I remember seeing was as a child. I was opening up my downstairs bathroom door and I saw my dog as a rotting corpse staring back at me. When I shut the door and reopened it, the image was gone. My dog was alive and totally fine at the time. My dogs would bark at random noises in the house and would sometimes bark at nothing at all. But the animals of my house would never come into my room. They would always whine by the door and scratch until I let them out. I never really thought about that until now. One thing that would happen to everyone in the house was things going missing. Granted, we were a large family in a smaller home, but things were always moving around and never in the same place that we remember putting them. In my room, this was a constant experience that I could never escape. I suppose here I should put a content warning for mental health and mentions of suicidal ideation. One thing that always stuck with me was the way that that house made me feel mentally. Granted, my family dynamic didn't help the situation. It's much better now, but at the time, it was rocky. But the best way that I can put it into words was it felt like something was sucking the energy and life out of my existence. I felt the most depressed and suicidal I ever have in the span of four years while living in this house. During this time, these feelings of being watched and stalked were at their highest. I felt truly and utterly alone, and yet my presence was never alone. A lot of these problems would end up fading, but never really went away. My grandfather would pass in 2016, and since then, the entire energy of my house changed. My mental health improved immensely, and those feelings of being watched felt more comfortable and warming rather than cold and negative. You could feel a shift in the entire home's dynamic, and just our overall moods and emotions were more stable. I felt comfortable staying home alone and simply using a nightlight to sleep. The last time I lived in that house full time was in 2019. I moved away for college and would only go home to visit. I would be home for maybe two to three days with a five day visit for Christmas, but an energy was still there whenever I walked through that door. My friends from college would feel that same energy too. I asked my one friend as we were driving back from Pennsylvania to New York, where we were in college, if she felt like my house was haunted. And without any hesitation, she said, oh, a thousand percent. Let's flash forward to this year. My family moved from the city to the mountains. We're now living in a converted cabin near a lake, three miles off a dirt road. During the day, it's beautiful and serene. At night, it's really creepy. Just darkness. I wrote it off, thinking I just wasn't used to the new environment, since I live just outside of New York City. The first time that I went home to visit the new house, I was only there for one day. The second time, I spent two nights with my friend from college. We slept in the same room, and she would tell me how I would talk in my sleep, something I've never done before. The second night, I would wake up in the middle of the night, shouting full sentences and having the worst time going back to bed. The next morning when I woke up, there were scratches all over my neck and upper back. My fingernails are not long, so there's no way that I could have done that to myself at all. That was back in April. More recently, I went home for three weeks. This would be the longest I would stay in the house thus far. I began to hear the voices of my loved ones clear as day in the middle of the night, despite those people being asleep or across the house from me. That feeling of being watched was back, and it felt more negative than how I even remembered it. I continued to talk in my sleep, to wake up in the middle of the night, drenched in sweat despite the room being freezing cold, and I would always feel uneasy at night. I'm back in New York and nothing has happened here. My family claims nothing weird has happened to them in the house. So I don't really know what to think. Am I crazy? Or is that presence back from the past to haunt me?
For some backstory, I'm a 26-year-old female. I grew up in a very haunted house. The woods were also haunted. It was in rural Appalachian, Pennsylvania. Our area had a lot of mining and Native American history. The oldest known site of human habitation was just a few miles away. Our house was also built near the portal to an abandoned mine where an accident took place. I've experienced noises, voices, things moving, and figures from a young age. I assume I have attachments. I no longer live in my childhood home. Things have started everywhere that I lived to some extent, but never as bad as there. This post is about where I live now, and I'm hoping to get some advice on what to do, or some possible reasons behind it. Currently, I moved in with my partner, who's a 26-year-old male, last summer. He bought the home in 2020 and says that he never experienced anything, and neither did his roommate. I moved in right after the roommate moved out. It was built in the 50s, no odd history that I know of. It's a pretty quiet suburb, right outside the city. One of the things that happens is that things move. I remember carrying a military duffel bag upstairs while I was moving in, and I stacked one on top of the other. A few hours later, I heard a loud bang upstairs. The top one was on the floor, in front of the bottom one. It wasn't like it rolled off, but more like it had been placed, or dropped. It was upright. A few days later, my folded flag from my re-enlistment was knocked off the windowsill but all the windows were closed, and I checked for drafts. Two weeks ago, I actually watched my partner's GameCube slide over about two inches on our TV stand. It's not plugged into anything. It's just the box sitting there, so it's not like the dogs could have pulled the cables. This was a common theme in my childhood home as well. It got so bad I had to fall asleep with movies on, because if it was silent, I would have to listen to things falling off my dressers, toys falling, things sliding, and so on. Another thing that happens is footsteps. I've heard heavy boot footsteps coming up the stairs and stopping in front of the bedroom door multiple times. It sounds so real that I've actually grabbed my gun thinking someone broke in. The last time it happened, a few weeks ago, my dogs heard it and walked over to the door. They didn't bark, they just sniffed. Most of the time it happens when I'm home alone, but there was one time when my partner heard it too. This has also happened at multiple locations. I've heard the same heavy footsteps that stop at the doorway, at my ex's house, and also an apartment I lived in. I've also seen figures. It was early morning, I was half asleep and I heard the footsteps. This time they came into the room. I thought it was my partner home from work. When I opened my eyes, he was already laying next to me and sleeping. I didn't see anything. Nobody was in the room. When he woke up, I told him about it. And he said that he had a dream that night where someone was in the house walking around and that he saw a figure standing in our room. A black figure with weird eyes. He said that he's dreamed about a figure in our room a few times since he started seeing me. My ex also experienced the same thing and would sometimes see black figures or a man with a mustache in the room in his dreams, but only when he was with me. One of my friends also saw a man with a mustache standing next to my bunk in her dream while we were at training a few years ago. We've heard voices as well. My partner has heard me calling his name or saying, babe, in the next room when I'm actually upstairs and didn't say anything. This has happened about five times. It's another thing that used to happen to me in the house that I grew up in. I would hear a woman saying my name in the next room when my mom wasn't home. Last night, I woke up and saw the shadow of my dog sitting upright on the end of our bed. I could see the shape blocking out the light of the TV behind him. I could see shoulders. Sometimes my dog gets too hot and can't sleep and will sit up like that. 
So I reached forward to pet him, and my hand didn't touch a thing. He was actually laying down flat on his side. The shadow was behind him. I didn't have my contact lenses in, so I couldn't see too clearly. My regular eyesight is horrible. I just see shapes. I turned my phone flashlight on, and the upright shadow disappeared. I haven't seen a figure since I lived in the first house, which is why I'm concerned. Little things have always started after I moved in somewhere, but it's escalating faster this time. This brings me back to the mine behind our childhood home. Two months ago, my two brothers, my partner and I decided to go back to those woods and try to find the entrance. Well, we found it. The portal was collapsed and they tried digging it out. We found pieces of the old mine cars, and we all brought a little something home. Do you think it could be escalating because we went back? And not only that, I brought a piece of a mine car into our house without even thinking about the repercussions? Now I'm worried. I haven't told my partner about the figure. And now, I'm just wondering what comes next. This happened to me a while back when I decided to go on another camping trip alone. I always liked camping alone. There's something serene and sobering about being isolated in the middle of the wilderness, and I always found it relaxing. So I planned out what trail I was going to take and packed my camping gear and my rifle for protection, and I jumped in my truck. I get to this trail early in the morning and I hike for about 15 to 20 miles until I find the right spot and I head off the trail to find a place to put up my tent. I stumble upon this nice sized clearing and decide that it's a nice beautiful spot to settle down. I am exhausted at this point, but I set up the tent at the southernmost edge of the clearing next to the tree line and I manage to get a fire going. I roast some hot dogs and start to hear a sound in the distance underneath all the forest noise. It sounded like an animal, most likely a deer, with a lame leg as it sounded like the animal was making a walking, dragging noise. I felt bad for the poor guy, but it was too far away and it was getting dark, so I couldn't really go find it and put it out of its misery. I think nothing of it after that and I go back to eating my food. After I eat, I douse the fire and crawl into my tent and get into my sleeping bag. I decide that even at my exhausted and relaxed state, I can't go to sleep yet. So I pull out a book I brought with me and I start to read by the light of the lamp. Hours go by and I hear that sound again, this time closer, right at the opposite side of the clearing. Surprised, I put my book down and I listen to this animal walk drag across the clearing toward my tent. It's really loud at this point and it now sounds like the hooves are all being heavily planted with the dragging noise following seconds after, almost like the deer is dragging something along. It makes it to about what I assume is the middle of the clearing and stops and I hear nothing. No breathing, I mean not a sound from this animal. I unzip the tent and I look into the clearing. There's nothing but trees and darkness. What the hell? Unnerved at this point, I zip up the tent and sit there listening for other noises. Nothing. Just the crickets and the breeze. I decide that there are a lot of strange noises in the woods and I tried not to let it bother me. Besides, I had my rifle. I start to doze off when I hear men's laughter off in the distance to my right, then women's laughter, and then sticks snapping far off to my left. I'm up now, wondering if what I'm really hearing is what I'm really hearing, or if it's just a product of being half asleep. I hear more faint laughing from a couple of other directions, all different. Old men, old women, younger people, even children. And I confirm that it's real. The noises are closing in, 
and I grabbed my rifle, preparing to fire a warning shot off into the air in case they came too close. Something about this laughter, how far in I was, the noise earlier and the time of night, told me that this was not just another family strolling through. I was on edge enough already, but then I noticed that the nightlife was dead quiet. Not even the wind was making any noise. I decided enough was enough. I unzipped the tent and fired a shot into the night. I sat there and surveyed the tree line and saw nothing. I listened intensely to my surroundings. No laughing and the forest sounds had returned. Relaxing just a little bit and figuring that I scared off whoever it was, I sat down and in my exhausted state, I fell asleep. I wake up later in a cold sweat, racked with anxiety, and it was still dark outside. I immediately hear two people whispering not far from my tent. Alert, I grab my rifle and I listen to what they're saying. I can't make out much, but I hear something about being lost. So I shout, hey, who's there? The voices fall silent. I shout again, are you guys lost? Who's there? Suddenly a huge burst of flame like a flamethrower erupted from the middle of the clearing, illuminating several silhouettes of people just standing around. In shock, I fire my rifle, blowing a hole in the front of my tent, and it goes dark. Without checking my surroundings, I get up and sprint out of my tent, making a hard left back to where the trail was. I hiked until sunrise back to my truck with my head over my shoulder the whole way, I never heard anyone follow me. I never saw anyone or anything the whole way out, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. After that, my enjoyment of camping alone left me, just like I left all my gear in the woods that night. In the seaside town where I went to university, there stood some awesome castle ruins parallel to the promenade. Two years ago now, and in my final year, I used to go to the ruins at night to chill with my friends. Sometimes we would play a hide and seek style game called Murder in the Dark, where we would try and scare each other when we found the opposing team. One night we were there playing the game two on two and I was searching on my own on one side of the ruins. Bear in mind, it was the early hours and I had a phone with a little battery, so I couldn't use my torchlight all the time. The crevices of the ruin and the pitch black sent my tired imagination into overdrive. I became emotional and started crying at the war memorial that was next to the ruins whilst trying to find my friends. I didn't feel upset or scared, it just overwhelmed me, so I put it down to being in the dark. Maybe it made me more vulnerable. When walking back to my flat, I could honestly feel like somebody was following me and getting closer. I kept looking over my shoulder to be sure there wasn't an actual person walking from the footsteps I could hear, only to see an empty street every time. It took a couple of days for anything terrifying to happen. And when it did, when it started, I felt a heavy sense of dread fill my bedroom and follow me around the flat. The strange thing to me was that it never followed me outside when I was out of view of the building I lived in. Like whatever it was couldn't travel far from where it had decided to settle. Moving forward a couple more days, and I experienced, during the day, an inability to leave my bed. I wasn't being held down at this point. It was more because I could feel a heavy mass loitering in my bedroom doorway that was constantly watching me. I was too scared to go to the bathroom or kitchen when my flatmates weren't home, and I missed classes. I didn't know what was wrong with me. A week had gone by and I had started sleeping with my lights on, not to mention the very vivid nightmares that made me too freaked out to close my eyes by choice. Even so, I fought to sleep, 
but the entity had drained me and started shadowing me when laying in bed. It could have been sleep paralysis for all my flatmate knew when I told her, yet it felt so real. I went so far as to make crosses by tying two paintbrushes together with an elastic band and sticking it above my bed. They didn't work. I was being pinned to the bed by unseen hands while awake and a weight was on my chest randomly during the day and night, only ever in my bedroom. I also saw a dark figure waiting for me by my bedroom window when I had mustered the strength to go out and buy food. It was watching me walk down the street toward the building and I could feel its eyes on the back of me when walking into town. This happened all day, every day, until I felt too scared to go back to my flat for two consecutive nights of the second week that this was happening. I stayed on my best friend's sofa and with her being into tarot and spiritual healing, she lent me two of her crystals to take back with me to see if they would help keep the entity at bay. I always believed in spirits and open to my friend's interests, I gratefully took the crystals with me. She had also told me to keep hold of the crystals for as long as I needed them and to be forceful with the entity, to tell it to leave me alone, even if I had to scream at it to show my inner strength that I was more powerful than it thought I was. The final night of my two weeks in hell, I did everything she had said. And when I got inside, I laid the crystals on the end of my bed and got into my pajamas. When I turned around, the crystals had disappeared. Worried that my friend would go mad if I told her I'd lost them, I said nothing about them for almost a month. It took around two days from when I had the crystals for the dark atmosphere to completely clear. My room felt a safe haven again, and I was able to sleep peacefully without fear. Forgetting all about the crystals, I had moved my bed to clean behind it. When I lifted the mattress, the crystals were on the floor underneath the head of my bed. I took them back to my friend, confessed what had happened, and she suggested the entity must have tried to steal the crystals so that I couldn't use them against it. If it were a true explanation as to why the crystals disappeared when they did, the entity must have been abolished or sent back to where it had come from the moment it came into contact with them. For the rest of the academic year, I kept the cross above my bed for peace of mind, and thankfully the entity never returned to darken my doorway again. This experience happened to me a couple of years ago, and I never found an explanation for it. However, my dad recently found someone on Reddit with a very similar story to mine that happened around the same time and in the same area. I reached out to that person, and they said that I was the fifth person to reach out, saying that they had experienced something similar. So I figured I would share my story and see if this has happened to anyone else. Some friends and I had gone camping up in a canyon in Utah. This was in 2020. Some creepy stuff had happened earlier in the night before I made it to the campground. So we were trying to relax, wind down and have some fun like we had planned. We were in high school at this point. So we were doing stupid games like truth or dare and whatnot. It was four friends, our friend's dog, and me. There was only one other group somewhat close to us, a couple and their dog, who set up their tent a few yards away. They weren't close enough to interact with us at all, though. My friends and I were staying up and talking, laughing, etc. When at some point it sounded like somebody's car alarm went off, maybe five to ten miles up the canyon. The next campsite was pretty far away from ours. We didn't question the sound and went on talking until we noticed that the sound had gotten noticeably closer. It happened so gradually that we didn't notice it at first until it sounded like it was just a few yards away. 
the noisier we were, the closer it would get to us. As we whispered amongst ourselves about what could be making the sound, it came closer and closer. Finally, the noise was literally just outside our tent, mere inches away from us. None of us dared speak or move an inch in fear of compromising our safety. When we became quiet, so did the noise. After we were dead silent for a few minutes, the noise started up again and began to once again go farther away until it sounded like it was about 10 miles away again. This all happened in the span of 10 to 20 seconds. As the night went on, we heard the noise travel from campsite to campsite in almost no time at all. It didn't go away completely until about three o'clock in the morning. We tried to stay pretty quiet for the rest of the night. All in all, whatever had made this sound traveled the span of roughly five to 10 miles in the span of five to 10 minutes. After that one time when we quieted down, it started up again and then it went back to where it started. That was about 20 seconds of it. Either way, this thing was going like a mile per minute. It wasn't a vehicle because there was no engine sound along with it, no headlights. It wasn't human because there wasn't a single footstep or twig crunch, not even when it was right outside our tent. It made zero noise aside from the beeping. It didn't sound like any animal that any of us knew about, and it traveled way too fast and was much too loud to be any animal, at least any we have around here. We originally thought that the sound was either a vehicle or a machine of some kind because of the consistent pattern of the beeping. However, when we stopped to listen to it for a while, there was a brief moment when the pattern got slightly off tempo, but it sounded accidental and then it quickly returned to the beat. This led us to believe that something was imitating the sound of a machine or a vehicle. We considered everything from weird nocturnal birds to pranksters with an air horn, but nothing added up. We ended up waking up the next morning at 5 a.m. to pack up and leave. The other campers who were sleeping a few yards away from us were already completely gone by the time we got up. This leads us to believe that whatever was messing with us that night had messed with them too. I wish we could have seen our friend's dog's reaction to what happened, but he had already fallen asleep by 8 or 9 p.m., long before the beeping started. It started at about 11 o'clock or midnight, and that dog can sleep through anything. I recently got together with those same friends and brought up what happened that night. One of my friends said that when the rest of us fell asleep, the same thing happened again. But... Instead of a car alarm, this time the sound was a crying baby, traveling at the same speed and distance as before. And according to her, it circled our tent a few times before fading off again. The people who were camping closest to us did not have a baby. Oh, and one other detail. We were less than 50 miles away from Skinwalker Ranch. The Preston Castle, standing tall and alone in the plains of California, was originally constructed in the 1800s as a prison boarding school for troubled young boys. Now that the school has been closed, it serves as a historical and haunted location that offers walking tours of the castle. For my 16th birthday, instead of throwing some big sweet 16 party like most people would, I decided to take a friend of mine to Northern California, where we would explore as many haunted locations as possible and try to find evidence of ghosts. The Preston Castle was one such place we explored. My mom, my aunt, my best friend, for who the sake of anonymity will be called T, and I packed up our things and traveled north, arriving at the Preston Castle around 10 a.m. 
We entered the castle and decided to do the self-guided tour, which permitted us access to the first floor, the second floor, and the basement. The first floor was the least interesting of the three. When we entered the second floor, things started to get interesting. We came across a room filled with several children's toys, things like dolls, coloring supplies, and teddy bears. Using the EMF detector that I bought for the trip, I walked around the room to see if there were any changes in the electromagnetic field and came up with nothing. Then, when I was not moving, the meter spiked up to 12 when there was nothing in that same spot a moment before. I called my aunt over and showed her the reading while my mom and T moved on to the next room. While we stood there looking at the EMF, we noticed one of the crayons on the table begin to move on its own, despite the two of us being the only ones in the room. We both decided we should catch up to my mom and T. In the next room, we found T recording what she saw, a simple bedroom with a closet. Upon reviewing the recording later, we found a class three apparition. In the video, you can see a pale white arm sticking out of the closet that none of us could see when we were there in person. The rest of the second floor was pretty bland, aside from a few unexplainable spikes on the EMF meter. Unfortunately, she looked on her Snapchat later to see if she still had it, but today she doesn't have it saved to her memories and can't seem to find the footage. Finally, we arrived at the basement which was by far the scariest floor we were allowed in. The third and fourth floors were off limits to the public as the flooring was unsafe to walk on. We were walking through and we reached a room referred to as the chemical pool and it is exactly what it sounds like. Back when this was a boarding school, the boys that came to the school often had head lice or scabies. The solution the workers at Preston Castle came up with was to fill a pool with chemicals that could kill the lice and throw the boys in, forcing them to swim across. Several boys drowned or received injuries from the chemicals because of this. As we were looking upon the emptied chemical pool, I walked away from my group for a moment to scan the room with EMF. I was close to the corner of the room when the EMF spiked to 15 and I suddenly felt a hand tightly grip my thigh. I whipped around, expecting to see somebody from my group standing behind me. Perhaps they were trying to prank me, and we would laugh about it afterwards. But when I turned, there was no one there. My aunt called across the room, asking me what was wrong. I glanced down at my leg and saw a small white handprint on my thigh where I was grabbed. I explained to my group what had happened, but no one seemed to believe me until we were walking to the next room where my aunt suddenly jumped and spun around to look at us. She asked which of us had touched her neck, but none of us had. The final room we explored in the Preston Castle was the entrance room. It was here the boys would have to sign in back when the castle was still in use. Stepping into this room, it was easy to feel the immense temperature drop. The castle had no power Therefore, there was no reason that room should have been colder than any of the others. This put us on edge immediately. So naturally, I turned on the EMF. It was going crazy in there, giving us the highest reading that we'd gotten so far, which was 25. Obviously, we were freaking out about this, but we still wanted to explore more. Eventually, we decided that we weren't going to stay in there any longer. I was walking behind the rest of my group when an unexplainable strong force pushed me into T. That weekend was by far the scariest and most amazing birthday I have ever had. I have plenty of tales from that weekend, as well as other ghostly experiences that were not from that birthday, but those stories are for another time.
This happened to me a while back when I decided to go on another camping trip alone. I always liked camping alone. There's something serene and sobering about being isolated in the middle of the wilderness, and I always found it relaxing. So I planned out what trail I was going to take, packed my camping gear and my rifle for protection, and jumped in the truck. I get to this trail early in the morning, and I hike about 15 to 20 miles in until I find the right spot. I head off the trail to find a place to put my tent up. I stumble upon this nice sized clearing and decide that it's a nice, beautiful spot to settle down. I am exhausted at this point, but I set up the tent at the southernmost edge of the clearing next to the tree line, and I manage to get a fire going. I roast some hot dogs and start to hear a sound in the distance, beneath all the forest noise. It sounded like an animal, mostly like a deer, with a lame leg because it sounded like the animal was making a walking, dragging noise. I felt bad for the poor guy, but it was too far away and it was getting dark, so I couldn't really go find it to put it out of its misery. I think nothing else about it after that and I go on eating my food. After I eat, I douse the fire and crawl into my tent and get into my sleeping bag. I decide that even at my exhausted and relaxed state, I can't go to sleep. So I pull out a book that I brought with me and start to read by the light of my lamp. Hours go by and I hear that sound again, this time closer, right at the opposite side of the clearing. Surprised, I put my book down and listen to this animal walk drag across the clearing toward my tent. It's really loud at this point and it now sounds like the hooves are all being heavily planted with dragging noises following seconds after, almost like the deer is dragging something along. It makes it to about what I assume is the middle of the clearing and stops. I hear nothing, no breathing. I mean, not a sound from this animal. I unzip the tent and I look into the clearing. Nothing but trees and darkness. What the hell? Unnerved at this point, I zip the tent back up and I sit there listening for other noises. Nothing. Just the crickets and the breeze. I decide that there are a lot of strange noises in the woods and just tried not to let it bother me. Besides, I had my rifle. I start to doze off when I hear men's laughter off in the distance to my right, then women's laughter and stick snapping far off to my left. I'm up now, wondering if what I'm hearing is really what I'm hearing, or if it's just the product of being half asleep. I hear more faint laughing from a couple of other different directions. All different. Old men, old women, younger adults, even children. And I confirm that it's real. The noises are closing in, so I grab my rifle, preparing to fire off a warning shot into the air in case they came too close. Something about this laughter, how far in I was, the noise earlier and the time of night, told me that this was not just another family strolling through. I was on edge enough already, but then I noticed something. The nightlife was dead quiet. Not even the wind was making any noise. I decided that enough was enough. I unzipped the tent and fired a single shot into the night. I sat there and surveyed the tree line and saw nothing. I listened intently to my surroundings. No laughing and the forest sounds had returned. Relaxing just a bit and figuring that I had scared whoever was there off, I sat down and in my exhausted state, I fell asleep. I woke up later in a cold sweat, racked with anxiety, and it was still dark outside. I immediately hear two people whispering not far from my tent. Alert, I grabbed my rifle and tried to listen to what they were saying. I couldn't make out much, but I heard something about being lost. So I shouted, hey, who's there? The voices fall silent. I shout again. Are you guys lost? Who's there? Suddenly a huge burst of flame, like a flamethrower, 
erupted from the middle of the clearing, illuminating several silhouettes of people just standing around. In shock, I fire my rifle, blowing a hole in the front of my tent, and it goes dark. Without checking my surroundings, I get up and sprint out of my tent, making a hard left back to where the trail was. I hiked until sunrise back to my truck, with my head over my shoulder the entire way. I never heard anybody following me. I never saw anyone or anything the whole way, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. After that, my enjoyment of camping alone left me like I left all my gear in the woods that night, and I've never done it since. Back in the summer of 2020, I was traveling with my partner to Boise, Idaho from Colorado to visit his family and stay for a camping trip. This trek is nearly 15 hours long, and while you can do it in a day, it's better if you stop to rest. Having lived in Utah at one point in time, I was very eager to show him the natural hot springs in Spanish Fork. They're located deep in Diamond Fork Canyon, and require a 45 minute hike from the parking lot. Still, we were both excited to get out and get moving after seven hours in the car. When we arrived at the first parking lot, however, the gate was shut and locked tight. A sign taped to the metal read, closed, absolutely no access to hot springs, fines $2,000 max, or something to that effect. We were bummed. The virus had shut down many things, and we figured that this was outside, so there's no way they were going to close it. After some research on the government website, we discovered that a body had possibly been found in the hot springs, and was likely the cause for the locked gate. Sad and tired of sitting in the car, we drove back down the canyon road to find a spot to camp for the night. Most of the more established campsites were closed due to the virus or were already taken for the night. This was fine since we prefer more dispersed camping anyway. So we picked a random road to turn on as we drove closer to exiting the canyon. Road 338. Most of the road was a well-kept dirt road. We passed some promising spots near a creek and maybe two or three other people were already set up for the night. We wanted to go a little farther to see if there was anything with that wow factor. Sounds funny, but some sites just give off that this is the one feeling. Finally, we came to a dead end in the main road with a fire mitigation road to the right. At this very spot, there was a strange boulder with some type of inscription on it. I had to investigate. The inscription read, Diamond Battle. June 20th, 1866. No way. A memorial for a battle that happened right here. A feeling of uneasiness and oddly respect washed over me. After traveling up the fire road and not finding what we were hoping for in a campsite, we decided to pick a spot by the small creek we passed on the way in. It was getting dark quickly but we set up our tent in no time at all and got a fire going. The creek was loud, but peaceful. Though, ever since I read that inscription, I couldn't shake this strange feeling. I'm not a paranoid person, but I kept feeling on the edge of my seat, like something was watching us from the woods just across the water. As the night grew darker, this feeling grew stronger. I decided I didn't want to be in the open anymore, and I retreated to the tent to get some rest while my partner stayed up to enjoy the fire. I snuggled into our sleeping bag and exhaled comfortably, listening to the creek that was now much quieter and was a bit farther from the tent. I started to drift off when I heard it. Soft chanting, rhythmic drums. My eyes shot open. Was I really hearing that? I strained my ears to listen over the running water, 
I couldn't quite get a clear sound, but it was definitely there. This is when I noticed the ground was also rumbling, as if horses were stampeding down the road a hundred feet from our site. I didn't know if I should get out to tell my partner or not, but I had the strange feeling that if I said it out loud, it would make it more true, and that an army of spirits would spring from the trees and into our campsite or something. Before I could make the decision, I was dead asleep. This was somehow the most peaceful slumber I had ever had. The next morning, we packed up our tent and left no trace that we had ever spent the night by Little Diamond Creek. When I finally entered cell service, I did a Google search of that memorial and Diamond Fork, Utah. It turns out there was a battle there between the Utes and the Mormon militia, and lives were lost on that mountainside. After reading this, I decided to tell my partner what I heard last night before falling asleep. I told him about the chanting and the drumming and even the stomping of horses. He looked at me in total disbelief and said, I heard the same thing. I guess I was only in the tent for about 10 minutes before he got spooked, standing alone by the fire, hearing this distant chanting and drums. He came into the tent and experienced that same peaceful sleep that I had. I feel as though we were being watched over by some of the Native Americans that lost their lives there. A strong but calm and protective presence was there. If you're ever on Diamond Fork Road, I hope you visit and pay respects to the Memorial of the Diamond Battle, and maybe the spirits of the land will watch over you too. If you're from Northeast Ohio, you've definitely heard about Squire's Castle in Willoughby. And like many other places in Willoughby, Squire's is said to be haunted. My whole life, I've said this is bogus. In fact, the ghost stories that I heard of it felt practically impossible. It's said that at night, through the windows, you can see the lantern light of the owner's wife who died there. This can't be true, because she didn't die there. But I don't know, whatever, I guess. Still, everything I believed about this place changed when some friends and I went ghost hunting the other night. We went in so excited. We had planned to walk up to the castle, look through, and maybe even explore the hiking trails afterwards, all late at night. It was drizzling, not very much, no big storms or anything at the time that we were out there. At right about midnight, driving towards Squires, maybe about a mile away, the three of us in the car saw a bright light in the sky, somewhat above where the castle was. One of us initially thought it was lightning, but it definitely wasn't. It was bright, produced no sound, and lasted just a couple of seconds. It happened twice, lighting up a circle of clouds in a white, bluish-purple light. We didn't think too much of it at the time, but now it feels like it should be included in the story. Then at about 12.05, we pulled up to Squire's Castle. From the road, before even pulling into a parking spot, we could see it, the lantern. There was an orange glow coming from inside the castle and it was moving. Initially, I thought it was a house behind the castle. Then I remembered nothing was behind the castle except dense trees. It couldn't have been my headlights because they weren't even pointing that way and we weren't moving. One of my friends thought it was just some teens exploring the castle like we had planned to do. But as we pulled into the parking spaces, we saw that there were no other cars and that the light had disappeared. After gathering enough courage, we left the car and started toward the castle. I was recording on a handheld camera one friend was recording video on his phone, and my other friend was recording audio on her phone. We walked all the way up until we could see the castle. I personally didn't see much, but my friends saw quite a bit. 
Watching his phone, my friend said things like, I saw something flash by on my camera, or there's something moving around inside. My other friend felt a little gross. If you've had the same kind of encounter, I'm sure you'll know what she means. She also said that she saw things moving inside, that she was looking with just her eyes and no camera. My friend said she really wanted to go into the building, but my other friend and I wanted to get out of there, me especially. So we turned back toward the car and walked back. On the way back, we were still kind of exploring, thinking that maybe we could see things on the side of the path, but we weren't sure. Then my friend half jokingly said, I low key want to go back up and into the castle. Shortly after she said this, boom, a heavy stomp could be heard right next to my friend. Nope, she said and ran. The two of us ran after her. My friend said that they heard the stomp and could feel the presence of something right next to them. We got in the car and drove off so fast. All of us were in shock. I was holding back tears. I didn't know what to feel. I had never experienced anything like that before. On our 20 minute drive home, we decided to examine our evidence. First up was the audio recording. We listened back to it and my friend stopped it shortly after it started. She was like, what? Why is it like that? That's so weird. The audio recording started as normal. We leave the car and then we're heading back to the car. The part of the recording where we walked up to the castle and all that was completely missing. We've never had any issues with her phone before. In fact, we've used that exact phone to catch the voices of multiple entities in the past. Then we moved on to the phone video. You can see lots of misty drizzle moving past the camera, and sometimes you can see my friend's breath. It was surprisingly cold for being 50 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit the whole day. But when we're up at the castle, the video gets a little spooky. We paused the video on the flashes that he saw earlier and saw single frames of shapes running past. These things were differently shaped and colored than the misty water droplets. These were the most terrifying things that we got from the trip, in my opinion. We also got one picture that was kind of clear and whatever it was, wasn't really too human shaped. Also, we could very faintly see shapes of people or reflections of eyes inside the windows. Then on the way back from the castle, we didn't see anything in the video. Recently, I examined my video on a computer. Now, typically people save the best for last, but my video was not the best. I saw very little within it as it was very dark, but on our way up, we could see a couple of orbs and on the way back, we could see small points that kind of looked like sets of eyes peering and blinking. Looking back on the experience, we are kind of filled with dread. My friend is very spiritually active and knowledgeable and feels that we could have been in some serious danger. She says she's definitely adding this to her list when she's felt unsafe from the presence of some kind of entity. I guess we might never know what exactly we experienced that night, but we'll never forget it.